So we're going to get started. Uh, once again, I'm Professor Thomas Mitchell here at Boston College Law School, where I serve as the director of the initiative on land, housing, and property rights, an initiative I founded uh, last year when I moved to Boston College from Texas A&M. I want to reiterate some uh, thank yous I made yesterday to Boston College, generally Boston College Law School in specific, in providing startup funding to make this initiative possible. Uh, I want to thank various staff members who've been very involved in the um, in putting together this conference, specifically our communications and marketing team, uh, led by uh, Nate Kenyon, Amanda Crowley, and Sam Gelly for uh, our administrative assistant for the initiative for tremendous amounts of work on the uh, on the conference. Um, and I want to thank anybody else I left out um, in terms of putting this together, because I'm sure I'm leaving some folks out. Sorry for that. So we got off to, I think, a great start yesterday. Um, excellent graduate student panel. I want to thank Dr. Dwayne Goldman again from the USDA for his uh, amazing kind of overview and contributions. But one of the goals yesterday was also to humanize the problem of heirs property ownership. And, you know, I heard tremendous reactions from folks who attended yesterday in terms of the media panel, uh, maybe particularly with the uh, participation of Kim Duhon uh, from North Carolina. Um, and also what we saw and witnessed from the viewing of gaining ground, the fight for black land. I think that obviously humanized this. So I'm, I'm very happy about that. Today, the theory of the case um, is we have this crazy schedule. Um, I, there was some thinking behind this, and I'll just tell you my theory of the case of why I have folks on a forced march today. We have you know, a number of um, stakeholders kind of who are present in the conference, who, um, who some of them are recently engaged on heirs property. Uh, other folks have heard about it, but uh, have, uh, you know, kind of the beginning stages of understanding. So what I wanted to do was give a view of the waterfront, not knowing what uh, any particular attendee here, what might be their point of entry, right? So the idea was to give you as broad um, uh, exposure as possible. So we're going to have panels looking at the quantification of, of kind of heirs property. We're going to have uh, panels talking about the problem of kind of will making and estate planning and gaps with respect to heirs property owners. We're going to have uh, a number of folks who work uh, for various federal organizations kind of writ large agencies and uh, government sponsored entities and the Federal Reserve Bank. And we're going to look at um, heirs property issues as they manifest themselves in terms of other issues besides the abuse of partition law. So with respect to tax issues, tax foreclosure, um, limited access in most states to the homestead exemption, which could make uh, home ownership more feasible. And then we're going to look at how heirs property plays out in the urban context. And one of the manifestations of the heirs property problem that oftentimes is talked about in the urban context is the problem of tangled title. And so we'll hear about that. You know, this, this panel from yesterday and then the panelists and the speakers from yesterday to today represent just all stars at, at every level. Um, and so I had a wish list of who I wanted to speak and who I wanted to serve as panelists. You know, I was kind of reaching for the stars, but also sometimes I'm a pragmatist, right? So, you know, I had my, my backup plan, you know, plan B and plan C if, you know, getting all the all-stars wasn't going to work out, which, you know, usually that doesn't work out. But what I was really amazed was as, as I talked to one person after another, they just said yes, right? Um, and I also want to reiterate my thanks to Fran Miller from uh, Vermont Center of Agriculture and Food Security for organizing uh, this outstanding panel you hear about later. 
and to Andrea Botstar from the National Consumer Law Center for organizing uh, this panel on property tax um, matters. Um, and so, you know, one thing I've learned is that when you go to a conference or gathering, folks are not there for the person making the intro. Folks are not going to remember the intro. So I'm right on time as Nate's telling me to wrap it up. And so we're going to proceed to the uh, our first panel on quantifying heirs property method methodologies and um, and the significance. So could those panels come up? Good morning. So first of all, uh, I'd like to say that it is an honor to be a part of this overall convening on heirs property and the racial wealth gap. And I'm especially pleased to moderate this first panel of the day on heirs property quantification and the application of the same. So certainly questions about how much heirs property exists and where is it? These questions are fundamental to understanding how heirs property ownership impacts both social and physical spaces. So, so before introducing this very esteemed panel of folks who will address these questions, I really want to take some time, just a little bit of time to acknowledge some of the groundbreaking work on heirs property estimation um, that has provided the foundation for some of the contemporary research that we'll be talking about today. Now, I may not mention all of the studies, but certainly key ones, for example, from the Black Belt South, they go back decades. For example, there's the work that was done by the Emergency Land Fund in the late 1970s, which was a study of uh, five Southern states commissioned by the Congressional Black Caucus. And then there's the work that's been done by Faith Rivers and some others shedding light on land takings in coastal South Carolina that involved estimations as well. And then there's the work of both the Alabama and Georgia Appleseed studies. And then Janice Dyer's work in Macon County, Alabama, it really was, has, has been pivotal for drawing attention to um, notations and tax records and the importance of that for identifying heirs property parcels. And then there's also work that's been conducted um, in Appalachia, okay, by Brady Deaton, a, an economist. His work in the early 2000s really has laid the groundwork for some initiatives currently getting off the ground in central Appalachia that uh, have to do both with title clearance and the expansion of agroforestry um, investments for landowners in that part of the South. So well, the proliferation of big data has facilitated methodologies that automate ears property identification. And I think this map that you sh uh, that's shown here on the screen right now. So um, this map is just one example of that, just one output from an analysis of that kind of data, uh, uh, that kind of um, data use. And so this map is from uh, some research that I participated in, that I was a part of, along with Dr. Rebecca Dobbs, who's now with the Forest Service. And while this kind of very, I think, um, easily digestible, sort of these depictions, these maps, they're very, they're very good to look at. They're very good to sort of uh, give us a very kind of visual uh, idea of understanding of where heirs property is and its intensities is also very necessary to look more closely at the limitations of data and the techniques used to derive such estimates. And that's what our panelists will help us do this morning. And so with that, I want to introduce our panel members. We have Maria, Maria Evans, who's Vice President for Sustainable Community Partnerships with Fannie Mae. Natasha Moody, she's a research associate with the Housing Assistance Council. Ryan Thompson, he's assist, an assistant professor with the Department of Agricultural Economics and Rural Sociology with uh, Auburn University. And Kara Woods, who's a policy analyst with the socially disadvantaged Farmers and Ranchers Policy Research Center with Alcorn State University. And with that, I'll ask Maria to come up and make her remarks. Good morning, everyone. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, Cassandra. Um, 
I also too just want to express my gratitude to be part of this panel. Um, I think in terms of this particular topic, this is a collection of people who've made significant contributions in terms of research um, and studies and the application of that research in communities. And so it's really a privilege for me to be part of this, this panel and this discussion. I have not, um, unlike my fellow panelists, I've not dedicated the better part of my career to this particular topic. Um, I actually have come to this more recently in my career, but it's something that has part, is part of my lived experience. Um, my early uh, childhood I spent growing up in Puerto Rico and um, some of my earliest memories and, and definitely the first home that I remember is a home that I always thought of as my grandmother's home. And um, my entire, uh, my immediate family lived there with her. Um, and then the homes that were sort of adjacent to that home were uh, filled with my extended family. And so for me, it was just very normal to be uh, basically on a street where everybody you were you were related to in some way. Um, and I thought that was just uh, how everybody grew up. Um, but it wasn't until much later in my life, and actually after I'd started working at Fannie Mae and started exploring uh, what we call the housing journey and really reflecting on my own housing journey and then asking my parents about their housing journey um, that I came to realize, oh, that that land was family land. That that was my grandmother's home, but maybe in an informal way. Um, and so I, I asked my parents about that time and, and what it meant to them. And I think my mom's response was, uh, I liked her perspective. She said that that time in their lives was very pivotal, was the word that she used. That was a time when our family could live rent-free, mortgage-free, and enabled my parents to save uh, money to um, eventually buy a home in the DC metro area and become first time home buyers. And she said it was very consequential for us because it gave us stability. And I, I just appreciate that framing that she gave and, and that perspective. Um, I do think she's right. It was very consequential in a positive way for our family. And here's where my lived experience starts to intersect with my work because I recognize that's not the housing journey for all families. And so at Fannie Mae, when we think about individual housing journeys and where this comes into play, um, uh, our work starts to then take a little bit more definition. So let me just talk a little bit about uh, Fannie Mae's interest in heirs property. Um, but let me start with uh, who is Fannie Mae for those who are less familiar. Uh, we are a mission-driven organization we operate in the secondary mortgage market, meaning we engage primarily with financial institutions. Um, we bring uh, liquidity, stability, affordability to the housing finance system. We, um, we finance one out of every four mortgages in the US, so a pretty significant footprint. What my team does specifically, the community impact team, we take that mission and bring it to communities. We engage with local leaders, with nonprofit organizations, with homeowners, with renters. Um, we specifically engage on topics like access to affordable housing, um, housing stability issues, whether we're talking about property durability or even the resilience of the individuals who live in those homes. We also engage significantly with communities after natural disasters as they're looking to execute their long-term rebuild plans. Um, and then we also look for ways to bring our colleagues along. How do they see that mission in action? So, but it's been primarily through our disaster recovery and resilience work that we have encountered this issue of heirs property. Um, we work long-term with lo the local leaders, uh, local regional lenders, as they're executing their rebuild plans. And uh, oftentimes we're really in the position of being listeners, listening to people's stories, trying to understand some of the bar barriers that they're facing, some of the challenges that they're encountering. And what we hear from local leaders is that the most significant impediment in their ability to execute their long-term rebuild plan and bring their entire community along are issues with unclear title. 
what we hear from nonprofit organizations who are stepping in to serve local residents, fill in the gaps, help people stabilize, are the number of clients that they're serving who do not have clear title makes it that much harder for them to get back on their feet. What we hear from homeowners when we're, um, oftentimes it's because they've been denied benefits, is uh, when we ask a few probing questions, it's usually related to title issues. And so in that, in that moment, when you really need support to stabilize your life, to restore um, order to your, and some normalcy to your life, when you're looking for funds that uh, will help you repair your home, you're either denied benefits outright, or you receive a fraction of the funds that you're expecting to receive. And so in that way, there's property, tangled title, cloudy title, uh, really emerges at the least um, opportune time. So our team, in trying to support communities as they're rebuilding, realized, okay, we need to know a little bit more about this issue. We cannot be effective if we're not a little bit more uh, conversant in this issue. And so we started to uh, just really take an interest um, and try to figure out what it is that, you know, if this was being identified as the most significant impediment, and um, it's a recurring theme, what can we do? We, we also just wanted to start with understanding how prevalent is this issue? Initially, and we've been doing this work now for about coming up on 10 years. Um, initially, in the early days, we were primarily working in communities that were uh, impacted by hurricanes. So kind of Texas up to the Carolinas. So we were thinking maybe this is more concentrated in the Southeast. We were also curious whether or not there was a correlation between there's property and race or income levels. These were just some of the questions that we, we were asking ourselves. One thing I'll just mention quickly about Fannie Mae though is that um, while we're known for helping people become homeowners, getting people into homes, we are maybe a little less known but equally committed to the idea of helping people remain homeowners. So how do we help people sustain home ownership? When we think about housing stability from the perspective of, again, the durability of the property, but also um, the resilience, the, the financial and the economic resilience of the people living in those homes. Because that we know, we know that uh, without being able to sustain home, own, home ownership over time, people will not be able to access the wealth building benefits that home ownership affords. And so we knew that there was some connection there with with title issues. So this is just a little bit of the, the context our team started to really engage in this particular issue. We wanted to be effective in supporting communities. We kept hearing this issue about uh, airship, tangled title, um, and we wanted to, to make sure that we were approaching it from a data-driven perspective. So uh, as we did a little bit of research, we started to find information um, it wasn't helping us answer that central question, though, because a lot of the, the studies we were finding, um, and many of that you mentioned, Cassandra, um, included data sets that had um, a mix of different property classes. And so, again, since Fannie Mae is really focused on residential properties and we couldn't isolate uh, the, the residential properties, we continued to, to look. And that was sort of the our our a reason for wanting to reach out to the, the data science team at Hack to see if we could find a way to um, put together some research that would lead to an establishment of a national baseline of the prevalence of residential heirs property in the US. And so uh, it was sort of with that in mind that we reached out to Natasha and her team to help us uh, to help us achieve that goal and and meet that need that wasn't already being met. And so I think that's a good time to turn it over to you, Natasha. Good morning. 
Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mitchell and team for the invitation to be here today. Uh, really grateful for this opportunity to be in conversation with the fantastic folks in this panel and many in the room. Uh, again, my name is Natasha Moody. I'm a research associate at the Housing Assistance Council. We go by HACC, so that's how I refer to us today. And I was able to conduct this research with my colleague, Dr. Keith Wiley, and my director of research, Lance George, and HACC did this in collaboration with Fannie Mae over the last couple of years. So the Housing Assistance Council is a national nonprofit that supports affordable housing and community development across rural America. We do that through four major work streams, research and information, which is where I'm housed, training and technical assistance, lending, we provide low cost uh, loans for affordable housing development and through rural policy and advocacy work. As Maria mentioned, we were seeing robust work being done in heirs property in the agricultural space, the legal space, academia, urban housing, and really wants to join this, this ongoing movement at uh, understanding the heirs property issue. In our work at HACC, we continue to come across this issue, whether it's in community development or in affordable housing, issues of title continue to impede um, housing development or community development projects in our partner uh, communities. And so when thinking about um, understanding the, the, scape, the, scope of the, the scope of this issue, as Maria mentioned, there was a lot of work in agriculture and legal and not quite a focus on residential properties that included rural properties. Um, sometimes you may hear the focus on rural and agriculture and housing on urban, and we don't want our rural residential folks to get lost in that conversation. So this partnership with Fannie Mae is a great opportunity to look at residential housing. Another part of that is that there are so many various data sources that folks have been using over time to understand uh, and scale heirs property. And we had access through our partnership with Fannie Mae to a robust data set that's used often in the mortgage space and it's tax and assessment data. And we wanted to be able to take advantage of this opportunity and be able to present a methodology and an analysis of a data set, another data set to see if this can contribute to the ongoing work. Another reason that we were really interested in this work is that we are an intermediary. So we do not work directly with residents. We support organizations, local organizations across rural America. And our partners were asking, how can housing, how can housing organizations join this work? And how can we understand which households to target, how this issue impacts our community? So we aim to create a reproducible methodology that we can share with our trusted local partners that they can take this baseline, add their local identifiers and be able to scale um, heirs property in their local regions and be able to have targeted outreach and solutions. So for our methodology, we aim to identify residential properties owned by multiple real persons with no indication of a formal title transfer after the death of an owner. And we did this by trying to identify two major categories of uh, residential properties. The first are properties that we think are most likely heirs property. Um, the indication shows that they're currently heirs property. But we are also interested in identifying regions where there may be clusters of residential properties that were at risk of becoming heirs property. When we're thinking about the solutions from the housing aspects, we thought we wanted to, to include those properties both to um, be able to inform solutions and to just understand what the issue may look like today and in the, the, the near future. We approach this by looking at both owner characteristics and property characteristics within tax and assessment data to be able to identify these properties. While we are conducting our research, we noticed that when we were um, implementing our methodologies to the data set that we had access to, there were some states where we were pulling up significant housing issues. So there were significant housing issues. For example, we're seeing states where 85% of, uh, of, of homes did not have any mortgage lending in the last 30 years. That is a housing problem. And we were noticing that with our indicators, we were not specifically pulling out heirs property in some of those states. And we want to err on the side of caution and be conservative to, to present a baseline. So within that, um, that process of conducting the research, we implemented a standard correction for some of those states that resulted in six states being omitted um, from this particular research. We will conduct further analyses on those six omitted states uh, beginning at the end, towards the end later in this year um, and trying to procure additional data sets to be able to um, dive deeper into those six states. But for 44 states in the District of Columbia, our 
very conservative estimate of identified residential heirs properties was 500, 580,371 residential properties, which amounted to about 0.6% of all residential properties that were in our database. The total assessed value for the identified properties was $32.3 billion. And this is a significant amount of equity tied up in these properties. And the reason that we use total assessed values because that, that was the data that was most available to us in the data set. We know that assessed value does not fully encompass all of the wealth that's tied up in these properties due to a variety of factors, including bias and assessment practices. Um, but those were the data that, was, that were available to us. We also want to note on this map that regions that are not highlighted on this map, we are not trying to say that there is not an heirs property issue in those areas. We are hoping to present how our methodology shows up with that data set and the results that are produced with that methodology and that data set. We use electronically um, procured data, and we know that in some regions and in some states, data aren't electronic, and so they cannot be procured to the national level. And additionally, if they have electronic data, that's a recent practice that's been started in 10 to 15 years in some of our partner um, communities. And so when we're looking at records that are 30 years or older, there won't be electronic data. So we just want to be clear that we're not saying that because an, an area is not highlighted here, that there is not an heirs property issue. We just wanted to present our methodology and the results that came from that. And so I'll touch on this very briefly, but we looked at persistent poverty counties as well. And the persistent poverty counties are counties that have a 20% or higher poverty rate over 30 years. And those are highlighted in yellow on the map. And persistent poverty counties had a higher prevalence, double prevalence of all other counties um, when looking at heirs property. And this aligns with the understanding that heirs property issues do not um, exist in, in a vacuum. There are other systemic issues that surround areas that have a high prevalence of heirs property. So some of our considerations, we know these estimates are conservative. A portion, a reason, part of that reason is because our data set did not include vacant parcels or agricultural land. And as we heard from a fantastic presentation yesterday from Jasmine, um, dissertation presentation, we know there's relationship between vacant properties and heirs property. And we've heard a lot yesterday as well about the relationship between agricultural land and heirs property. So those not being in, included in our data set will lead to more conservative estimates. We will conduct further regional um, analyses because data varied by county and state. That included the assessment practices and the availability of electronic data. So we do plan to continue this, this regional um, assessments with, in collaboration with Fannie Mae moving forward. So looking for, as I mentioned, we will continue regionally focused quantitative and qualitative research in collaboration with Fannie Mae and many local partners. And we've been grateful to be in conversation with some of the panelists and many in the room. So really grateful for those collaborations. We're also really being intentional about trying to, to put forth solutions as to how housing can come alongside legal agricultural academia and be able to support the ongoing heirs property work. We've heard from um, many partner communities that in some areas where there are these systemic housing issues, after title is cleared, folks are still having issues accessing the housing resources they need to be able to construct or rehabilitate the homes on the properties. So we are really interested in, in seeing how housing can come alongside the ongoing work and support heirs property owners. We are doing advocacy work around housing policy. We really would, you know, we, we believe that everyone deserves and ha should have a right to safe and stable housing and affordable housing. And so we're looking at how housing policy can support current and former heirs property owners to access the resources they need to access the housing, um, safe and stable and affordable housing. We're also looking at housing finance solutions. So are there ways that housing finance products can support heirs property owners and former heirs property owners be able to, again, access the housing, safe, safe housing and stable housing that they need. Um, when we talk about wealth, you know, the wealth tied up in the property, owning land is a significant piece of that. But and another piece alongside that are the structures on the property if it's residential property. Are there structures and where the quality of those structures will affect the wealth that's tied up in that land? And so we want to be able to use federal monies and um, see if there are financial products that can support heirs property owners being able to um, re rehabilitate homes, construct homes, have agency over the land that they have ownership to. And so thank you very much for the opportunity to share today. That's a bit about Hack and look forward to the continued discussion. Thank you. I'll turn it to Ryan.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Ryan Thompson. I am a rural sociologist from Auburn, Alabama. Uh, real pleasure to be here with everybody today. Uh, I think half of my dissertation references are in the room. <laughs> and so I've, uh, about eight years ago, Queen Quet said the word heirs property to me, and I've pretty much been obsessed ever since. Uh, it wasn't until uh, COVID happened that once we got locked in, I took a turn in towards the quantitative direction. And so a lot of this is that work, the quantitative, how big is the bread box question. Uh, but in doing so, uh, I'll cover a good bit, kind of cover my greatest hits. And so to begin, uh, we've come a long way in the last 50 years since the emergency land fund. The Federation and other black ag organizations really did so much to get us to where we are today. And yes, we're experiencing a big moment where we're seeing a lot of national attention to heirs property. But in the process, so much work had to go into getting us here. The 1860s did not arrive to the game as fast as we should, probably should have, to be honest. A lot of the other uh, community-based organizations did not arrive as fast as they should have. And so really, we have a lot to thank the Federation Emergency Land Fund for to getting us here. And I, I just wanted to begin from that point because a lot of the literature oftentimes begins from 20, 2000 on, and it's actually 50 years old. And so furthermore, uh, diving into my data geek side of me, uh, here's my bibliometric analysis of all heirs property research over the last 50 years. Uh, there are some dense pockets. Thomas, I think you have like eight articles that are highly central here. Cassandra's work as well, uh, bringing the US Forest Service into this space. But really the turning point for us, uh, Connor, Bailey and myself came with uh, Cassandra's work with Scott Pippen and the 2017 quantif uh, quantification effort that opened the door to uh, mortgage data sets. So that's once we really started to take a turn on this issue. And so let's dive into the, to the data. I'm gonna geek out for a little bit. I'll dial it back at the end, I promise. Uh, how much land is owned as heirs property, first off? Uh, second, what is the value of heirs property? Where is it located? Uh, so I began by focusing on the South using core logic data uh, purchased with support from Al Alcorn State. Thank you, Kara, for the support, uh, picking up the big tab there. Um, so I'm gonna focus on the South first. Uh, now we're talking big data, like seriously big data, three terabytes, 154 million properties, uh, 211 variables. And while CoreLogic says that, oh, we'll sell you exactly what is heirs property and we'll indicate it with the number 99, y'all, it is not reliable. It takes a lot more work than just searching the word heirs. We, I mean, we're talking lines and lines of code and sifting. Uh, it's a massive range from zero acres to 170 acres, uh, falling in the range of more common heirs property. And so when we began this project five years ago, it was 23 lines of code. We are now at 89 lines of code. Uh, we begin by removing non-starters, corporations, churches, government buildings. Uh, as Uju pointed out yesterday, there is no standardized tax nomenclature system in the United States, which makes this very hard. One county will have very different information and structures than the county right across the state line. Uh, furthermore, tax appraisers within counties really struggle and have a lot of difference within. So you're finding a lot of variation. Furthermore, uh, trying to figure out exactly what model works best largely differs by state, by region. And so uh, where, where Natasha focused on residential properties, I tend to have a rural bias, hence Alabama, uh, where we look at ag land, vacant land, unimproved land. And so we construct an, uh, an index using heirs at all, many of the indicators Uju referenced yesterday, date of last transaction, owner care of name, and we arrived to this map. This is published at J, uh, Journal of Rural Social Science uh, alongside uh, Cassandra's work. And we find a lot of dense pockets of heirs property. I come in as significantly higher than many other researchers because I have such a focus on vacant, unimproved land. Many things that have uh, most recent transaction is 1-1-1930, which is essentially the core logic shorthand way of saying we don't know. We have no clue the last time this transacted. And so we see dense concentrations coming along the Black Belt. Uh, it is actually comes right across Georgia, but it's a little lower because Georgia counties are apparently the size of a backyard. But nonetheless, we do see dense pockets. I also want to draw your attention here to Appalachia, uh, the central pockets and the former coal fields that have been kind of abandoned and left behind. And so these are the rough numbers uh, for the first run in 2019 for roughly 500,000 parcels, uh, 5.3 million acres summed in the South with roughly $42 billion market value. So that was 2019, that was pre-COVID. Uh, this is published at JRSS again, if you, if you want the research. 
And so what we did was we began running regression analyses on these. And as one might suspect, we found a lot of the common correlates. Uh, SNAP, dip, SNAP households goes up significantly. Unemployment, ages over, households over 60, households below poverty, pretty much everything performed exactly as we theorized. And I'm not going full causal here, but it's pretty apparent which areas have been systematically disadvantaged, underserved, and disinvested from. And so this is the first time ever I'm showing a national map of my 2023 data. I have buried this map for the last eight months, and I'll get into why I've done that and why I will continue to do that. But nonetheless, um, my numbers being significantly higher than, than most, uh, 1.6 million total parcels throughout the United States, 13 million acres trapped beneath a clouded title, uh, 4.43 billion in total value, also using uh, a appraised value, which has a lot of problems with it. Market value also does. And so uh, thinking about the so what, we do see a lot of dense hotspots, uh, underdevelopment, individuals uh, constrained with minimal legal services going back. There's some pockets here that don't historically perform as we might think. The pocket in Nebraska, the pockets uh, out west, many of these are simply legal deserts. No one by their own uh, fault did anything wrong. There was just no one serving them to assist in the creation of wills. And so what we see is a, a systematic creation of persistent poverty through systematic and structural factors, uh, minimal legal services, uh, collapsing roads, decreased tax base, closing of schools. Uh, coming from Alabama, we have counties that are 95% absentee owned, meaning outsiders own our state. And seeing this occur time and time again, we see this victim blaming or a culture of poverty argument, and yet we don't even own our own land. And I think heirs' property fits into this because it serves powerful interests. And if it didn't, we wouldn't have this outdated structure we still see today. And so this community corrosion hypothesis is where I'm starting to pivot more to, looking at the long-term effects of clouded title and what this does to local communities. Uh, in getting to work with different groups, I've moved away from more like large-scale theorizing and more towards practical, grounded solutions. Uh, I point to Southern Rural Development Center and the Train the Trainer team. Uh, we've trained over 200 extension agents over the last year. Uh, thank you, Alcorn, for supporting and coordinating this. But like actually on the ground, doing the work. Uh, and so while I've buried a lot of my maps, I've done this because I realized the developers are starting to use our work for nefarious purposes. They reach out. They're in touch. They're saying, oh, we would just love for you to give a short talk and a list of where we might be able to invest. And they use this language of opportunity. And yet, they're kind of shouting the quiet part out loud. And in doing so, I've started to become a little more paranoid, perhaps rightfully so. Uh, I know, Cassandra, you're also uh, going through something similar to this, where our work is being used to make the vulnerable more vulnerable. And that is something that I think we have to start to grapple with in an ethical framework and figuring out what that looks like. I think we're in a new uh, situation here. How do we go about doing this research without making the vulnerable more vulnerable? And so in thinking through a lot of this, uh, not all heirs property owners have stage four heirs property. A lot need to have that kind of hope at the end of the tunnel. Uh, yesterday's panel really spoke to this. But in thinking through it, how do we go about inspiring people to get their land cleared, free, and, and out of uh, a clouded title? And so with that, I'll uh, go ahead and turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Farrah Woods. Thank you, Ryan, and thank you for the invitation to present today. Um, my name is Dr. Kara Woods. I am a research analyst at the Socially Disadvantaged Farmers and Ranchers Policy Research Center located at Alcorn State University. That is a long title, so we call it just the Policy Center, so we would have breath in our lungs to say anything else. Um, and so coming from the the rest of the panelists i guess i'm the more the significant part the so what why why do the maps matter and ryan touched on this a little bit but i'll i'll start with the background of the policy center so you can see our framework and where we come from and then what we're doing so the policy center was authorized in the 2014 farm bill and it was designated to be at an 1890 land grant university there we have six people on staff so a lot of our work is done through sub award contracts like you know ryan thompson dr uh, robert zabawa at these different institutions we do work with cbo's as well and there i manage the six 
priorities of research that we have. And one of those research priorities is land loss among African American farmers. That is our only research priority that's specific to a certain race. And the reason why, as you saw in Uju's map yesterday, is that there has been a very significant decline in black ag land. In the same, in Dr. Goldman's presentation, it has been a significant decline in black farmers over the past 100 years. And so at the Policy Center, we're seeing black farmers as an endangered species. And so we're making sure that all of our policies, our advocacy, our work is geared towards that. So within that research priority of black uh, farm loss in black farmers, um, we are, air property falls into that. And so with that, we have been able to fund several actually air property research studies that have looked at the magnitude of air's property, looked at the efficacy of the air's property uh, partitions act. Um, we looked at the nomenclature surrounding and the classification of air's property. Um, we looked at several different things. Now, let me get back to why the maps matter, okay? So at the Policy Center, like I said, we try to work with all and everybody, but we do have a little bit of priority for the 1890s. Working with Southern Rural Development Center, John Green and his people in Mississippi State, we're able to work across the nation. So uh, Southern Rural Development Center has 13 states and the Policy Center has all of the states plus the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. So we're a lot of places and we try to address a lot of things. Um, this means that partnerships really matter. So when we get great resources like Natasha, like Ryan, we try to bring brilliant people together. And I think this conference does a great job of that because we have a lot of brilliant people. And one of the first things that we have done with SRDC is the Air Property Trainer Trainer. So everything that we have done has been a baby of something else. It's been a subproduct of something else, working with the Sarah Group, um, Air's Property. So we have an Air's Property Trainer Trainer Network. Ryan alluded to this. What this was, was we got about 30 brilliant minds together that were across disciplines. So we had academics, lawyers, uh, extension workers, researchers, and said, let's really try to knock out what air property is in three stages, overview, prevention, and resolution. And so from that, we actually have a physical toolkit workbook that we have been presenting across the nation. We've done seven presentations, one in Spanish in Puerto Rico. And so we are trying to address this so people have a knowledge base first off. But then you have a piece where you can prevent it. So, you know, heirs property by nature is kind of morbid. You are talking about death all the time, but that's not very, uh, well, it's taboo in certain cultures. So we're trying to open up that door to say, the first thing about heirs property is you gotta die. I mean, like, and so what, what is the legacy? What is the first steps? What do you wanna do to prevent anything dealing with heirs property? That's, you know, maybe because I'm in this group, you can laugh, but that's not always the same thing that we get as we're going through these stages across the nation, right? But that's part of it. The last piece is the resolution piece. So we're looking at our lawyers, right? Our wonderful friends, our wonderful JCs, our wonderful Mavises, and who are really doing the grunt work policy and individual wise to help resolve this heirs property, whether it's trust, whether it's wills, really going to where they actually need to be in these specific areas. Now, from that, we've had other babies, right? We've had other sub, products and one of those being the air property practitioner network where a group of lawyers have come together and like I said those uh dead and dirt lawyers you know those those D, &D lawyers that uh have been doing the work like Jesse Williams you know I'm shouting out these names because they're important people who are doing the work 
right? And so I, you know, my name or Alcorn or the policy centers gets brought up, but we're really a hand that kind of pushes things around. We like to be a connector to what's actually need to be done for our farmers. We don't have a membership, but for our farmers and for the legacy of what we're trying to build, that's what we want to do. Um, and so this is why, let me go back to the maps. Through the air property trainer trainer piece, um, 1890s have had funding through FSA, through Farm Service Agency, to get grant money to then take this training network and go into their specific counties to present this. So when you look at the maps, unfortunately, like Ryan said, you can target where you need to go. You can say these specific counties have a mass of air property. That means that those people might be more vulnerable. They might need a more of an education standpoint. Let's make sure that as we're going to these counties, we're going to them, them first, okay? Another thing that we're doing at the Policy Center is every research uh, study that we do produces policy recommendations. Those policy recommendations are then proposed for each farm bill coming up. As we know, the farm bill that was currently supposed to be passed is not, but that gives a little more time for us to get actual data-driven data to say that uh, what we're finding, these maps matter, and that the policies can be put forth to help those who are more vulnerable, who, to help those who need grants, who maybe don't need loans, who are willing to be in certain programs. And so that's part of the policy center piece as well. We're trying to make implementation changes, administration changes within USDA, but also helping our 1890s, those who are going in, already doing the work, already have extension agents on the ground, have created that trust in the community that is so hard to get to and giving, like I said, data-driven, factual information that has been vetted that by the brilliant minds in this audience. I'm gonna look at my notes because I, I, I think we have a couple more babies and I don't wanna forget them, okay? So one other product of SRDC and ourselves is the Air Property Navigators. Um, this is gonna be more like a master gardener. It's in, it's in the works, but it's bringing people like extension agents who have a background in Air's property, have an understanding, give trust, to have actually like monthly, quarterly education building pieces in each community. Guys, this really matters. Again, the significance of these maps, the significance of this means that the racial wealth gap can change. And essentially it doesn't have to wait for another generation. It has to start now. One of the main issues of heirs property is with each generation, the fractionalization increases. So when we're talking about how can we clear title, the people who are alive have to start getting wills and the people who are alive have to either start giving their fractionated owner to someone else who was willing to do the grunt work, right? Kim yesterday was willing to do the grunt work. Not everybody in the family has a Kim though. So it's very important to identify those people to say, I'm willing to take that risk. Lastly, okay, so one of the babies coming out of our serial work is um, an heirs property ethics group. And so it's hard to, we're still identifying how to even name this because we wanna make sure that you have a holistic idea of what we're trying to do. Um, it's really e ethics within heirs property practice and initiatives. And so we're looking at three different uh, stakeholders that practice and work in heirs property. So we're looking at lawyers, CBOs, extension agents, and researchers. So that's four groups actually, but I, it's actually only three. Um, and, and, and some of you have actually volunteered to be in our ethics uh, focus group. And we're gonna ask some of you again, that's a shameless plug to say, we will be contacting you. But um, that way we have, again, a toolkit to figure out how we can make sure that those vulnerable populations are not more vulnerable. And we have ethics surrounded to say that we really thought about it before we went into a community to gather either information 
work with them or anything of the sort. And with that, I'm about 30 seconds over my time. <laughs> All right, so um, thank you panelists for a, just an excellent discussion here. I really appreciate all of your inputs, very uh, insightful, very deep, and uh, very intentional. Thank you so much to each one of you. Um, at this time, I'd like to open up uh, the floor to any questions that any one of them might have. I have to concede to Thomas here. Oh, you just asked me from the mic. And we would just like to remind everyone who is asking a question to please state your name and where you're coming from. Thomas Mitchell, Boston College. Um, to just, I want to be really short. So Ryan, in your presentation, the PowerPoint said in terms of the, the estimate, it was 443 billion, but I think you said 4.43 billion. So I just want to make sure are we talking about four billion or four hundred and forty-three billion? And then I had just a quick uh, for Kara. So you know, I do play in the in the pond of folks who do um, kind of agricultural work, but I know everybody here. I think we have precisely zero 1890 institutions in the state of Massachusetts. So I know two thirds of the audience has no idea when you're saying 1860, 1890. So can you just clarify that? So right. Uh, 443 billion, a much larger number uh, for what the slide went in depth. And to clarify, 1890 versus the 1862, both are land grant universities. The 1862 are the predominantly white institutions um, that were actually given land in the process. Uh, goes back to Congress. 1890s are more of your Fort Valley State, your Alcorn, your Tuskegee, and there's 19 of those. Um, out of that. FSA money, I think 14 or 15 of those uh, 19 have said yes and are doing those air property trainer training workshops or trainer workshops in those uh, prospective states. Um, uh, my name is Scott Konowski. I'm with the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. Um, and. I'm just blown away with the amount of brilliance that's on the stage. I mean, it's I love this research and I love the method methodology that you, you put into this. I mean, I guess my biggest beef maybe is that it the and the big sort of incomplete picture is the urban heirs property issue. And and so when we're quantifying how much heirs property exists nationally, I don't think that um the, the amount of heirs property that we see in New York City is even included in any of these figures, and it's and it's significant. And, I, and a lot of the conversations I think we were having yesterday too is it doesn't really apply to the urban heirs property situation because you know vacant properties are virtually non-existent in New York City, um, but we have a ton of heirs property, and and the more we dig into it, the more that we see and. You know, and some of what we've even seen is, you know, there's we just did this big, deep investigative report of one of these predatory investors, one of these scammers, and he had acquired 157 residential heirs properties over a, a very short period of time. And when you're talking about New York City, it's like, you know, our median house home market value is probably about $750,000. So this guy acquired $100 million, $100 million worth of heirs property in a very short amount of time, one investor. And and so, I mean, I, I guess what I'd like to know is, well, I guess folks to be more mindful about the extent of the problem that exists in urban areas um, and include that in the analysis and the quantification, but also to help us figure out the tools of, you know, how do we, how do we go about um, figuring out how much actually exists because I mean, we know, for example, you know, 20% of New York City is black. Um, when I was doing direct legal services, 75% of our clients were, were black. And we know that the rates of home ownership among black um, residents in New York City is much lower than it is for white residents. And so the, the problem's huge. Nobody really understands it. And um, so, I mean, what, how do you suggest that we develop a methodological approach to, to and including include um, the air, urban heirs property into the full analysis. Sorry, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. 
Hello. Oh yes, it's on. Okay. Uh, thank you, Scott, for the for that comment because uh, that that is one of the limitations that we're transparent about in our research is that our methodology with the tax and assessment data leans towards single family detached homes that it favors those types of residential properties and in more uh, metropolitan regions, heirs properties can exist in a multitude of uh, types of residential prop or home you know home ownership, um, and so. Within our data set, um, the way that the, the data are aggregated, uh, it depends on how this, the municipality reports the assessment of the property. Um, I'll use an example of uh, South Florida because that's where I live, so I was able to see firsthand how it, it impacted that type of region where we have potentially heirs properties that are com condominiums. But the way that the, the building is assessed is as one building. And that's how the data are reported when they're aggregated. And so the way the methodology and the data are set up, we're not able to really pull out individual condominiums, which would lead to an undercount in a region like that. And I'm assuming something similar potentially in New York. And so um, I actually really, uh, we were really inspired and, and influenced by the Pew Research Study, where they use the death records um, to be able to do that type of, on a national level, we weren't able to do that at this juncture to get access to that national master death file, which Ryan and I have talked about a little bit. But so on a local level, I think finding other data sources that don't rely on the tax and assessment data that can pool like condominiums or apartments or you know attached homes together could be a potential um, step towards that. Yeah, so we've been talking a good bit, I think everyone on stage about what an urban model looks like. My my model and work uh, was actually focused on Macon County as our benchmark. Thank you, Robert, for going and censusing the, uh, Macon County, Alabama. Uh, urban areas have so much variability within them, and they kind of often oftentimes defy being comparative. So the Pew study of, of Pittsburgh differs a lot from, say, New Orleans or differs from Jacksonville. Uh, looking at the different tax structures, there's just such variation there. And I'll give an example. Uh, Horry County, South Carolina, Myrtle Beach. Uh, has this weird thing where they like to classify all uh, timeshares as tenants in common. I, it, it, working through one city can just take forever. Uh, as Sarah Stein can attest that just working in Jacksonville, uh, Christopher Smith, who I believe is here uh, with Jacksonville Lisk, is also finding this one neighborhood to the next is almost like a completely different world. How do we go about tackling that variability, I think, is um, kind of the next phase of research for a lot of us. And then how do we design one that goes across cities is a whole other one. But yeah, great question. And thank you for your work. It's our, it's our biggest limitation. Thank you real quick. Um, Ryan, I saw on your research that you had also measured some, or JC Fisher, Alabama, sorry. I saw that you had um, measured some other factors other than race in your research. One of the factors I saw in the lower left-hand corner um, was something about gender. And so I'm curious if you could share what your findings were related to heirs' property ownership by, by gender and, and race. Yeah, so race and poverty are the best two predictors you could ever have in the Deep South. Thank you, JC, for that question. And Kara and I have been doing some research. The best new variable that we're leaning into is actually uh, women over 60, par particularly black matriarchs. So black women over 60 seem to have the, the lion's share of heirs property throughout most of the black belt. And it's a more of an intersectional. It seems like, I hate to say it to the men in the room, men die younger. Men die younger. <laughs> it has a tendency to- Black men especially die younger. That, I think that's the point, is that black men especially die younger. In a lot of these communities, JC, as you and I have gone to uh, across Alabama, we find that it's a, a, a matriarch holding down the household generations on and, and many people still living in the household. So uh, I would like to suggest a more of an intersectional framework of looking at how power overlaps in different ways. Uh, black women over 60 is a reoccurring pattern we're finding. I wonder if that holds an Appalachia. Uh, what's the role of the matriarch? But I do think we've underserved our programming and outreach to women. Uh, I think that we need to do a much better effort to reach out to women who seem to be the one keeping the ship together. Thanks. I, I've got a question from the online audience. There's about 80 people online right now. So the question is, is there any data on who's purchasing heirs' properties and specifically whether those are individuals or corporate entities from outside the United States? That was the specific question.
You want to talk about the air hunters? Okay, uh, so so the air hunters are are becoming increasingly notorious, not just because the Vice News documentary was so bold, but they're out there and they are highly effective. They oftentimes have legal backgrounds, ties to local court uh, and tax offices. They know what they're doing. Oftentimes have a significant amount of money to go and just outbid everyone in the family. They could put a whole family under very quickly. And so oftentimes we see these more notorious air hunters kind of jumping across the state, just slowly picking it apart. I'll point to Louisiana as probably the one that scares me the most right now because there's no protections with UPHPA there. And they're just snatching up fractionated interests and calling all over the country. They're getting very effective at their legalized land theft. They're getting very good at this. Uh, I won't speak to international because I don't see as much of that. I know there's like a paranoia around China buying land, but as I understand it, it's local people who are just racking up the millions. I'd just like to uh, uh, interject here a little bit and um, maybe bring in the UPHP. So this is the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. I won't go into the particulars of it because, of course, Thomas Mitchell, he's the, let's just say he's the architect of that. But that is in place and it's something that uh, should be a buffer, should act as a buffer between this kind of um, like a predatory buying up of these heirs properties through partition sales. So if, uh, I don't know if, we could have maybe a little bit of like sort of discussion about the, the, the how that works. You know, if anybody has maybe uh, Professor, Professor Mitchell Thomas, maybe you have some um, some some thoughts on how um, maybe effective you think the UPHPA is in the states where it has been enacted as uh, a bulwark, as, as something in between this kind of predatory buying up of properties and these property owners. How effective might it be, very generally? So we have one last question for this panel. Good morning, everyone. Rodney Benson from Redondo Beach, California. I have heirs property in the state of Texas. And my question or comment is more directed towards um, the young lady from Fannie Mae, I forgot your name, I apologize. And the last young lady who spoke, but it's in the area of the problem is Heirs properties are created by African Americans and Brown Americans who purchase property or homes at some point in time. At the point in time they purchase these homes, FHA, VA, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, all these governmental organizations have requirements that you have hazard insurance, you have tax escrow impounds, you have FHA insurance. What prohibits these organizations from insisting that African American and Brown Americans have a will at the time of the closing of their loans? Therefore, you keep these properties out of future falling into cavass for these heirs hunters able to pick them off when the person who originated the loan long ago passes without a will. Thank you for that. No, I appreciate the question and the comment actually. And I agree with you. That is actually something that we're looking at is what can we do to prevent more heirs property from being created? And one of the things that we're looking at is, can we, at time of closing, encourage the homeowner to have a will, to put a will in place? They're already sort of at that, at that moment. They're signing a lot of documents. It can be somewhat overwhelming, but why not take that next step and protect the asset that you've just spent months uh, going through trying to acquire. So I totally agree with you. And that's something that we're looking at, seeing if there's a way that we can partner to make sure uh, that more people have access and, and that's available to more people right there at the time of closing when there's sort of that captive audience and most thinking about the asset and then how do you protect that asset? Appreciate that. I also just like to add that you have to have cultural sensitivity in some things. 
And so essentially not everyone is open to talking about death, creating a will, even purchasing a home. Um, you know, some people are not willing to take those steps and they're more willing for their children to take those steps. And so essentially we can't, you know, it, it's hard to make somebody take that step. Um, you can only provide information. I think JC said this beautifully yesterday is that sometimes, unfortunately, you need the stage four heirs property to give people a jolt to what is really important to them and say, now I'm ready to try again. Kara, but Kara, we got to, we got to, okay. The next panel is supposed to start in two minutes. It was thank nice you. Being here. But outstanding panel. This is the uh, panel titled The Racial Will Making Gap and Efforts to Close It. Uh, I'm Terrence Franklin. Uh, I'm a lawyer in Los Angeles. I do trust in the state litigation. So I see a lot of things that go wrong, but I also see a lot of people who come in who don't have estate planning. And so things have gone quite wrong. Uh, so I think that's part of the reason why Professor Mitchell asked me to uh, moderate this panel. I'm just here to. Uh, listen to some amazing things that our panelists have to say. And uh, given the fact that we have a limited amount of time, I'm not gonna do introductions. I'm gonna ask each one of them one by one to introduce themselves and then to tell me about the work that they've been uh, engaged in. And we're gonna start with Gull Wettstein. Uh, and uh, the last question from the last session actually teed up very well this question of, um, why can't we require people to have a will or an estate plan done when they're in the process of doing um, their transactions for purchasing property? Well, Gull has done some research on that and some other topics, and I'd love to have him introduce himself and describe uh, the work you've been doing. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Terrence, for the introduction. Um, thanks very much to Professor Mitchell for inviting me to speak here and for organizing this uh, really interesting conference. Um, before I start, I'd like to give a standard disclaimer that all the views are my own. Uh, they don't represent Boston College or any of our funders. Um, and I should mention, I'm uh, at the Center for Retirement Research at Boston College. Um, and uh, I'll say a couple of words about us. We mostly study issues of uh, labor for older workers, uh, how, how they're employed, when they choose to retire, um, questions of savings, uh, dis-savings, um, risks to a financially secure retirement, like uh, health shocks, uh, unexpected longevity, uh, long-term care, and public policies around retirement, uh, above all, uh, social security. So. I'm not a lawyer. I have no background in law. I'm hoping to learn a lot today. I've already learned a lot. Um, but how did we get into the will space? So we look at national data on um, on wealth accumulation and on, on how people acquire wealth, how they spend it. Um, and in that data, we noticed a trend of declining uh, wills. From uh, 1996, uh, to roughly today, uh, the percent of people uh, over age 70 with a will declined from about three quarters to just about two thirds. So that's about a 10 percentage point decline. Um, that share has always been and remains higher for wealthier households. It's uh, higher for white households. And um, when we pointed this out, we were approached by uh, Wells Fargo, in fact, which is one of the largest mortgage lenders uh, in the country, to see if there's any research that could be done on narrowing the racial wealth gap by nudging people to write wills, um, kind of linked to the mortgage process, much like the question that closed the last session. Um, and we thought that was a really interesting question, and so we took that up. And the, the research ended up having three parts. Uh, the first one was just setting the stage. What's the relationship between uh, will writing, uh, between intended bequests, 
uh, between re and, and realize bequests, what actually happens when people pass away. Um, the second question was, is it possible to nudge people, to incentivize them, to write a will um, in general um, with money or at particularly opportune moments that li in life, like when they're closing on a house? Um, and can such interventions help close the racial will writing gap? And then the third uh, topic that we uh, have not yet studied, we're in the process of studying, is can closing the will writing gap um, narrow the racial wealth gap? So, today I'm going to talk about the first two uh, questions because the last one is still ongoing. Starting with the first, um, we wanted to document how different people, people of different race, experienced uh, receiving inheritances, uh, how patterns of will writing varied, and how the expectations of leaving bequests varied. And we did that using a large national survey um, that we do not run, we just use it often. It's called the uh, Health and Retirement Study, or the HRS. I'll be saying those letters uh, a bunch. Um, at a high level, non-Hispanic Blacks um, were about 25% less likely than uh, non-Hispanic Whites to have ever received an inheritance. Um, Hispanics had a similar gap. Even among those who had received an inheritance, uh, non-Hispanic Blacks, on average, received about $100,000 less. That's, again, conditional on having received an inheritance. They received $100,000 less. Um, Hispanics about $50,000 less. When we looked at will writing and bequest expectations, we found that Blacks and Hispanics are both about uh, 20 percentage points less likely to have a will than whites. Uh, even when we control for a bunch of characteristics. So if you take a uh, white person and a Black person who have the same age, gender, marital status, education, wealth, um, the white person is 20 percentage points more likely to have a will. And that's also reflected in expected bequests. Um, Blacks and Hispanics have much lower expected probabilities of leave, leaving at least $10,000 or at least $100,000. Um, interestingly, um, this survey asks also about $500,000 bequests. What, how, how much do you expect? What's the probability you expect of leaving such a large bequest? And there we actually see that it flips. Um, black and, blacks and Hispanics and other uh, race um, minorities actually report higher probabilities of leaving $500,000. And I think the way we um, interpret that is when um, people of color end up accumulating such large bequests that it's even feasible for them to leave them, they're actually very committed to uh, leaving a legacy. So the last question this paper wanted to answer was, uh, do wills help translate these expected bequests into realized bequests? And so here we looked at a subset of people in the HRS who were interviewed at some point. Um, the survey has been running since 1992. Um, people who were interviewed at some point and then subsequently passed away. And when that happens, the, the people who run this survey, they do a really good job. They uh, follow up with heirs, nexts of kin, and um, try to see what happened to the estate, who got it, how much was left. So unsurprisingly, the, expe the ex reported expected probability of leaving at least $10,000 or $100,000 or $500,000 is strongly related to whether people actually did that. but. Um, given that, if you take a white respondent and compare them to a black respondent who is, again, the same on a bunch of characteristics, the black respondent is less likely to have met their um, expected bequest um, by about 10 percentage points. Um, for Hispanics, that gap is about 13 percentage points. So minorities have a harder time meeting their expectations about bequests even when we look at them just two years before they die, within those two years, something happens to make the, um, to make the actual realized bequest not meet expectations. 
Nevertheless, across race and ethnicity and for all of these target bequests, having a will was associated with a significantly increased probability of meeting your expectations. So wills, at least descriptively, look like they help, um, help people achieve their goals. And that can be in at least two ways that we've thought of. One is mechanical, kind of legal. Um, it smooths the process, it preserves the wealth. The other is that it might focus the mind. Um, people who have planned to leave something might um, take steps to make sure they have that when they pass away. And so these suggestive results motivated the second paper, and here I'm uh, going to get to the question that, that ended the last session. Um, we wanted to see whether it's possible to get people to write a will um, when they sign a mortgage. And to do that, we ran our own survey. Um, we surveyed about 3,000 people. And we asked a series of questions on wills, on ex expected bequests. If a person said that they had a will, we asked when they wrote it, um, why, how much they expect to bequeath, and to whom. And if they don't have a will, we asked why not, and how much assets they might have to leave. Of those who don't have a will, we randomly assigned them to four groups, one of four groups. The control group was just asked, would you consider writing a will? The first intervention was a mortgage intervention. We asked people to imagine they were getting a mortgage. Um, we asked them to list their various assets, which is what they would need to do anyway if they were writing a mortgage. Um, and we asked them if at that time, the bank offered free legal and financial advice in writing a will, would they take up that offer? A second treatment group had exactly the same setup, but they were also told the bank would give them $500 if they wrote a will towards the closing costs. And a third group was asked uh, nothing about a mortgage, but also asked to list their assets and then asked if they were opening some account with a bank, a savings account, a checking account, would they then consider uh, writing a will if the bank offered uh, legal and financial advice. So about one third of respondents had a will. Um, they were more likely to be white, they were more likely to have high income, they were older, more likely to be married, more likely to have children. Um, so that was not surprising. Um, typically, they had set up their wills during their 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, the most common triggering life event for writing a will was having a child. Um, other common things people reported were the death of someone close, which uh, made them think about mortality or made them experience the difficulty of dealing with an inheritance that didn't um, have clear uh, uh, estate planning. Uh, another common uh, reason for writing a will was the recommendation of a relative or a close friend. Regarding intended heirs, two thirds were uh, of intended recipients were children. Um, about 7% were grandchildren, other family members were about one-fifth. Um, and then for unrelated individuals or organizations, which could be religious or charitable groups, that's about 8% of recipients. Regarding those without a will, the most common reason for not having a will, about half of people said that they simply hadn't gotten around to it. Um, another 20% said that they had named beneficiaries on their important assets like 401ks that require you to name a beneficiary. So all of these findings were consistent with prior research um, regarding the characteristics of people who have wills and don't, and in particular the finding that procrastination is a real impediment to will writing, um, also consistent with a lot of research. What was much more surprising to us was what we found on the experimental side when we tried to see whether mortgages uh, could help nudge people into writing a will. And unfortunately, the answer was not so much. Um, both of the first two treatments, um, the just would you consider writing a will while getting a mortgage and also would you consider writing a will if the bank gave you $500 while writing a mortgage, both of those were less likely to result in a will than um, the control group that wasn't told anything about mortgages at all. Um, the finance. Why do you think that was? Oh, well, um, I I'll tell you now, and also the results that are coming up are consistent with it. We think that the mortgage writing process is already overwhelming. 
there's already um, so much going on. It's a big burden bureaucratically. It's a lot of paperwork. It's just people are overwhelmed. Um, I'm going to keep going, and, and I'll show you why I think that. Um, the financial incentive also didn't uh, do much to help with this. Um, one issue with interpretation was that people um, with the control group who were just asked, would you write a will, they weren't given a time frame for doing it. And they could probably think, well, I'll do it someday. Whereas the mortgage people kind of needed to do it now or never if they wanted this free um, advice and, and money. And so we did a different comparison just among the treatment groups. So the mortgage group, the mortgage group plus $500 and the opening another bank account. Um, and when we did that, we actually found that the occasion of opening a checking or savings account was much better for uh, people in terms of uh, getting uh, a will done. Um, and it was even better than if you give them $500 on a mortgage versus um, no money at all. But when you're opening a, some simpler account, um, the simpler account still won out there. Um, why I think the complexity matters, we, we divided people um, into two different groups uh, based on a number of different dimensions. So one such a division was, um, why don't you have a will? The group that didn't have a will because they already had named beneficiaries on their major assets, we considered them quote unquote sophisticated. They have a good reason for not writing a will. Um, everyone else was unsophisticated. Again, not, not seriously taking the word sophisticated here. Um, but the sophisticated group here responded really strongly to the $500 incentive. Uh, the unsophisticated group didn't at all. They actually responded really strongly to being in the less complex bank setting as opposed to the mortgage setting. Um, when we define sophistication, uh, I see time's up. Um, I'm happy to answer more questions later. Thanks, Gal. Uh, now we're going to go on. Uh, now we're going to hear from Jesse Williams, who's at Wake Forest University, who is in the practical aspects of helping to get estate planning done in a clinic. So why don't you tell us about your experience, Jesse? Sure. Thank you, uh, Terry, and thank you, Gal, for leading us off there. Um, I also want to thank Thomas for inviting us to be here. Uh, thank Scott Shang, who co-directs the Ayers Property Project at Wake Forest Law School and hired me, and Fran Miller, who gave a sizable amount of the funding that made that possible. Um, there are plenty of other people um, I would want to thank here, and uh, it's wonderful to be in front of a room of so many people I admire. I'll say a little bit about our work and then uh, share a few perspectives on the will-making gap um, from our perspective. Um, so... Our clinic came about at Wake Forest as a result of people in the working group that was trying and is still trying to see to it that the UPHPA was passed in North Carolina, asking what North Carolina law schools were doing about heirs property. Um, and Professor Shang kind of took up that call. Um, he had also heard from the tax collector in Forsyth County about issues with foreclosure on heirs property, which is Forsyth is where uh, Wake Forest is located. Um, and he reached out to me to start piloting heirs property representations in the environmental law and policy clinic while I was still employed by Legal Aid of North Carolina. It went well, um, and eventually in January of last year, we were able to launch this clinic full time. So we work primarily, almost exclusively with air property owners on the kinds of problems that result when you already have heirs property. Um, and those are numerous and various as any of the attorneys or academics in the room can tell you. Um, we found it to be a really positive pedagogical experience for our students. Um, it is a, you know, a rich and complex matter type. Um, our students are confronted with professional ethical concerns routinely. Um, they have to learn how to navigate relationships and complex relationships in families. Um, and then they have to develop substantive knowledge of an area of law that, frankly, I think is under-researched, under-appreciated, uh, and, and um, not well represented in the practice. So we have clients from all over North Carolina with a variety of needs in, in that regard, which is all a way of saying there are people in this room who are attorneys who know 
a good deal more about estate planning than I do. We work with folks who have already had estate planning problems in their family in the past, Crystal Richardson and Pamela Harrigan Young, two from my home state in North Carolina who I see here. Um, I will try to offer a few perspectives, as I said, from our work on the, the will-making gap. Um, and I won't linger on the consequences of the failure to prepare a will, because I think those are consequences that most of us here are, are already familiar with. Really just, I wanna say three things basically about the failure um, to create wills for people who are poor and people of color. You know, the first is that the access to attorneys in rural areas in the United States is just staggeringly poor. Um, and I think most people who practice law understand that functionally without a good zealous attorney, people don't really have rights guarantees. And so we talk about access to justice, but I think it's a misnomer. You know, these are places where people do not have their rights protected systematically. Um, to take one example, in Gates County, North Carolina, which is in northeastern North Carolina, in the Black Belt, it's a population of 10,000 people, and there are two attorneys who practice law there. Um, so if you do the math, you think there are 5,000 people in that county of age to need estate planning services. And you imagine that both of those attorneys prepare one estate every day, no breaks, no weekends, no Christmas. That's seven years of work to prepare wills for everybody in that county. So, you know, that's not going to happen. And Gates is somewhat exceptional, but there are a dozen or more counties in North Carolina with fewer than 10 attorneys and comparable populations. Um, and that's to say nothing of cost. It's to say nothing of conflicts. It's to say nothing of people's mere ability to drive and get to visit one of those attorneys. And we know, and Scott, I always look at you when I think of air property in urban areas, that some of those barriers are present in urban places as well. Um, I think it's a failure of the legal profession, um, but it's also a systematic um, common problem in rural spaces that the basic features of infrastructure and social infrastructure are not present, protected, um, or incentivized to locate there. So that's one perspective on this problem. I think that viewing this as a problem that is going to be solved purely by um, <laughs> adding attorneys to the picture, um, and I'm very glad that you're gonna speak about broader and higher level solutions, um, is short-sighted, and it doesn't accurately appreciate the scale of the need, especially in rural places, especially in black predominated rural places. Um, but, you know, this approach of um, throwing attorney time at the problem or viewing it as a, you know, a way to um, uh, create opportunities for pro bono, you know, uh, attorney uh, investment um, is a common response, right? We see not enough attorneys, not enough time spent preparing wills, so let's just get more out there. Um, and I think it comes from a good place. And I've been part of Will's Clinics when I was an employee at Legal Aid in North Carolina. Um, but I think a conversation also has to be had about um, preparing the right will for folks um, and preparing it in a way that is um, respectful and honorable. You know, um, Kara, you were speaking a little while ago about how um, talking about death is hard. Talking about death is hard. It's somber. Um, it's incredibly personal. Um, talking about death and family alongside one another. I mean, you're asking people to make decisions that are of enormous weight. Um, and I don't think that that's something that you can do decently and respectfully in some of the settings that people are asked to prepare their wills in. Um, if your the sum of your life's labor, you know, is going to be allocated by the work of a law student who spends 15 minutes with you, you know, I think that law student might be very capable. They might be coming from a good place. And in the end, that service might be of great value. Um, but I think it's not necessarily respectful and likely to produce the sort of thoughtful, reflective decision making that is really called for when people are, are preparing wills. And of course, it has to be said that wills can create tendencies in common too. Um, and they frequently do, you know. If you have a client who comes to you as an attorney and says, I want to leave my house to my four kids, a number of attorneys that we have spoken with, including people who will remain nameless, who are running uh, pro bono wills clinics, 
have told us that they will just implement that. They'll just, you know, write the language that leaves that house to four children, which by default in every state I know of creates a tenancy in common. Um, I think it's important, and this is speaking to attorneys, but also to folks who work with attorneys, I suppose. Um, it's important to uh, advise your clients on the consequences of taking the action that they ask you to take on their behalf. You know, you have a duty to inform them of the risks that arise from the decisions that they are going to make. And when it comes to creating tenancies in common, when I was preparing um, wills for folks at Legal Aid, I would try to lay out, you know, what can happen in certain moments um, for families who are left property in that form. And I think this is another point of, um, or another opportunity to reflect on the need for the right space and the right respect in creating the process of a will, or in the process of creating a will, excuse me, um, in that, you know, <laughs> people rightfully are skeptical of what a young white guy just out of law school can tell them about how their family is going to handle property after they pass away. Um, and I think being in a place where you can build a relationship of trust, being in a place where that person feels like they are getting the service from an attorney that they deserve is vital to even being able to communicate what you appreciate as an attorney of the risks of what happens after, after someone passes away. Um, so having access to attorneys at all, having access to attorneys who are able to treat you with respect and create the decorum in which you can make somber decisions and can advise you about those somber decisions. These things I think are very important. And again, you know, we're talking about an enormous amount of resources that have not been invested in serving people in estate planning. And the just the sheer scale of the problem that I've alluded to with the discussion of Gates County, North Carolina, to me suggests the need for solutions to the estate planning gap that reach beyond you know, additional attorneys. I think it's a that is that will fall orders of magnitude short of what is required. That's why I'm grateful to be here with folks who are thinking about that in ways that I'm I, I can't. I'll say one more thing about this, um, which is that when we talk to our clients about where heirs' property came from in their family, um, often our clients tell us things that subvert the conventional narrative that it's merely about ignorance or about access. In many cases, our clients tell us that their ancestors created air property deliberately. And I think that's important to reckon with um, as we think about the will-making gap. Um, it's very hard to keep land in your family for generations. It's just really, really hard to do. Um, if you have in every generation a single owner Sooner or later, there's going to be someone who drinks or who gambles or who just gets unlucky or who gets defrauded. And because they are possessed of a full and complete interest in that property, that one moment will be the moment when the work of generations was, was lost. Um, I think but for partition and really but for the court invented preference for partition by sale that's emerged in the last 50 or 70 years, um, putting land in a tenancy in common was a good way to protect it. <laughs> it was a good way to help people make sure that they always had a home place that they could go to. Um, and it reflected a value in the land that was not about um, market wealth, but was about place and about self-sufficiency, about a, a sort of self-authored freedom. Um, and uh, I think that's really important to acknowledge um, that when people are coming with a preference for a tenancy in common, that that preference can be richly informed um, and they can very well understand the consequences of their actions. Um, and I think that's worth saying as well. Viewing that historical question, viewing the fact that I think an enormous amount of air property was deliberately created, also says if we want folks to write wills, we have to create a structure in which that's worth doing. Um, there are plenty of people we've talked to. We were just at a community meeting in Winston-Salem not long ago where someone said, yeah, I'm supposed to inherit some of this house and I don't want anything to do with it. You know, It's an albatross. It's tax. It's repair. Um, it's not clear what would, be, what would be done with it in the end. It probably requires more investment um, than that person has you know, access to capital. Um, and that person doesn't want to inherit. Um, they don't want that asset protected in the way that we as lawyers are trained to tell them they should. Um, and I think we also have to make sure that, you know, contrary to the experience of 
many of the ancestor of our, uh, ancestors of our clients, wills and non-tenancy and common ownership are in fact an effective way to protect assets. And I think people recognize that assets can be lost, wealth can be lost on the market, so-called, just as easily, easily as it can be lost through fraud or, or through legal means of taking. So in addition to talking about a failure of um, attorneys to provide access to will-making services, a failure to do them well, I think we also have to zoom out and think about a structure that doesn't incentivize people appropriately to protect assets and doesn't guarantee that taking the step of making a will will actually protect those assets in the really long run. Um, and with that, I'll hand it off. Thanks, Jesse, for that perspective, and especially for the uh, respectful appreciation for the history of how these decisions were made. Uh, now we're going to turn to Kiva Terry from um, Howard Law School, who's going to give us a little bit more perspective about estate planning and how we can try to address these issues with heirs' property. Thank you. Thank you, Terrence. Good morning. Uh, my name is Professor Kiva Terry. I'm on the faculty at Howard University School of Law. Um, I am delighted to participate in this panel, and I'm grateful uh, for the invitation. Um, at Howard, we have taken a three-pronged approach in our efforts to address the racial will-making gap and the problem of heirs' property. First, we have expended substantial efforts to enact legislation and legal reforms that will enable wealth preservation. Second, we are determined to grow the pipeline of diverse trust and estates attorneys, especially black trust and estates attorneys. And third, we are committed to increasing financial literacy in our community. And I'll discuss um, each in turn. So with regard to legal reforms, for the past several years, Howard Law faculty and students have conducted research uh, and contributed um, notably to the report strengthening probate administration in the District of Columbia. As you know, Howard University is located in Washington, D.C. And this report identifies a range of legislative regulatory policy, educational, pro bono, and practice changes that will aid the citizens of the District of Columbia, especially those who navigate the probate estate administration process without, uh, lo uh, without legal counsel. And these proposals, some of them have uh, been passed, enacted by the DC Council already, um, and others remain under consideration by the DC Council. Uh, Howard Law has also partnered with Professor Mitchell. Um, we were very involved in the enactment of the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act in the state of Maryland in 2022. And we also advocated for its passage, passage of the UPHPA in the District of Columbia, which law became effective in 2023. Um, as you know, both of these uh, laws help families preserve their wealth and legacies in the form of real property. Additionally, we remain engaged in discussions with officials in Maryland about legislation to increase access to non-probate options that will complement our will-making efforts. These non-probate options include transfer on death deeds, payable on death bank accounts, and motor vehicle death beneficiary designations. We believe access to these non-probate options will reduce the racial wealth gap because they allow loved ones immediate access to assets without having to endure the expense and the frustration often associated with the estate administration process thereby providing families an easy and affordable way to transfer and preserve generational wealth. This is especially important since most Americans die without a will. And as Professor uh, Mitchell mentioned, on average, two out of three black families do not have a will. Uh, 
Um, to be more specific about these legislative proposals, the first one would create transfer on death deeds in the state of Maryland. Transfer on death deeds is a simple way to transfer real property to the new owner upon the transfer's death outside of the probate process. We believe this simple one-page option could be an important tool in the prevention of heirs property. The second legislative proposal would require banks and other savings institutions to present and discuss payable on death forms with consumers at the time a bank account is opened. Research has revealed that a bank account represents the only financial asset for most black and Latino families. And it is critical um, for this asset to be preserved. The third legislative proposal would require the State Motor Vehicle Administration to ask individuals if they would like to name a death beneficiary for their vehicle in the same way individuals are asked if they would like to register to vote when they register their vehicle. Uh, preliminary research findings indicate that many families open small estates in probate court solely to access bank accounts and motor vehicles. Um, and if enacted, these legislative proposals would provide families an easy and affordable way to transfer and preserve their generational wealth. And as I mentioned previously, it would allow their loved ones immediate access to the assets without having to endure the expense and the frustration um, and the time often associated with the estate administration process. So that's our first prong, enacting legislative reform. Regarding our second prong, growing the pipeline of black trust and estates attorneys. Um, this past fall, Howard Law launched our estate planning and heirs property clinic. And our uh, one of our supervising attorneys, Malefi McIntosh, um, is here who supervises the estate planning and heirs property clinic. And our director of the clinical law center, Valerie Schneider, is also uh, present. The clinic provides clients with estate planning tools such as wills, advanced directives, financial powers of attorneys, uh, beneficiary designation for retirement benefits, and transfer on death deeds. Um, the clinic also works with clients on matters related to heirs property. I'll uh, take a moment, I just want to mention some of the notable accomplishments of the clinic. Um, it has served more than 20 clients in Washington, D.C. and Maryland, completed 150 intake forms for potential clients. By the end of this semester, we'll have executed 15 to 20 complete estate plans consisting of a last will and testament, advanced directive for health care, and durable financial power of attorney. They have counseled clients on establishing and maintaining effective plans for non-probate assets, participated in several outreach events for communities with historically low rates of estate planning, and most importantly, they have provided intensive training for 20 law students who are now well-equipped to practice in this area upon graduation. Additionally, we have also expanded our curriculum at Howard to offer additional experiential educational opportunities to our students, such as internships for academic credit with probate court judges and internships for academic credit with nonprofit organizations that provide estate planning and will making services to our community and provide assistance to help resolve heirs property matters. Finally, uh, in our effort to grow the pipeline of black trust and estates attorneys, we have been very intentional about partnering with professional organizations, such as the American College of Trust and Estate Council, affectionately known as ACTEC, 
and the National Bar Association's Real Property Trust and Estate section for educational programming with our students to introduce them to careers in trust and estates. These partnerships have been very successful. For example, one of our 2024 graduates will be joining Brianna and the Center for Heirs Property Preservation in the fall. Uh, and he first learned about Heirs Property during one of our educational programs. Uh, these partnerships have also resulted in practitioners, uh, Tina Nelson, Jennifer Good, volunteering their time to teach as adjunct faculty at the law school, um, all in an effort to grow the pipeline of Black trust and estates attorneys. So that's the second prong um, of our initiatives. Our third prong, advancing financial literacy in our community, that's our newest initiative. And certainly the students in our estate planning and heirs property clinic have been on the forefront, providing estate planning information sessions to members of the community. In addition to educating adults, however, our goal is to have financial literacy become a standard part of the K through 12 educational curriculum. We believe that teaching children financial literacy can help them to understand the importance of making their own financial decisions and can introduce them to important concepts such as savings, credit, debt, investing, and budgeting which will enable them to be better financial stewards of their generational wealth. We've engaged in preliminary conversations with the Education Law Center at the law school about joint initiatives, and we hope to partner with our School of Education in the future about K through 12 curriculum reform. I look forward to the Q&A session, and hopefully this has provided a sense of Howard University's efforts to address the racial will making gap and the problem of heirs property. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kiva. Uh, I love those three prongs. And one of them I just wanted to draw attention to particularly is that I know that the National Conference of Bar Examiners is basically removing trust and estates as a requirement for bars across the country, which means that law schools don't really have an incentive to hire professors to teach trusts and estates. So students don't have the resource to access the classes, don't know that it's there. And so for you to choose to be intentional at this time when uh, there's a, a wave that says the trust and estates isn't important, I think is essential. And I think that's what we're all here for is to try to figure out how we can avoid these issues. So just make that note. Um, um, do we think, I mean, part of what I think has been fascinating about this whole conference is the chance to share ideas that are good ideas here and there across the country where either siloing to lawyers or to other specific categories of employment or research policy, et cetera, uh, that occurs so much. How can we try to... Um, make sure that we're continuing to have this kind of cross fertilization of information and knowledge, uh, resources of, 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 of data that we can access across the country. I've heard about so much today already, the, the deathanddirt.com, uh, et cetera. Do any of you have thoughts or ideas about how we can try to um, share these ideas more nationally? Um. One suggestion that was uh, made by Professor McIntosh, he and Megan Wernicke are the supervising attorneys for our estate planning and, and heirs property clinic. And they have um, encountered clients who, although they live, the clients live in Maryland or Washington, DC, they have interest in heirs property in other parts of the country. Um, and they've had difficulty finding legal resources to assist. And so one suggestion was for there to be um, more of a, a network, not just a listserv, um, but where there's really contact information provided about heirs, property attorneys throughout the country 
a resource that can be utilized um, by those who may find themselves in that same situation, clients domiciled in one particular state or jurisdiction, but with heirs property interest in others and um, having that uh, immediate resource available for legal counsel to assist them. Uh, I'm pleased to say, Kiva, that I think such a network ex sort of begins to exist and uh, in terms of sharing contact information and connecting people directly to attorneys. I know that's something we're working on now, getting live on the website, or is that already live, Fran? It'll be, it'll be discussed later. Um, but the Air Property Practitioner Network is a, is a group of attorneys who focus on this, um, who are in touch with one another and has been, just speaking personally, uh, invaluable to me in learning how to do this better um, and in um, creating a sense of community among the attorneys who do this work. If there are attorneys in this room, who do air property practice and are not affiliated with the network, please talk to us or attend the, the one o'clock session and, and learn more about it. I'll also just say on a personal level, I've been really grateful um, to learn from Genevieve at St. Mary's and Heather Way at Texas, Malefi as well at, at Howard. And I think the community of clinicians who work on this are, are nodes for sharing that information and sharing that knowledge and making sure that it goes into the, the hands and, and the hearts and the heads of, of students who are gonna go on and, and practice afterwards. But of course, there's always more we can do in that regard. And I would say as an academic that um, I guess I found conferences like this one to be the best way to reach other research that's been done. I think for practitioners, there's probably other networks that are more effective, but, um, but I think uh, the, the work that Professor uh, Mitchell is doing is really great for bringing together different strands of disciplines and uh, research. Right. Um, I want to make sure that we have space and time for questions from the audience or from uh, the web. Um, any questions? There's one back there in the back. Please remember to say your name and where you're coming from. Hi, Ken Biggis. I'm from Philadelphia. We uh, manage a housing counseling organization and work with uh, community legal services to do estate planning work. My question uh, entails like a scalable model that you can do estate planning work considering, and I'll give you some context. We do education to the public about estate planning and the demand for those that want to like prepare their documents exceeds the capacity of those that other practitioners that can prepare the documents. So curious to know, and this might be sacrilegious, a room full of attorneys, how can this could be um, built up where it can be by like, I don't say bypass, but just make sure that those documents are in place. Thank you. Uh, any, how do you have any thoughts on that? Because your question's basically, non-lawyer ways of helping to facilitate getting estate planning done, essential services. Is that kind of what you're trying to get to? Any thoughts or reactions on the panel? Yes, I'm a strong advocate for uh, non-probate options. Um, I believe that is a way to structure estate planning um, outside of the probate process and perhaps without the need for attorneys, especially with regard to simple assets such as bank accounts, retirement accounts, motor vehicles. Um, these are some of the legislative initiatives that I, I mentioned, um, trying to increase access and, and information sharing with community members about these non-probate options. Notably, transfer on death deeds, um, that may be something that we might not um, encourage without legal counsel, but it's certainly a simpler process um, than the will making process and a, a way in which to prevent heirs property and to allow for the legal transfer of uh, real property upon a, a person's death in a, in a very easy and affordable way. So I, I'm all about non probate options. I'd like to second that. I think um, for 401ks, for example, the requirement of naming a beneficiary is great. Um, for things that are in cash, I think that works really well because it's easily divided. It's easy to name the beneficiary. Um, 
houses, I think, are where we really need a lot of thought because you can't divide them very easily. That's a part of the problem. And I think uh, they're definitely the largest asset for most families. I know in California, we're considering legislation to increase the, um, the uh, uh, non-probate transfer uh, jurisdiction amount. I think it used to be 200,000, considering going up to 750,000 in California. Uh, so again, non non legal ways to adjust policy or legislation to make that uh, to facilitate that. And I'll just touch base quickly on a couple of things that we have in um, Los Angeles that we've developed based on uh, other concepts from other jurisdictions is legal services centers that are pairing with law firms uh, to provide those legal services, both on a pro bono basis, but also to get training for lawyers through the uh, trust and estates group within a legal services center so that lawyers are learning how to do the trust and estates to provide those services to the black and underserved communities. And so we were able to raise funds to create a fellowship um, so that there's a, a lawyer who's running this program. And then Los Angeles County has also contributed as well to create a um, leaving a legacy program to provide estate planning for free for people who qualify for the service. So again, I think it's sharing these ideas across the country and figure out, hey, this worked in your jurisdiction, how can we make this work in mine? Are there other questions from the room? Um, so we're moving that way. Good morning, my name is Courtney Brunson. I am the Racial Wealth Gap Partnership at the Boston Foundation. Really excited to be here today. I wanted to uncover a lot of um, the things that you all mentioned earlier that we heard earlier today, which is around education around these issues, but specifically cultural competency education. There was a lot of um, what you all mentioned about, you know, people not doing it because they're unsophisticated or because they made a mistake, but because it was deliberately done and by design and how we can educate people in K through 12 education, but also educate people providing those services about the complexities around this. So I'd love for you all to just speak a little bit more, not just about the education of systems as they exist, but also making sure that all actors in these systems have the education and the training to work with people and understand what considerations they have in mind and that they're particularly trying to put forward to help their families move on their wealth. Cultural competence, anybody wanna take that? And I can, I can start here, and I guess I would say, um, you know, there's enormous amount that gets encompassed in cultural competence training. I think <clears throat> one thing that I'm really grateful to my clinical professors in law school for instilling in me, and something I try and instill in our students, is um, a default assumption that when your client makes a choice or articulates a preference, um, that they have good reasons for that and that that's an informed preference, um, and that it's something that if it doesn't make sense to you, probably first requires you to understand their perspective better, um, as opposed to um, inferring ignorance or inferring short-sightedness on your client's part. Um, I think if there was one thing to say about um, working with clients who have you know limited experience with attorneys or who have preferences that often grate against attorneys' training and sense of what is correct, um, that might be the place to start. Um, and I think, um, you know, if we can do more of that work in clinical settings and law schools, but also in attorney mentorship, um, that will go a long way. I would say the one more thing, which is that <clears throat> the obstacle to that kind of um, reflectiveness or thoughtfulness, and none of us practices it perfectly, more often than not is not um, mendacity or um, uh, a desire not to take clients seriously. More often than not, it's time, um, I think, for many attorneys, and it's a sense of pressure where you don't feel as though you have time to engage as deeply as you would like with your client. And I think this is a, uh, you know, the refers to the tension I described earlier, which is that estate planning is a process that requires a real relationship and intensive time commitment to do well in some instances. Um, and it's also one where the demand is orders of magnitude greater than the supply. Um, and that's a very hard problem to solve. But I know, you know, the folks in the Howard Clinic and others in this room are working on training the attorneys who can begin to fill that gap. I think that's really exciting. 
I think that's um, a perfect segue. Uh, I do believe that as we grow the pipeline of diverse trust and estates attorneys, those conversations will filter um, into the larger trust and estate bar. Uh, uh, there's research that has um, documents kind of cultural compatibility being an important consideration with regard to the selection or access to legal representation. I do believe also that um, our partnership with professional organizations, it, it is a two-way street. The practitioners are sharing um, their expertise and experience with our students, and our students are also able to share a certain cultural perspective with the practitioners that I do believe aids the practitioners in their work. And so that is a way in which we're addressing um, some of the more systemic challenges with regard to um, cultural consciousness and introducing that kind of thoughtfulness into the process as we engage um, with ACTEC, with the American Bar Association, with the DC Estate Planning Council, um, some of these professional organizations who may not have been exposed um, to diverse communities in the same way, we can introduce those conversations and um, some of those considerations in a more deliberate and intentional fashion. I, I think there were some questions in the middle. Um, is, is there a microphone for the, the couple people in the middle who are trying to? Uh, I've, got, or... I've got actually a quick but, but broad question. My name is Julie Miller. I'm at AERP as Director of Thought Leadership for Financial Resilience. And I'm curious, as we as we think about cultural considerations, what are some of the maybe broad overarching pieces that anyone would offer up in terms of age and generation as well in intersections here? The question was about um, how cultural background differs by age. Did I hear that correctly? i'm I'm curious about when we think in the context of longevity, when we think in the context someone, um, mentioned earlier around life expectancy and, and racial disparity, racial disparities around what life expectancy. How can we um, intersect or put into conversation here what it means to be thinking about um, about estate planning uh, and and wills, et cetera, in a in a generational context? What are some considerations there and age age as well? Yeah, I mean, I think that. Um... Certainly, I have observed differences in clients who are interested in preparing estates who are much older than clients who are closer in age to myself or, you know, to a generation between me and the and true elders. <clears throat> um, I think that hearing one dimension of that question, um, folks, in my experience, and this is anecdotal, and we should turn to you, Gal, because you have the data. Um, but in my experience, folks who are older... Um, you know, frankly, they tend to be closer to generations of, of their ancestors who made deliberate choices to avoid engaging with the legal system and engaging with the wills and the state's preparation system. And so I think I, I tend to find anecdotally, I hope this is borne out in the data, I tend to find um, uh, greater skepticism. Um, and often I find I found among those clients, um, I had the sense that many of them were there because someone had told them to be there. Um, and not necessarily because they felt like it was a particularly valuable use of their time. And I'll, I think one of my struggles in serving elder, elder clients was just um, trying to make sure I was getting really true and good and thoughtful answers from them about some of these hard questions. Um, and of course, there's only so much you can do. So that might be one perspective. And, I'll, I'll hand over to you. and I hope I appreciated your question in the, in the way you meant it. Yeah. Um... Absolutely right. I think in terms of the data, we definitely see that there's more will writing the older people get. Um, there's also some evidence that people do it kind of very close to death. So between the last interview in the HRS, for example, and when people die, which is at most two years later, because it's a biannual survey, um, there's a big jump in the people who have wills um, in their last interview before death versus the people who had wills by the time they died. Um, that said, I'm not sure that's the best time to write a will. There's not enough time to reflect. There's uh, different considerations that come up. Um, in terms of race um, and life expectancy, uh, I think an underappreciated fact is that um, Blacks 
have a much less uncertain date of death than whites, um, a much more unpredictable, a much broader range. And so it might be important to emphasize in black communities how um, really random uh, the age of death is. And if you are waiting until, you know, your last hour, you might miss, you might miss the opportunity, especially for blacks. Uh, yeah, I see there's one person here who's been trying to ask a question for a bit. I don't know if she has a mic, but. Hello. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'm Gabrielle Chapman. I'm with Shared Capital Cooperative. We're one of the one of three intermediary lenders with the Ayers Relending Program. Um, we've faced significant challenges to that program. I had a bunch of notes in my file literally just pooped out on me. <laughs> but I wanted to raise this question, and it really relates back to um, the last panel in a lot of ways. And I know there are a lot of people thinking about this like we are. Um, first off, I also want to um, give thanks to the perspective around the intentionality of how Ayers property um, um, is, it, it creates this preservation. Um, Share Capital is, we're a democratic loan fund, so we're a co-op of co-ops, and we steward um, cooperatively and make um, loans based on um, a democratic and participatory framework. Um, so we're encouraging people to consider trust as an option and thinking about how to, to steward land and commons. Um, so that's a piece of it. But my, my, my question is more around um, the, these conversations of collateral and um, personal guarantees. For example, the Land Assistance Fund had trouble getting folks to pay the loan back and in fact, it basically imploded the fund. And for us as a, a democratic loan fund, that is um, shepherding and stewarding our members' interest. Um, I'm curious what folks are thinking in terms of creative solutions around collateral. So for example, um, we don't want to further create um, black land loss and thinking about what happens if someone doesn't repay the loan. Um, do we have like down, pay, down payment assistance or um, deferred loans or recover, recoverable grants or forgivable grants. So I'm just curious, you know, if anyone in this room wants to brainstorm and think about what are creative solutions to make this work um, and make it a, a source of capital that is actually, you know, creating solutions and not more harm. That's it. Uh, broad ranging points. I think we only have about a minute or less. Anybody have any uh, response to that question? Uh, I, I don't want to speak for for everybody. I, I might I might say that that's a a much larger conversation um, for a, a you know broader participation with folks who know more about it than I do or, or my fellow panelists. Um, but I think you know it's obviously a really important question. Uh, I think we're just about out of time, and I appreciate everyone's uh, thoughts and suggestions and comments and questions, and certainly this amazing panel. I hopefully will continue to have these robust discussions and how we can use estate planning as a way to try to address this issue and uh, try to reduce this crazy racial wealth gap. Uh, thank you so much, panel. We really appreciate it. Good morning. Well, I can tell I'm not down south because we do it a lot better than that. Good morning. Good morning. There we go. There we go. Um, after the great sessions of yesterday and what is going on today, it, you know, it might seem like we're preaching to the choir. But, you know, every once in a while, it's nice to hear the choir sing, right? Yeah. And let's acknowledge our choir director, Thomas Mitchell, right? And the wonderful support team of faculty, staff, and students at Boston College and the law school, right? Now, this session will look at government agencies and how they're addressing, you know, this important issue of heirs property. And we have some great representation on this panel, but I also would like to acknowledge that there are other USDA agencies that are involved here. Um, the Tuskegee, which is one of the 1890 institutions. Uh, we have a relationship with ERS and Clayton Mashad, he's here. And we have uh, other government agencies, right? 
They're not just USDA, there are other government agencies. And for example, FEMA. And in the way of bringing yesterday and today together, uh, looking at the media, I'd like to do a shout out to uh, Hannah Dreyer with the Washington Post, who did work with uh, documenting cases of FEMA not serving uh, black landowners. And she did a really interesting uh, study and story. FEMA changes policy that kept thousands of black families from receiving disaster aid back in September of 2021. But I also like to go back to USDA a little bit because, you know, 2018 Farm Bill, the first time heirs property is put in there, right? It's, it's to get actually into the Farm Bill. That is how farmers can get a farm number. Um, the relending program, things like this. And then also USDA NIFA, because it provides critical financial support that we could then use to address heirs property. It supports, for example, the Policy Center. We heard Dr. Carol Woods and that organization and the great things it's doing. It supports the Southern Rural Development Center. John Green is here somewhere. And the things that they're doing, organizing a regional heirs property support network, it, help to sponsor the Journal of Rural Social Sciences. We have an issue out that focuses on heirs property and the Southern Extension Research Activity, the SARA 49, which also focuses on heirs property. And if you think that, you know, about the relationships that are going on, and I'm, I'm sorry I have to, to pick on Dr. Woods, but it was through NIFA that we were able to have a capacity building grant that supported her PhD research mm -hmm. on heirs property. And then from there, the position opened as a research analyst at the policy center. And then from there, she's able to help bring people together and allocate funds, again, that focuses on heirs property. And then I have another student who's working on heirs property. So the cycle keeps going and going and going. And I think that we all know the importance of this. But moving away, I, I just also just quickly was want to acknowledge the folks out there that are doing such great work. So are there any other land grants out here? Raise your hand. Any land grants? OK. Other government agencies that I didn't mention? OK. Community-based organizations? There we go. How about attorneys? I, I, they, someone, there's a room full of attorneys here. You know, and I do workshops, and the first thing I say when I do a workshop is, I am not an attorney, right? But then with, you know, JC's on our team, I said, I'm not, but she is, okay? It's a big, big help. How about landowners? And then, of course, like I just mentioned, how about students? Okay, you're the ones that are going to carry this forward. I met this fantastic student yesterday from MIT. What? I mean, this is the first time I've done this kind of stuff, you know, above the Mason-Dixon line. So this is really, really exciting. So you can keep the cold. So we have some exciting people here. And we have Sarah Stein from the Federal Reserve. Cassandra Johnson Gaither from Forest Service and Linda Cornyn from FSA. And I just want to say something really quick with FSA. Um, back at the beginning of COVID, the summer, COVID summer, they, they provided some really, really good workshops that uh, Sam Cook and I did with FSA on Air's property. And it was really, really a, a great experience. So. Enough of this with me. And what I'd like to do is have everyone introduce yourselves. Okay, this is already on. <laughs> so my name is Sarah Stein. I'm a senior advisor with the Community Economic Development Team at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. Um, I actually have colleagues in the audience uh, from the Federal Reserve Banks of Boston and New York, um, 
if there are other colleagues in the room that I didn't know were here, I'm sorry, but I just wanted to give a shout out to those two banks. Um, Boston, New York, Atlanta, and a series of other banks, we make up the, the banks of the Federal Reserve System along with the Board of Governors. And I'll take this time to insert my standard disclaimer that anything that I say are reflective of my thoughts alone and do not represent the thoughts of the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, the Federal Reserve System, or the Board of Governors. Um, so in the Federal Reserve Bank system, uh, we have a community development function, and I'm part of the community economic development team. Um, and in my district, the 6th district, which is the district of the bank, the Atlanta bank, um, we have a strategic priority to advance economic mobility and resilience across our district. And this priority arose when our bank's leadership took a look at indicators of wealth building, of that economic development and growth at the household level across our district. And I'll say our states are Georgia, Florida, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Tennessee. And across those, they looked at all these indicators and found that in comparison to other bank districts, in comparison to the nation, um, these indicators of economic mobility and resilience were lagging and that there was a lot of work to do to ensure that the economy, which the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta is quite concerned about, as you may imagine, um, that, that the economy is one that's working for everyone. And so out of that commitment to the economic mobility and resili resilience, um, uh, my, my team, the community economic development team, um, has has done a lot of work to, to drive our initiatives. And one of these initiatives has formed around heirs property. Um, so I'll start with what my role is. I'm a senior advisor. I do work um, focused around housing and neighborhoods. And before I was a senior advisor at the bank, I was actually um, a practicing attorney. I was a legal aid attorney in Atlanta. And um, and I, I knew about heirs property, actually. I had learned about it in law school back in 2008 <laughs> um, when, uh, when uh, the Georgia Appleseed organization came to my law school and started talking about this thing called heirs property. Actually, in my property class, which in contrast to Thomas's experience of his property law class, I... I was very lucky to get um, a gentleman named Professor Frank Alexander as my property professor, and I adored property law. So, um, so I, you know, learned about it then, started practicing as an attorney, and then one day um, in my practice, I, I started encountering heirs' property. I was involved in a project that was focused on heirs' property and generational wealth building. And part of that project, I went to this convening at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta, and I realized that there was this whole arm of the bank that was interested in the same issues and questions that I was seeing in the fabric of the lives of my clients and, and interested in what its role could be in shifting the knowledge about these issues, the narratives about how to address them, and in connecting people who are already doing that work with one another and with people who want to do more of it. So that's just a, a picture of what we see as our basic role in conversations like this. Good morning again. I am Cassandra Johnson Gaither, and I am a research social scientist with the USDA Forest Service, uh, with the Southern uh, Research Station, and I sit in Athens, Georgia. Um, as a land management organization, the Forest Service is very interested in uh, issues around ears property because of the impacts of this kind of ownership, the constraints associated with this kind of ownership that uh, affects the, the, the uh, affects what way and what people can do with, with their land, with their rural land in particular. And so one of the ways that the Forest Service has come into this space over the past 10 years or so 
uh, one very visible way is through its participation and support of a program called the Sustainable Forestry, um, an African American, maybe that's in, maybe that should be in quotes because more groups other than African Americans are coming into that network, but the Sustainable Forestry, um, an African American land retention program, and the Forest Service was one of the first supporters and investors in in this programming, and it's been, it's been hugely successful. I will not go into um, uh, all the outcomes and the successes of that program because there are other folks, uh, both uh, not here and, and certainly here in the audience, uh, uh, Danielle is here with us, and she is uh, integral to that program, so I won't go into a whole lot of details about SFLR, but the Forest Service is very interested in this topic uh, beyond a quantification question. So I've been uh, involved in some efforts to estimate how much Irish property that is, that is. but my, my superiors, they're asking me, they're, go, they're going, well, okay, and now what? Now that we know that now that you quantify, like say, uh, Irish property, say across the nation, and we see that it concentrates in the South, what what do we do about it from um, a forest land management perspective? And so those are some of the questions that I will probably be tasked with, and some uh, those are some of the issues that I'm very uh, very interested in. So thank you. Good morning, everybody. My name is Linda Cronin. I'm the director for the outreach office for the United States Department of Agriculture's Farm Service Agency. Also joining me here today is our first equity, first ever equity officer, Latrice Hill in the Farm Service Agency, which is really exciting to see that commitment. And also Darlene Canales is in the back. She is, she's been on the ground as a loan officer. She now works in Washington, DC, work uh, originally working on some of the highly fractionated land program work and now working on customer service and experience work, as well as um, an advisor in the um, farm loan office, uh, deputy administrator for farm loan programs office. Um, so what is FSA? What is the Farm Service Agency? I think it's important to have some kind of context of who we are before we talk a little bit more about what we're doing and what our interests are around Ayers property. The Farm Service Agency has nearly 11,000 employees strategically placed across the country, 2,400 plus offices, in fact, uh, across the United States that works to support farmers and ranchers through various programs, including access to credit, um, conservation and environmental programs, disaster assistance for weather-related causes, and um, also safety net programs that help um, with pricing. As you can see, we're very important to farmers and ranchers, and most farmers and ranchers are aware of us and work with us pretty, pretty directly. The outreach office, um, which is where, where I work, we do a lot of outreach, education, technical assistance, and um, a very growing grants and cooperative agreement um, business, which we're starting. And I'll, I can talk about that in a, in a little bit. We have the beginning farmer and rancher program also in our office. We focus on underserved and the broader marketing of our programs and services. In addition to that, there's a network of state outreach coordinators represented in each state to make sure that we're um, fulfilling those needs. Thank you. Am I turned on? Did I say that? No. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're going to go ahead and have a few questions and to, for a panel to address, and then. Um, they can then expand, but I do I do want to say that it's been a pleasure working um, with Sarah and her colleague Ann Carpenter, and how they brought a really really cool team together to work on this issue. So, but Sarah, um, why is it important for your institution to address heirs property, and what precautions must you take in doing so? Thanks for mentioning Ann Carpenter because she is um, is really the person that recognized and brought the issue of heirs property to the community development team. It was 
um, maybe obviously before I was even on the team, because it was her hosting at the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta that I um, benefited from when I was still a practicing attorney. Um, and I would say that the, the reason that it's important for the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta to have its eye on heirs property is that, well, I mean, I think I've already mentioned that we have a, a deep commitment to economic mobility and resilience and to building um, and to doing work that can advance that in the district. And part of that work is listening, so engaging with communities and understanding what issues are arising and then being responsive to that listening with doing research. We have, we have good capacity to do research, to support research that is also being done, to find a place where our particular strengths and resources can be brought to the issues that we hear about. And a great example is that Anne, when, when she was working on a different issue of um, vacancy and abandonment, particularly in rural and small cities across our district, this issue of heirs' property kept bubbling up as a barrier to the advancement of economic interests in these communities at the household level, at the small business level, at the um, on the farm level, that that this this heirs' property, this tangled title just kept coming up. And to her credit, she she's not a lawyer. She didn't, she had to learn what this was from lawyers, from researchers like you, who had been steeped in the issue for their careers. And so it was that that listening in a project that had nothing to do with heirs' property, at least on its face, that led her to start finding that expertise across the district and across the nation and, um, and bringing those conversations together and then honing in on what kinds of questions she might be able to help address. And so she did one quantification uh, analysis of heirs' property. Uh, I think that was 20... 16 or 16 or 17 was the date of her initial one. Um, and and when I came on, I brought a little bit more legal knowledge to the question, having practiced in the field. Um, and we continue to do those analyses. We have an urban heirs property paper that we are revising um, that looks at heirs property in the, um, the case study of Jacksonville, Florida. Um, and so one thing that we're bringing to that is my understanding of, of deeds and title records, right? So we're actually scraping deed records to sort of understand what it looks like under the hood of an estimation that's based on tax assessor data, right? Uh, and so that's a, that's a paper we're working on. Um, and then we, um, yeah, so things like that, trying to listen for the questions that are trying to be answered or that people want help with and think about what we can bring to the table. Sometimes that's our own original research. Sometimes that's a table for people to gather at. Um, and sometimes it's, you know, making sure that we find a space that we can occupy in a way that others can't. So we don't wanna duplicate what folks are doing. We wanna think about what resources do we have at our disposal so that we can give a platform to others so that we can charge the work that's being done and, and help bridge between a need and a resource. Okay, next will be Cassandra with the Forest Service. And I just wanna say, I do have to shout out like Ryan did with her work with Pippin and looking at ways to quantify heirs property that's not just labeled as heirs property. And be, be beyond that, you really have to go online, look at her publications with the Forest Service. Her research is so rich. I mean, it's, it's ethnography, what you're doing. And um, it really brings home the importance of this land issue with these folks that have forest land in many cases, which is heirs property. So look that up. Thanks so much, Robert. I, I just have a few slides, so um, no panic. But, 
I think some of the uh, input that we got from some of the folks that we spoke with, I would really like to try to bring their voices into this auditorium. So my contribution to this panel, I'm pretty sure is a little bit different in that I'd like to bring some attention to what property owners might do after they've cleared title. So these are no longer heirs property owners, but they've cleared title. And this relates to two specific activities, making improvements in the property um, that they've cleared title for, and then possibly using those cleared titles to access credit. So the idea here is to isolate factors or activities that indicate the potential for wealth increases post title clearance. So making improvements in properties, what people might be doing along those lines, and also um, uh, any information about their the ideas that they may have about um, using their cleared property titles um, to access credit. And so these are really important questions, I think, because the assumption in policy circles and among academics and others advocating for ears property owners is that formalizing land rights, that is clearing titles, that this should open the door to opportunities that are closed to people that don't, um, uh, to, that are closed to folks who uh, don't uh, own their property in a formal way. And so these assumptions about title clearing or formalizing land rights, they derive from neoliberal conceptualizations of real, uh, of real property ownership in the tradition of folks like Hernando de Soto and other property rights scholars. So uh, according to those folks, folks like de Soto, informal land ownership is thought to be a reason for both persistent poverty and wealth differentials between rich and poor nations. So again, the remedy is to correct the informality, right? So in the case of heirs property, this would mean clear in title, which should then lead to both a reduction in poverty rates and a catalyzation of wealth creation because third parties, that is creditors, now suddenly they would then have the confidence to accept property with clear title as collateral, which would then allow these property owners to access cash and make investments and improvements and so on. So now the only research that I'm aware of that has really looked at this kind of issue or question in the U.S., there's been quite a bit of research, um, say, in the global south looking at this issue. But in the U.S., the only research that I'm uh, 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 familiar with is the work um, uh, that uh, Peter Ward and Heather Way's research in Southwest Texas looking at title formalization of a, a, something that they call a contracts for deeds in Hispanic or Latin X colonial communities. And one key takeaway from that study is that only about 4% of the folks who got clear title, so they replaced these contracts with deeds with um, like legitimate deeds for these folks. So they got rid of those, um, those kind of kind of wonky uh, receipts or whatever that these folks. Okay, yeah. You can advance it now, actually. Yep. It's like they got rid of these sort of um, the illegitimate like, uh, like papers that folks were carrying around. They replaced these with legitimate deeds. But after these folks got these uh, bona fide deeds, these titles to these property, only about 4% of those folks were willing to use those clear titles as collateral, even though they knew they could, okay? So with funding from a USDA AFRI grant in 2021, and that um, grant, that project was led by the Southern Rural Development Center, and John Green, who's the head of the Southern Rural Development Center, he's, he's here somewhere there, where Johnny is, he's over there. So Mississippi State headed that effort. So with funding from that grant, we're also looking at this issue very broadly. Again, how owners with clear title may be improving um, those properties and possibly collateralizing those properties. And so I definitely want to acknowledge my uh, collaborators on this project. I'm working with Dr. Jenny Stevens, who's the executive director of the Center for Heirs Property Preservation, Dr. Portia Johnson with Auburn University. I saw uh, Portia earlier. I'm not sure if she's in the auditorium now. Jasmine Symington, the PhD student who did just an, an 
an outstanding job yesterday. She's also working with us. And most recently, who's come on to this project is Josh Walden, also with the Center for Ayers Property Preservation um, in Charleston, uh, uh, South Carolina. And he's the Chief Operating Officer of the Center for Ayers Property Preservation. So we're using a two-pronged approach to look at these questions, you know, using both qualitative and now some quantitative methods. So in terms of the qualitative approach, we're talking to property owners, right? And so far we've interviewed 27 owners with cleared titles for 25 properties in seven states, Alabama, Florida, Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, Virginia, and Missouri. All research participants were African-American and they included a mix of both rural and urban property owners, right? And so, uh, yeah, rural and urban property owners. You can advance the slide, okay. So in terms of credit access, because I don't have a whole lot of time, I just want to um, focus on this credit access piece, okay. So about 20 of the 27 respondents expressed very strong opposition to using their property to secure any kind of credit. I mean, when we talked to these folks, there was almost this really like, palpable aversion to doing anything with those titles that might increase the risk of them losing their property. And this is not unlike the folks who um, uh, provided responses to the issue of um, collateralizing their property in the Texas colonias. But then four families, and this represents seven individuals from four families, they had attempted to use their clear title to access credit from a bank. Um, and in all cases, this was either for a mortgage to build a home or to obtain financing for substantial home improvements. And so all of these individuals who had, who had attempted to collateralize their properties, they were rural landowners, but none of them had applied for funding through any USDA program. So they had all gone to banks, okay? So of the seven people who had attempted to apply for loans with these clear titles, using those clear titles as collateral, five ran into problems. Okay, so next slide. All right. Can you advance it? Can you advance it? Oh, oh pretty good. Okay. Okay, yeah, all right, okay. So um, let's look at some of these problems, okay. Um, and I think the quote on this slide really epitomizes the problems of these five individuals, right? So this is a quote from a woman in her 50s with a good job, she had a government job, you know, that she'd had for many years. And she really described this nerve wracking experience trying to get a mortgage for a site built home in a rural area of South Carolina. She couldn't get a loan. And what uh, ended up happening is that the builder, who was also a woman, a white woman, she ended up getting the, I guess, a construction loan. And so the loan was in the, in the, in the, in the builder's name. And then there was another case um, in North Carolina, North Carolina fa a family, they had cleared their title and they had put it into an LLC and they were trying to use that title to build a home that would cost just under $500,000, say $486,000. But similar to the woman in the previous example, they were turned down by two major banks. Now, you know, when I say, you know, these banks, these are major banks that probably everybody in this room would be familiar with if you heard the name. You know, of course, I won't mention them. But so in the case of this North Carolina family, so after being approved by one bank, you know, the four, these, these applicants, um, they were told, you know, uh, they were initially uh, approved, but then they were told, well, the, this bank, we don't lend to LLCs, right? And then they go on to another bank. Initially, they were approved. Then the other bank told them, well, you need a credit score of 700 or 720 or more. So just a lot of details associated with this particular example. It's pretty long and winding. This is sort of a back and forth tale of these folks constantly coming back to these banks and asking questions because these are pretty savvy people. You know, these are college educated people who sort of know the ropes and, you know, they knew how to articulate their situation. And finally, with this particular example, um, one, I guess the family spokesperson, he actually had a conversation with the bank president. And even ha after having that conversation, things didn't go anywhere, right? 
Um, go on to the fifth slide. Okay. And so I think the reluctance of some of our respondents to assume debt, it suggests that title clearance may be a necessary but a not a sufficient factor in terms of wealth generation. Of course, there are a lot of limitations to what we've done so far. This is uh, a purpose, purpose sampling, qualitative sampling is not random, uh, a random methodology so, to select uh, these folks, and it's very small sample size. But um, still, and we can't generalize beyond um, our sample, the folks that we spoke with. So to get a better idea, let's call it a more objective sort of take on uh, people's attitudes about credit access. So we are we have the opportunity again to uh, collaborate with the Center for Air Property Preservation, and we can get uh, I guess data for about 360 properties that they've cleared title for, right? And so these clearances, they date back to about 2005 or 2006. And so um, with access to uh, these records, at the most basic level, what this will allow us to do is to actually count the number of people, count the number of both, count the number of both voluntary liens, that is mortgages or loans and involuntary liens for property with clear title. And we may also be able to, to, to do some modeling with that data. So, so you can advance. So coming out of the analysis that we've done so far, we'd like to suggest some, what I think are pretty practical takeaways. So one very clear finding is the need to provide financial literacy for those folks clearing title, as has been mentioned, I think, throughout um, this meeting, right? And so another suggestion relates to credit scoring metrics. So although most of the folks that we talked to really shied away from pledging their property to secure a loan, you know, some people wanted to do that. And so with a larger sample, we might actually find that there's even more interest in doing that. But of course, just because somebody wants to access credit doesn't mean that they uh, can access that credit. Because as we know, African-Americans also tend to have lower credit scores or ratings, higher debt to income ratios, less job insecurity, and so on and so on. All these factors that det would detract from uh, their ability to uh, access credit. So in terms of heirs, property owners who've cleared title, so even after title clearance, some of these constraints remain and they loom pretty large, right? And so as things currently stand, title clearance can't rectify these additional issues. But then, so uh, what if clearance, title clearance could somehow be reflected in credit scores, right? And credit scores. So uh, if property owners who clear title are able to have that effort reflected in their credit score as a factor that could raise their credit score, that should enhance that individual's credit worthiness, other factors equal, okay? So uh, again, uh, title clearance has no bearing on credit scores, it is easily determined by weighted factors like payment history, amount of debt owed, and length of credit history, and so on and so on. But um, there are increasing calls for credit scoring models to incorporate a range of reasonable factors that demonstrate financially prudent or other socially responsible behaviors. And certainly title clearance is, um, these activities certainly demonstrate those kinds of behaviors. Um, I have actually spoken with uh, Pamela Fui, who is a bankruptcy and consumer law prof at Cardoza School of Law at Yeshiva University. And um, she verified that credit scoring models can include a wide range of criteria and that it would not be too far-fetched to somehow incorporate title clearing to capture that in, co in calculations of um, alternative credit scoring. Thank you. So, Linda, FSA, what, what turns you to this? What brought you to the heirs' property area? Oh, thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of work, um, and it kind of started really with the 2014 Farm Bill. I want to just mention some of the programs that we have. 
Um, 2014, the highly fractionated land program um, loan program, which is very similar to the heirs property program Dr. Goldman mentioned yesterday, um, was enacted. And then fast forward, the 2018 Farm Bill um, established the heirs property program. So um, the farm loans um, team at FSA has been working hard to get that program up and running. I think we've heard from folks. Um, we have uh, three intermediary lenders right now. I don't, I'm looking to see if she's in the room. One of them is here. Oh, there she is. <laughs> Shared Capital, as well as Akabatan and um, Cherokee Nation. So um, there's a lot of challenges with getting that program set up. Obviously there's geographical different laws in different states, um, different focuses that areas have and other things that, um, that, that we're working through, um, through various uh, ways. One is through some cooperative agreements. We've heard from All Corn today um, in the policy center to do training and education, and then creating that pipeline to help um, get to those clear later, clear title places that you were just talking about. So, um, and there's so many other people like in this room and and around the country that are doing such great work on this. Um, so that's one. That's kind of one place. Um, another place I should mention around loans is um, access to credit is is always a challenge. Um, of course, I'm talking from the context of farmers and ranchers who are running businesses with their farms. And so access to capital is critical for them to grow um, their businesses. So um, in addition to those programs, the Farm Service Agency has, um, uh, well, you can go get a loan at a bank. And sometimes that's hard, especially if you're from an underserved community. There's also guaranteed loans where the federal government will guarantee with banks. Um, so um, maybe a little bit riskier loans will be approved. And then also the Farm Service Agency does direct loans um, with um, participants that maybe can't get credit elsewhere. So that is an important piece um, because there, there can be some assistance there, even if there isn't an intermediary lender in your area to try to help with some of the other aspects of farming. Another challenge where there's property is getting a farm number because getting a farm number, you need to have, um, you know, some sort of control of the land. Um, a lot of the programs across USDA, not just in FSA, but um, in other programs, you need to have that. So there's been some things to do to clear up and offer oppor other opportunities to prove that availability. So that those are some um, some things that have been done so far. I also want to talk about something that I'm really passionate and excited about. As you look at federal policy, um, Congress has a really hard job because they're having to try to make rules and um, do things to try to cover as many people as possible. And so while doing that, um, sometimes our policy is very broad and it doesn't necessarily touch each community the way that it needs to. So we have grants and cooperative agreements that we're working through to try to help communities support the work that they're trying to do, whether it's trying to um, expand urban agriculture in urban areas. We have some pilots that were authorized in the 2018 Farm Bill, and we've been doing some capacity building with cooperative agreements there, whether it's programs like the Increasing Land Market and Capital Access Program, where we're working with organizations to um, do all, to solve the problems themselves, to, to, to identify opportunities that they can solve some of those problems for land access themselves. And that that's around, um, that could be around revolving loan funds, that could be around subawards to help with down payment assistance, technical assistance, education, outreach, easements, and other things that, that, that can be done. So these are, we're breaking new ground. And I, I, I can't sit here and talk about loans and improvements and access to capital without mentioning our administrator, Zach Ducheneau, who has done a tremendous amount of work to really um, improve access to capital and continues to do that work. And, and that's been a huge commitment to him. As it relates to heirs property, we continue to work through the challenges. It's such an honor to be in this room full of people that are so, um, committed and passionate and care about this work in, in such a deep way. So um, 
with that, I will, I see my little tag there. Um, I, I will stop, but I do wanna say that um, um, I started my job with a farm service agency. Um, when I went to school, I wanted to, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer actually. <laughs> Um, and actually a dream was to go to Boston, to, to come here, but I didn't do that. I got my paralegal degree. It was in the late, late eighties, early nineties. And I was working with a law firm that was doing public defender, um, conflict of interest work. And I realized I wanted to do advocacy and who would think that advocacy work would be the federal government. But I will tell you that the federal government is full of advocates that really care about the issues that we're working on. And it's an honor to work alongside all these experts that are doing this. And one more thing I'm gonna just add, we had talked about earlier today, the pieces around um, um, uh, estate planning and requirements, whether there should be requirements or not for estate planning and things like that. I do wanna mention on the heirs property program that the CDFIs, um, do work to have succession planning as part of the plan for that. But for our other programs, we do not require that. So I just wanted to kind of steal that conversation because it has come up a couple of times. Thank you. And I do want to do a quick plug with the FSA. Uh, we are celebrating our 30th anniversary with our socially disadvantaged farmer and rancher technical assistance project project. And we have two numbers, 15 and 27. That is for the past 15 years, we have helped farmers, socially disadvantaged farmers in the Black Belt, $27 million in loans, and most of them coming from FSA. So we appreciate your work. And Sarah's gonna do a quick blurb on ethics. One thing that I can't get off the stage without talking about really as quickly and briefly as possible, um, but thoroughly. Uh, so it came up in the first panel today, for those of you who online were still online at that time, and those of you who were in the room, that a lot of the work of, of intervention in heirs' property is understanding what are the ethics of what I'm doing? What are the ethics around it? how can I avoid making the folks that I'm trying to maybe help more vulnerable? And in that listening posture that I sit in, in, in at the Atlanta Fed, our participation in what was known as the steering committee for heirs property and is now also become Sarah 49 um, was in over the last three years, this increased understanding of what heirs property is, this mushrooming of interest and desire to address the issue. And this, along with that influx of funding and new players in the room. And, and with that came a lot of, a, let me just say a lack of context. I would, I, I think a lot of folks I heard on these calls and in conversations, we're getting concerning emails and questions asking for, probably with really great intentions, asking for information or proposing projects that really weren't necessarily informed by the deep work that those folks have been doing for years and the understanding of unintended consequences around this issue. Um, questions of cultural sensitivity, questions of dot maps showing where heirs' property is and how that might put a target on somebody's back. Um, maybe questions around the focus on quantification without a, an understanding of qualification, understanding of quality around, around what this all means. And so out of those conversations, we formed a project um, and we are in the research phase of that project to look at the ethics issues around heirs' property. We're focusing on three stakeholder groups, three intervention groups. One is researchers. So anyone who's doing heirs' property research, whether you are academically affiliated or not. Um, 
The second is legal practitioners, folks that are doing those interventions, the wills clinics, the title clearing, whatever your legal solution is, that, that's you, you are, we want to hear from you, particularly if you've been doing it for a while and you've got some hard earned lessons. And third are the outreach and ex extension specialists, the people who are in the neighborhoods, in the communities, who are doing educational programming, doing deep listening, and who have been doing that and understand that dimension of the work. And so we will be conducting focus groups and we will be recruiting you to our focus groups. So if you are interested in joining this study, we have a little QR code. We've got a lot of these. Um, and by we, I should mention, this includes folks at the Southern Rural Development Center, so John, um, and uh, folks at Auburn University, which is Ryan Thompson and Portia Johnson, and then I, and then the Alcorn State Policy Center, um, and Kara Woods is here, Dr. Kara Woods, who spoke on this very topic earlier. So I just wanted to mention that because I promised my team that I would plug that in this panel. And I think it's just an incredible, incredibly important topic. And it's one of the places that I see the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta having an important supporting role in. Thank you. So we have a few minutes for some questions. I would like to remind everyone to please say your name and where you're coming from. And please keep your question to under 30 seconds. Hi, JC Fisher, Alabama attorney. Um, I'm, first of all, Dr. Johnson Gaither, thank you so much for the study. Really needed to know that for, for our work. Um, but I have a question about, about the relending program. We know that it hasn't rolled out for, for the black farmers, but we hear rumors that it has rolled out for indigenous landowners. We don't know if that's true. So two part question. Number one, is it true that, that indigenous landowners are receiving funds through the heirs property relending program? And number two, what is FSA doing to help break down those hurdles and barriers to getting the relending progr program going and implemented for people that are applying and that need the money like yesterday? I was about to talk without my mic. Um, so, so the answer to your question is two of the intermediary lenders are um, doing loans in Indian country. And one is doing loans um, more broadly. We are working we, um, with the Federation to help identify additional CDFIs um, that can help build capacity and um, make make things uh, you know make more available. And that you know there's some challenges to the program too that are being identified that that need to be looked at as well. You know, um, and a, as our friend was was talking about and. I, I think your question really lends to getting some minds together in a room to really kind of talk out some of those things and, and go from there. And we'd love to hear any feedback that, that you may have on that as well. And I should say that um, highly fractionated land and heirs property are very similar. You know, there's a lot of similarities in in what what got us into the place where we are for those two things too. So, I'll I'll add that. I'll, I'll add that. Uh, this is Kim Addy from the Atlanta Wealth Building Initiative. Um, I appreciate this conversation today, particularly around the conversation related to access to capital. And I, I, these conversations always remind me the importance of uh, grounding us in history, which is really important. And I've heard elements of that through the conversation, but it's never um, lost on me when we talk about the relationship between black people and capital and what it's wrought with, right? So when you think about uh, black folks that have literally been capital <laughs> um, for access to land um, and making that transition from being considered capital to overcoming policies that restrict capital um, is never like this straightforward thing. It's always going to be 
um, a difficult uphill battle. And it's, and it's just, unset it continues to be unsettling, even with clear titles, black folks' ability to access capital. So I'm curious, um, I've heard um, CDFIs mentioned, but has there been any um, partnerships around credit unions or MDIs around accessing capital? So I was just curious, I think Cassandra, is that? Um, in the middle, I was just curious. I, I heard traditional banks. I just didn't hear credit unions and, and those institutions that make it a little bit more easier for black folks to navigate access. To well, I didn't go into the specifics uh, with the folks, those kinds of specifics with most of the folks what we spoke with, but um, in the instance of the North Carolina family, after they were not able to get a loan from a bank, they did uh, revert to, or they turned to a, I think a state credit union that one of them or a couple of them were a member of. And there was another instance of actually, this, this was just off the charts. There's one person that we spoke with, that person, they were actually able to get, uh, to collateralize their heirs property, <laughs> you know, before title was cleared. I didn't even mention that. But in that case, that person also went to a non-traditional lender. So those are just two data points uh, in, in the work that we've done that suggests that these folks may be able to get uh, credit not from these big banks, but from some of these alternative sources. Um, and I just wanna say this too, of the folks that we talked to, so you have a range of people who have clear title. You have people who, I say they have a big, they have a big bowl already. And they already have some, they have the know-how, they have the savvy a little bit, and they have uh, assets otherwise. So after they've cleared title, they are in a position to pounce on programs, on um, programs maybe sponsored by the USDA or, or, or whatever to, say, make improvements for their property. But then you have other folks on the other end, and this was particularly the case in St. Louis when we talked to some folks. We talked to some folks in St. Louis who didn't even realize that property could be collateralized. And I just remember some very strong words by one woman who just said just very strongly that, you know, folks are always talking about building, black people building wealth, but there's nobody to tell me, to teach me how to build wealth. So we have time for one more question. Hi, thank you, Zoraida Fernandez. I'm just down the street in Brookline, Massachusetts. I have a question about um, thinking about ethics and um, thinking about people, once they maybe access the credit and have uh, the loan, what is the federal government doing to support the people in actually making those payments so that then they don't lose their home? Um, because people have, um, for example, you mentioned the colonias in South Texas. People in, are in very economically precarious situations. Um, and, you know, they're one emergency away from defaulting on a loan payment, or maybe the Federal Reserve raises interest rates and their, their loan rate goes up. So my question is, what is the federal government doing then to support people so that they can um, make those payments and keep access to the capital and and not end up you know unhoused basically well we got a shout out in that so i'll take the question um so for one i, I think i should just make sure everybody in the room understands we're not the federal government right we're a nonprofit bank and the like i'm not a federal employee but we are obviously affiliated with the federal government so um, we don't make fiscal policy, right? So we have no control over federal dollars that are designated through the legislative or the uh, executive branches of the federal government. Um, so I just wanted to clarify kind of like who we are so that um, it, you know, that's the place that I can speak from is the place that I occupy. Um, now, one thing that you said really resonates with me, which is that a loan product is not always the right product for everyone. And your mention of ethics, I think that what that with the way that that resonates for me is what I'm hoping is that as we do this ethics research, for instance, 
um, the, the, there's the people that will be getting the knowledge from, and then there's the people that we hope will take that knowledge and, and, and learn from it. And so right now we don't necessarily have policy makers as a group of people that we are doing focus groups and receiving knowledge from, but I do think that they're a target audience for the gathered knowledge and maybe a deeper understanding of how to think about policy formation in a around heirs property in a way that has a more complex and comprehensive understanding of the, the, the individual or the family or the community that would be receiving that program, right? And, and that's hard to do, right? And so hopefully this research could bring some nuance to that. Could, could I add to that? Um, just from the context of farmers and ranchers and what we do at the Farm Service Agency, um, when we have direct loans, we actually do loan servicing. So if someone's having, you know, maybe there were some medical expenses that came up or there was a drought or there was something that, that happened that somehow impacted the ability, we do, do loan, we do offer loan servicing and even sit down with other um, creditors to kind of determine priorities to make payments and things like that. So there is, there is, there is that that's kind of built into at least those programs. And also just a real quick, as a recipient of, of those loans, our specialists go out and they do things like credit repair and then working out a way that they can get either the ownership loan, the operating loan, equipment loan, livestock loan, you know, whatever kind of loan, so that when they get the loan, they're able to manage it. And so that's a very important program with OPPE. Well, thank you, I think I don't want to get in the way of your lunch. <laughs> Good afternoon. That was pretty good. Uh, so my name is Thomas Mitchell, Professor Mitchell. I'm at Boston College Law School, <laughs> as you know. So this has just been a tremendous conference uh, up to this point. I can't think of a conference I've been that I could say is comparable. You know, when I say a conference, when I'm looking through the, the program, you know, we have eight different conferences here in terms of the various topics. They could be conferences all by themselves. Um, and I've just um, just been stunned by the all-star cast of panelists and speakers. It's just been tremendous. So I wanna thank um, everybody again who's spoken up to this point and folks who will be speaking later this um, afternoon. I also feel like in some ways, this is like a family reunion um, of multi-generational in terms of my career. Uh, folks I met in the mid-90s, uh, you heard from Heather Way, Robert Zabawa, and, um, you know, it's been kind of a reconnection. I mean, one of, often what we have is, you know, in life there's opportunity costs, cost benefits. Um, so I used to spend a lot of time in my early career uh, traveling to places like the rural South and Appalachia multiple times and just met tremendous people in various places, spent times with them in their homes and diners, community centers, churches. But um, then my legislative work took off and it really crowded out space for me to do those, that type of travel and those kind of deep connections that I used to do. But it's great to see some of those uh, folks who I haven't seen in a long time or who I rarely see. But like a family reunion, there's been new generations of folks, folks I've gotten to know in the last you know, five or 10 years who are also off, uh, just awesome people. So I just kind of A, get that kind of vibe. The other thing that I, uh, I'd say is that based on this uh, notion of opportunity cost again, is um, you know, I used to spend a lot of time doing research or other types of research I wanted to do. I was actually in a master's program that I would have gotten some quantitative skills. And once again, some the way my career evolved, it crowded out that time. Um, but just to see the wealth of experience and research and scholarship, um, I realized I'm not essential, right? So if, if, if I can play more of a supporting role or a cheering role, um, that's, that's fine. Um, all right, so just uh, I want to just kind of give a, a little bit of a, a presentation here. I'm going to talk for about another 12 minutes. 
um, unless Nate tells me I can't, and then I'm going to override him and buy a couple of minutes, uh, and then we're going to go into a fireside chat or not, Nate. Um, all right, so just just kind of big picture. There's in terms of the uh, you know Black Americans, there's been tremendous loss um, in terms of property. So we know, and we've we've heard this right that at the uh, between the end of the Civil War in 1910, African Americans acquired at least 16 million acres of agricultural land. The most recent agricultural census shows that there's 4.3 million acres, at least as I read the ag census. I know we have all these USDA people and other ag folks who can feel free to correct me. Um, to the extent that you all were feeling energized and hopeful and happy, let me let me be a, put a damper on that. The, um, you know, when we look at the gaps between black and white home ownership, I mean, one of the shocking things that we should be, you know, distressed about and demoralized is that in with the most recent data in 2022, when we look at the black-white home ownership gap, where it stands at 28 percent, at least according to the most recent statistics I've looked at, and this is, you know, 50 years after. Congress enacted into law the Federal Fair Housing Act that was supposed to help create opportunities and narrow that gap. And you compare it to the black-white homeownership gap in 1960s, in the throes of Jim Crow, and that gap was 26%. So the gap has actually widened 50 years after the passage of the Federal Fair Housing Act. When I talk about the implications of this property loss, oftentimes we focus on the economic ramifications, and the economic ramifications have been severe. We just, you know, so some of my work on partition, but that's just one type of involuntary loss, at least, you know, I'm not talking about the extra legal, I'm talking about some of the legal mechanisms, foreclosure, tax sales, adverse possession, eminent domain. And in the aggregate, the, the, this type of involuntary loss represents trillions of dollars of generational loss that have been dissipated. There's also been negative effects in terms of uh, economic development, in terms of businesses and other types of economic development. And then oftentimes this loss, including through the Great Recession, there was collateral damage, not just to individuals who lost or families who lost their property, but the loss of their property had a knock-on negative effect to the remaining property owners in the area. Because okay, those are kind of economic, but I also want uh, to, to raise up and give adequate uh, you know, standing to the non-economic. So oftentimes there's been erasures of culture and history. Uh, this is rural and urban. At the picture at the top, this is a community right outside Charleston, South Carolina and Mount Pleasant that formerly enslaved people right at the end of the Civil War, um, you know, 200 families were able to get 10 acre plots. Um, and then you had back, I think this was in 2006, 2007, there was a, one of these 10 acre plots. The community was trying to acquire ownership of it to, you, to build a community center. They had had a couple that had burned down or uh, otherwise been destroyed. And you had a, a local real estate development company that outbid the community by $1. So the property, the court ordered it sold for $1,200,001, which outbid the community that bid 1,200,000, but no recognition of the kind of the history of the culture. A lot of the roots of my interest initially in that led to Ayers property really ironically is from my growing up in San Francisco. Um, so San Francisco is the city in the US that has had the largest decline in a black population of any major city in the last 50 years. 1970, 13.5% of the population in San Francisco African-American today, about 3%. And that 3% is disproportionately homeless and very poor. Um, but some of that I personally witnessed the through urban renewal and the displacement of African-Americans. I just, you know, I'm, I'm, I will say this, uh, that it, at the time I was growing up, if you ever, this is one particular neighborhood that's kind of well-known called the Fillmore District in San Francisco. And when I grew up, if you ever were reading the San Francisco Chronicle, the Examiner on TV, anytime they talked about the Fillmore District, the narrative was that it was crime ridden, you know, pimps, prostitutes, drugs. Fast forward to you know uh, uh, several decades, 
now that folks got pushed out, so the city now is marketing it as the like historic, historic jazz district. And what I didn't know was that in the 1940s and 1950s, there were more black owned jazz clubs in the Fillmore district than anywhere west of Harlem in New York. Um, and so now that folks have been pushed out, the city now is marketing for tourism, the rich, uh, you know, jazz district. So let me skip, you, you're gonna hear later on about some of the, these problems of tangled title that's often um, specifically used in the urban context, oftentimes talk about some of the problems of clear title. But once again, these have economic ramifications. Um, and these are three studies that, that I've looked at. We're talking, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars in terms of the economic impact of holding it with unclear title versus clear title. But also then some of these other effects in terms of health, safety, and crime impacts. We've heard, obviously, we had a panel on um, the kind of racial will-making gap. Um, this is just to kind of add to the study that you heard from our wonderful researchers at Boston College. This is a study that, um, that I became familiar with. I was asked to give a, a talk at Washington University in St. Louis about 10 years ago by an economist, Robert Pollack, and he worked with two other uh, economists. And this is the first time I saw data on the racial will-making gap. So when you look at the gap, it's, it's severe, right? So uh, in terms of there's a 40% overall gap, um, but as I, I think I mentioned last night, one thing I find particularly shocking is that the, not surprisingly, the will-making for every race and ethnicity is um, those with higher levels of in education make wills or estate plans at a higher rate, those with lower. So that's true across every racial gap. But when you look at the most educated African-Americans, those with at least a college degree, and their will-making gap is 32%. And then you compare that in this study, and I, let me say in this study, I should emphasize that, to the will-making gap for the lowest educated white Americans in the study was 57%. That's a 25% gap. Um, which, which just shows you how widespread the problem is in terms of the African-American community. Um, and then on the left, I just, in terms of uh, the, the risk of having people lose their property as heirs' property, you know, these are, you know, four particular factors of folks who are low income and wealth. We often talk about their property rich and cash poor. They lack access to affordable legal services. There are these low rates of will-making and estate planning. And then typically the property that, that African-Americans got initially was not prime real estate, whether we're talking in the rural context or the urban context, but all of a sudden the real estate values are rapidly appreciating, making it a target. When I began my, uh, my research and work in this area, the heirs' property was only understood to be a problem that impacted African-American families who owned land in the rural South. And even more specific that, it was always talked about as farmland. One of the things that's important to note is that heirs' property impacts families of many races and ethnicities, though it disproportionately impacts black and brown communities. And that fact has been vital in my legislative reform efforts, pointing that out. So we haven't talked a whole lot about, and we're only going to talk about this a little bit, maybe in the fireside chat, we'll follow up too about, you know, there's been a lot of reference to I was the principal drafter of this model state statute, the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. Let me just quickly tell you, it has a lot of bells and whistles, but I think of it as having three major protections. So protection number one is if you have somebody, whether they're a family member or an outsider who's bought a family member's fraction, fractional interest, and they go to court, file this legal action, and they seek the forced sale, the remaining uh, common owners or, um, have the right to buy out the fractional interest of the person who is seeking the forced sale. Second, the most state statutes across country, and this kind of goes back to the partition statutes from England, there's two major remedies. The court could either order it divided or sold. Most state statutes said that the physical division, we're actually talking rural properties, bigger properties, was the preferred remedy. 
But state court judges over the last 50 years basically undercut that and made the forced sale a preference. So the UPHPA says, no, we agree with the historical preference. It's a weak preference, so we're going to bolster it. So courts have to take into account a range of both economic and non-economic factors before they can order um, the property sold, including family heritage, including what would be the impact if somebody was forcibly removed from the land in terms of their quality of housing, like, um, and that has to be taken into account. Third, that if the court orders a forced sale, as opposed to all of the state procedures that used a forced sale mechanism that predictably led to what we call a forced sale value, which is you know a third to 50% below the fair market value, we've replaced that with a sales procedure um, that mimics a sale under uh, fair market value conditions. It's actually something that I was doing some international comparative research I found in Scotland and used that as the model. Uh, so where are we now in terms of the UPHPA? I, let's just see. I see you, Nate, in my peripheral vision. I'm ignoring you. All right. so. Kind of makes the point about it's more universal than it was initially understood. We have 21 states, the District of Columbia and the U.S. Virgin Islands that have been acted into law. We are on the cusp. I don't want to jinx that. Some may say we're doing well in Arizona and Michigan. And it's passed the House of Representatives in both states. In Arizona, it's it was assigned to two committees. It's already got a unanimous vote in one. So we're we're looking good, kind of on that front. Let me see if I get out of this. And anybody from New Jersey, we've failed, I think, two or three times in New Jersey, but our sponsor this year is the um, is a state senator who's now the majority whip, and so our chances just went up. Let's see. Okay, the pro okay, the slide is not advancing. I only have one or two slides left. I'm not sure why it's not advancing. Okay. So... So a lot of this you've heard at this conference, and, and this kind of comes back to the state of the field 25 years ago, right? Not much scholarship. Um, there was this groundbreaking report from the Emergency Land Fund that somebody already referenced. Um, little media attention and little interest among elected officials and policymakers. So just wanted to quickly summarize some of the developments here, but I've learned even in this conference about far more developments than I knew about. So just in terms of legislation, it's, it's part, part of some of our success in the UPHPA in the last few years is directly related to the 2018 Farm Bill. It has a specific provision that essentially says that if you're in a state, you are a farmer or rancher in a state that has heirs property, and it's a state that has enacted the UPHPA into law, you have increased access, essentially. Um, as a result of that, we got states that we never would have been able to get. Mississippi, Florida, Missouri, actually Illinois. And, but there's been these other legislative efforts. You might hear from Heather Way today about her just uh, incredibly important statute in Texas in terms of the homestead exemption. Um, and then we've had some other ones. We've had some appropriations in terms of the federal government, but at the local government, the city of Philadelphia has appropriated about seven and a half million, as I understand, to help folks uh, clear title. And you have in Washington, D.C., I think as a result of the mayor and some of the folks in the city council learning about heirs' property through the UPHPA, they allocated a million dollars to two legal service providers who are both in the room. Um, and then we've had this constellation of law schools who are doing great work. And then there's been these other kind of good developments. We've heard about SRDC, Southern Rural Development Corporation, and many other organizations. I'm gonna wrap up now before Nate uh, gets the, you know, pulls me off. So I think we're then gonna transition into a fireside chat that we're gonna do with our esteemed Dean, uh, Dean Odette Lenau, who joined us last year from Cornell. And we've been incredibly fortunate to have Dean Lenau uh, serving as the captain of our ship. So let me move it. The lovely fire we have too. <laughs> um, 
Thanks so much, Thomas, and thanks to all of you for coming. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. I had a chance to see the documentary that was shown last night at the showing in D.C. last year, and it was incredibly moving and informative for me. So uh, really lovely to be here with all of you. So it's such an important range of work you're doing, Thomas, and I think it is a demonstration of some of the ways in which you see very technical law that seems on first blush incredibly dry and quite dull, um, the deep impact it has on people's lives and at sort of a very personal level. So I want to actually get a little personal with you, um, if that's okay, with some of these questions to hear a bit more about some of your motivations and thinking about the work here. Um, so many vexing property matters disproportionately, but not exclusively, impact black and brown communities. And you've spoken a little bit about this, but I would be curious if you want to speak a little bit more about how you became interested in these broad issues, sort of as a young academic, as someone interested in public engagement early on. So I, oh, I was supposed to invite Kiva up. Is Kiva, are you in the room? Um, anyway, so Kiva Terry is a law professor at Howard, and then she had wanted to say something. What she, I'm sorry, Kiva, I'll just say it for you. She was like, I just wanted to remind the audience that Thomas is a graduate of Howard University School of Law. Okay. I am a proud graduate of Howard University School of Law. When I was in law school, I had a number of my professors who were trying to encourage me to be a law professor. Um, and I get it, you know, they saw some talent and oftentimes when people see that in a mentoring role, they want to replicate, have you replicate what they did. But I always knew I wanted to do like policy work, other work, and I, you know, I didn't see many of them doing that work. There weren't as many Kiva Terry's at Howard when I was a law student, right? So I had to be kind of convinced. So they, um, after a couple of years in a large law firm in DC, working 90 hours a week, um, they approached me again. They said, listen, there's this program at University of Wisconsin Law School. It's a pipeline program to try to encourage more people at Howard to become law professors. And the thing you had to do was write a five page research statement. And I kind of thought about what I'd done in practice. I did insurance coverage law. Um, and there was nothing passionate that I had about that. So I just said, you know, instead of doing what the typical person does of, of saying, well, what do I have an expertise in and carrying that further? I just kind of took a step back and I said, well, you know, what, what really, when I think about my life are things that animate me. And one was this displacement I saw growing up in San Francisco. Um, the other thing was when I went to college, I went to college in Western Massachusetts. My dad was born and raised in Newark. His dad died when I was like a junior in college. They were estranged, I think. I don't know if my dad saw his dad after he was 18. But my dad felt this obligation that somebody should go to the funeral. And he felt like hypocritical, like for him to go. So then he asked me to go. And so, you know, two things about that. And when I met my family in Newark, I mean, they're desperately poor, like totally different situation that I grew up in. So it was one of those, but for the grace of God, there go I moments. But the other thing is the family showed me these photo albums and some of them went down, went back to my grandfather growing up in America's Georgia, right near Plains, Georgia, as a sharecropper. Um, and I just wanted to learn more about my family's history in the, in the rural South and the African-American experience generally. So I Spent a lot of time at libraries, and I was trying to think, okay, what property issue could I come up with? And I just didn't see anything, but I found newspaper articles talking about heirs' property, typically in a county newspaper in the South. And I was like, that's unbelievable. I just, we didn't learn anything in law school about that, and that's something I'd like to pursue. That's so interesting. Um, so that was one of my questions also, was specifically heirs' property, because uh, like you, I was in law school a while ago, and I had not heard anything about this. It didn't come up in, in treatises and in law school case books. And, um, and so that's interesting that, that that came about. So you started doing this work more than 25 years ago. I wonder if you could describe a little how you saw the shifts over that period, right? And kind of the emergence of this idea, including your bringing it forward. What are the key changes that you've seen over that period of time? Yeah, so I think, you know, there was a small foundation when I started. I mentioned the emergency land fund. Um, not much legal scholarship. And I think that, um, you know, a couple things happened. I, I think that through the uh, my time as a master's student 
and the type of research I was doing, which um, part of it was doctrinal, but part of it was field research. Um, you know, perhaps my scholarship was a little bit more robust and elaborated than some of the scholarship that had preceded it. Um, but then, you know, something lucky happened, and this is why we had the panel on the media um, yesterday, was that these two reporters at the Associated Press were able to convince their bosses to do this study on black land loss. And um, that study was groundbreaking. It won awards. It got the attention of the American Bar Association. It had a direct impact on my career in that at the time I had been doing my research pre Torn from the Land, the AP. You know, I, I think, you know, property scholars found my work interesting, but it was niche, marginal backwater. Um, and when they were doing their research in the South and they stumbled upon this issue of heirs property, they said, well, who's the national legal expert? And they're like, oh, there's this first year law professor at Wisconsin. Okay, yes, I do work hard. Um, I'm, you know, moderately smart, but I think I was occupying the field because it was not seen as a field that had rich opportunities. Um, so I think the, the media, that first of all helped get, and that maybe took it to another level. Um, I think even when we drafted the Uniform Partition of Bearish Property Act, the received wisdom is it's gonna be dead on arrival. There's no way that any state's gonna pass this thing. And I think part of the legislative success we had ended up picking up steam and that contributed but then you had a number of other organizations that just, you know, from, you've heard some of the research, you've heard some of the community engagement, uh, you've heard some of the legal services. Um, it just started picking up momentum. Um, and um, yeah. That's great. So I wanna ask a little bit about some of your specific experiences with this legislative work. Um, about 430 people have served as the principal drafter a, of a uniform act for you for the uniform law commission so some of you may have already heard but this is a key way that legislation gets passed and then spread across states right um it's sort of a model law that then sometimes will get adopted or debated at the state level or possibly other levels as well of those 430 people you're just one of three african americans to serve in that role um, and one of about a half dozen people of color and I wonder if you'd be willing to share a little bit about that experience with us. Um, you know, some things maybe we could guess at. Is there anything that's surprising? I wonder if you'd be willing to talk a bit about that. Yeah, sure. So um, I was at the AP. I, the American Bar Association got interested specifically their real property trust and estate law section. They put together a task force called the Property Preservation Task Force and asked me to serve on it. And we had, you know, three different levels of um, projects that we envisioned. One was low hanging fruit, have the ABA sponsor some continuing legal education programs. They do that routinely. But the reason for the fences was to submit a proposal to the Uniform Law Commission asking them to form a drafting committee. Every year they get about 50 to 60 proposals. They accept three to five. And when I did the research of the history of the Uniform Law Commission at that point, I didn't see a single thing they did that was trying to advance social and racial justice. So in the year and a half we worked on our proposal, you know, we would meet every two months. It was before Zoom. It was like old school conference call. And then the meeting would start with some gallows humor, like, hey, when we finally submit this puppy, do you think we have a 3% chance or a 4% chance that they'll accept it? And the stars lined up, they accepted it. Uh, and then three months later, they called me and asked me to be the principal drafter. First meeting we have is in Chicago, and the ULC usually meets at very posh places, and so I was at some very posh place in Chicago. And it became obvious that they were not, you know, they didn't have a lot of faith necessarily in the in the project. Um, when I walked into a room, sometimes people <laughs> jaws dropped. Um, so I remember like, when I had to present the first draft of the um, of the U what became the UPHPA was in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and I walked into a room and one of the Uniform Law Commissioner staff, who was I think they were only African American staff member, you know, he was up at the front doing the recording, 
And I just happened to catch his eye and he literally almost fell out of his chair. Um, and I just said, you know, during the first coffee break, I'm going to ask him like, what was that all about? Um, and he said, he's like, I just couldn't believe when they announced that you were the, the principal drafter because I think you're the first. Um, so I actually had to do some research and then it turned out I was like the second. I mean, one of the things that, that to my advantage is I think that the Uniform Law Commission in terms of the commissioners is not the necessarily the most diverse organization. Um, and, you know, I think I was able to um, kind of bring a range of life experiences to that organization. I involved a lot of the um, organizations that advocate for rich property owners to the table to kind of share their experience because they had more practical experience about this law than anybody else. So I think that that was just in terms of my approach was um, trying to be as inclusive as possible, trying to bring people who are impacted, hear their voices, and then trying to translate that into the law. Any other surprises we'd be? <laughs> You know, there's some I could share and there's some I can't share. Can so, <laughs> you know, um, I, I would say at the enactment phase, um, yeah. you know, so we, we've had we've had really good success, but we've had battles. And so let me let me just quickly try to share, you know, three with you. Um, we got the UPHPA passed in Hawaii in 2016 with an effective date of January 1st, 2017. Very large landowner on the island of Kauai. Um, before January 1st, um, he has this huge estate and he had 11 like native Hawaiian families who own property within the interior borders and he no longer wanted them on his property. So he bought out some family members, initiates 11 um, partition actions seeking the for sale of this property on and files these cases on December 30th, 2016, two days before our act is going to become, um, you know, effective. If I had been his real estate attorney, he'd ask me, am I going to do better under the old law or the new law in terms of forcing these folks off? I'm like, under the old law. If I had been his PR person, I was like, don't touch this. Mm -hmm. Turns out that that large landowner is a guy named uh, Mark Zuckerberg. Um, and the media blowback, uh, there was a headline that said Zuckerberg is trying to prevent these families from seeking the protection of this new statute. Mm -hmm. um, then in Florida, Florida, I would say, was one of the states I'd describe our uh, legislative advocacy as a knife fight. Mm. Uh, you had the largest section of the Florida bar, the real property probate and trust law section, was doing everything they could to kill our chances. Uh, we're shocked that we got an introduction. They had come up with a whole strategy about how to undermine and kill us again. Um, you know, but we just put together this amazing coalition of environmentalists, uh, organizations that represent air, air's property owners, um, and we were able to prevail there. But South Carolina has a special place. So South Carolina, um, we got a bill introduced um, in 2015-ish. Um, I went out to testify in the South Carolina House of Representatives. We got a unanimous vote. So as I'm leaving Columbia, one of the state representatives says, oh, you're good. When you get a vote like this out of the committee, you're good to go, at, at least in terms of the House. So, you know, I had one thing I wanted to do before Columbia, the Confederate flag was still hanging at the state capitol. I was like, well, I got to get a picture of that. Um, and I think I'm good to go. And I'm, I'm always thinking that we're going to be in the Senate. And then I'm at a conference at the University of Georgia in Athens about uh, six days later, and I get a call that, unfortunately, there's a real estate developer who's close to the... Uh, some of the leadership in the house and they're putting a permanent hold on your bill. Um, and there's like, well, too bad. Like it would have done a lot of good, but I'm like, well, when's the legislative session ending? They said 10 days. And I just started throwing hail in every pass. I called up everybody I knew um, and was getting one no after another. I called the president of the bar. Um, and then at the last minute, I was actually in a car wash in Madison, I remember. Um, I thought, well, what the state bar associations, they have a board of directors. So maybe that's another group of people I can call. So I said, let me start with the chair. And I called the chair and he said, oh, I'm an adjunct law professor at the University of South Carolina. I know all about heirs property and I'm very sympathetic, but what we need to do is find a, you know, a powerful real estate attorney in South Carolina who could speak to the leadership in the house. Um, and he said, Nick, Give me two days. Uh, he found somebody. There was a Saturday meeting. They released the hold. 
And so now we got five days left. And so every day I'm monitoring it and Monday goes nothing, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, nothing. I'm calling people I know in South Carolina. And at 15 minutes before the end of the legislative session, our bill passes. We go to the Senate, Next, same thing in the Senate. Everything's going well until it's not. I get this call. They said, there's these two you know, very conservative senators who have raised concerns about your bill. Um, one seems amenable to getting some evidence from you that his concerns can be addressed. I address those concerns. The remaining one was a guy um, um, named, um, uh, what was his name? Uh, So I'm sorry, who, anybody in the room here? I, I literally just had a brain, like the right-wing senator from South Carolina, uh, yes, Thurmond. Thurmond. Yeah, it's horrible. So the state senator is Paul Thurmond, the son of Strom, and he's hell-bent on killing our bill. And I'll, I'll end, the story's a little poignant, so we're trying to figure out what are we going to do about Paul Thurmond. And it turns out that there had been this tragedy in South Carolina in 2016, this mass murder at Mother Emanuel Church. Um, and the state senator, who was also the pastor for that church, was a guy named Clemente C. Pinckney. And so at the last minute, we ended up renaming the statue. So everywhere else, it's called the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. In South Carolina, we rename it to be the Clemente C. Pinckney Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Act. And the message was, this will be the only bill that will be honoring your murdered colleague. And so the folks who are on the fence, you need to make a decision. Are you gonna go with Paul Thurmond? Or are you gonna honor your former colleague? And at the end of the day, Paul Thurmond was the only one to vote against it. Right, well, this is a good segue into my next question. So you've been doing this legislative and policy work now for many years um, and as that, anecdote shows it can be incredibly hard and take a lot of stamina and creativity and uh, just tenacity and i wonder how you started doing this type of work and then what has kept you going what, why have you kept at it yeah so i think i think it went back to when i said i had these professors at howard who were like you should just be a law professor one of the jobs i had before i went to law school was i was initially a legislative aide and then a legislative director on Capitol Hill for a congressman from rural Texas. And so, you know, working on the Hill, it reinforced that I really did enjoy policy work and thinking about systemic change. I didn't particularly, there were aspects of working on Capitol Hill I didn't like. So I always tell people I saw the good, the bad, and the ugly, and a whole lot of ugly. So my message was I didn't really want to work in the belly of the beast, but I wanted to do things that were systemic change. And I saw legislation and legislative change, legal reform as being systemic, because before the Uniform Partition Act, there were a lot of efforts to try to, in a moment of the 11th hour, people were about to lose their land or their homes, scurrying to try to find some lawyer. But... The way I looked at it, the decks were stacked against people in terms of what the law was. So even if you could get a lawyer trying to operate within the confines of the old partition law was dooming most people to lose their property. So I think it was that idea of doing systemic. I think for me, in, in terms of, you know, most people who are law professors and about, I'd say about 80 percent of the people who get appointed to be the principal drafter for a uniform act are law professors. Almost all of them see their job as purely drafting the act and then leaving it to others to try to get it enacted into law. I kind of knew in my case that um, that if I did the traditional, that almost nothing was going to happen afterwards. Um, the Uniform Law Commission had been lukewarm. They, they still thought it was going to be a failure because the, the received wisdom at that time is the people most impacted fundamentally lack political and economic power. The whole explanation is structural. That may be unjust, but it ain't gonna change. Um, and so I knew that they needed to think about this differently. I knew that they didn't have contacts in a lot of these states, but through other work I had done, including 
building a summer externship program that placed law students in many of these organizations that I had done. One was at Wisconsin with Robert. You know, we jointly wrote a grant, a USDA grant, uh, establishing the Center for Community Land and Security at Tuskegee. I just kind of knew some people. And so, you know, for me, it was like if I was really committed to changing the law, right, as opposed to adding a line on my CV saying I was the principal drafter, I was going to have to stay engaged. Um, and so I just, I felt, you know, at the end of the day that uh, I am trying to promote social and racial justice and systemic change. And that just meant that I had to stay in the battle, right? And I think as time has gone by, I've developed expertise mm -hmm. that, you know, I'm, I'm probably better at advocating for the act today than I was, you know, 10 years ago. So um, I think that's why I've stayed in the game that long. One of the things that I think is so notable uh, about the map that you showed earlier, about where this has been adopted, where it's been um, you know, presented to the legislature, is that it's a mix of red and blue states. And especially given the link to issues of racial and social economic justice, which are not the favorite topic in some of these states, I wonder why you think there's been bipartisan support? How has that been built, sustained? How stable is it? Yeah, so I, so I think the first, um, there was actually a moment of crisis during the drafting of the Uniform Law Commission. And it was that Santa Fe meeting that I referred. So after you are, when you're drafting a uniform act for the Uniform Law Commission, you have to present your first draft um, at their annual meeting, which is always in July, but in a different, different places. And they literally read it like word for word. You're up there for hours. And so up until the evening before that I was gonna present, the focus was on racial justice. It was on, black landowners, and that had been from my research, from my field research, from um, a lot of the networks I had developed. So I'm about to walk into the very lovely dinner, and I always forget what state he was from and what name, but one of these, there's 350 of these people called Uniform Law Commissioners. Every state gets a certain allocation, and they're all appointed by governors. Um, so they're connected people. So one of these uniform law commissioners sees me and he pulls me aside before I walk into the dinner. He said, you know, there's a real problem with your act. And I'm like, please tell me, like, what, what's the problem? He said, it's being generally referred to as the black act that's being drafted by the black principal drafter. In other words, it's being marginalized and it's in real trouble. So I canceled my plans to go to the dinner. I went back to my hotel room, ordered you know, room service and was up till five or six in the morning. And the whole evening, I'm thinking, I've got to reframe this thing if it's going to survive. And I remembered, you know, in various like trips or interactions I had had, I had meetings with folks who said, oh, this is a problem in Appalachia. And I remember that from a, a, a placement at this summer program I used to run in eastern Kentucky. And I remembered somebody said, I think it's a problem like in the Colonias, you know, and the Texas-Mexico uh, border. And then there was a random former dean at the University of Connecticut who was a law professor who had reached out to me at some point and had told me that his wife's family owned 350 acres of heirs property in Maine. And so over the course of the early mornings of that hour, I stitched together a narrative that this was an issue that impact families of many races and ethnicities. Um, and I gave examples from impacting Latinos and uh, poor whites in Appalachia and even upwardly mobile whites, right? And then I presented it the next day and I think that helped it survive. Now, that was the strategic of just keep the project alive. But what I then found out that, you know, the lawyer side of me who was advocating, um, maybe with some very scant evidence, that it turns out that that actually was the case, um, that this was a form of ownership that actually did impact. So it had a much wider uh, scope than I realized. And then we were able to realize that in different states across the country, their point of entry of interest was different. Um, I would say that maybe in more conservative states, 
the framing this is about protecting private property rights and real estate wealth had particular resonance. Um, and I'll just share it because I got a number of my friends from Texas here. So I was testifying in the Texas legislature. The, uh, so when, the, when you get called to testify at a legislative hearing, they just tell you what time the hearing starts, but they don't tell you when your bill's gonna uh, be called up. So the hearing could go on for like three hours or four hours. So you just got to get there at the beginning. So it just happened that the bill before my bill came up was a bill to address some consumer protection. The lawyer who was advocating for the bill was like incredibly intelligent and dynamic and had a lot of passion. But there were three or four members of the Texas House Judiciary Committee that just didn't want to hear it and just came after her in the most nasty way. And I'm sitting there thinking, OK, um, I'm up next. I said, remind yourself, at this point, we have gotten passage in Georgia, Alabama, and South Carolina. Just keep telling yourself that. Um, and we're going to go with plan A. And plan A is we're going to highlight that we're going to universalize it. We're going to highlight that this protects private property rights and family real estate wealth. And I'm going to see what happens, right? So, you know, you're up there, you got the whole panel, but I'm focused on, I'll just tell you my shorthand for these. I called them the three Neanderthals. And so I'm trying to look, but I'm, I'm really trying to look at them. And I think after the first time I mentioned this affects ranchers and, you know, folks in cities and private property rights, they start nodding along. And I'm like, I got them. Um, you know, now that was good because plan B was if they started coming after me, the way they came after the consumer protection attorney, I was going to go out in a blaze of glory. Uh, but, but we didn't have to do that. So I think that's, that's generally. But then I said there are, there are some unique things in different states. So, um, you know, I'll say Iowa and Missouri. The issue there was the preservation of family farms. Um, and so we, we ended up in Missouri that ended up being the second state that we changed the name of the act. So in Missouri, it's literally called the Save the Family Farm Act. But the rest of the thing is word for word, <laughs> our statute, right? So what I learned was the importance of messaging. Um, I mean, I'll just uh, kind of end on this. I, I had a string of very conservative states where we had successes, and I had gotten used to my usual, you know, routine that I just described, universalized private property rights, you know, family real estate wealth. And then we got interest in California. So I'm talking to the legislative office of the chief sponsor of our bill there. And I start talking about, oh, you know, I got this down. So what we're gonna do is emphasize, and the legislative director says, um, hey, uh, Professor Mitchell, um, you're not in Mississippi. Um, you're not in <laughs> I mean, that's a cute message, but that's not the message that we want to lead with, you know, uh, say, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> We're in California. So, I mean, that's the, one of the things that I've just learned, the, the, this importance of in terms of packaging and messaging and, and being very kind of nimble and flexible. So, so many of the skills we're hoping to teach our young advocates in law schools as well. Um, I am curious if you could share at a general level, some of the highlights of the work, you know, over the course of the years, what have been the you know, experiences that really have stood out to you in doing the work? Yeah, so the, yeah, I think, as I said at the beginning, I, you know, when I, with my initial scholarship, the, the feedback I got from, from like a lot of law professors is your work's really interesting because it was very interdisciplinary, which is not always the norm in legal scholarship. But my first article, um, which some folks think is the seminal article, you know, I sketched out four or five ideas for legal reform or policy solutions. And, you know, at that stage, the universal reaction was, yeah, stick to the scholarship because this legal reform is never going to happen. You're wasting your time. All right. And I remember, you know, gently pushing back and said, you know, thank you for sharing. I could tell you're genuinely concerned about my career. Some people thought, you know, if I keep engaging in this kind of work, I wouldn't get tenure. Um, but I said, you know, I'm going to pursue my own vision. Um, and, you know, if there's not somebody advocating for this, then it will be a self-fulfilling prophecy. 
that nothing will change, right? But even back then, I remember saying, but I will concede there will be a constellation of states that we would be lucky to get this law reformed 200 years from now. And Mississippi was always my exhibit A. I was like, I'll give you Mississippi. Uh, and the fact that Mississippi passed it a few years ago, I'm st I, st I still wake up some days stunned, um, as I'm sure you know, Andrea Barnes from Mississippi. I mean, I don't know like, if you're equally surprised. Um, so, so some of that is is you know some of that, right? Um, some of that is um, some of the people I've gotten to meet. So, you know, I genuinely feel like. Um, so blessed to have met some of the real pioneers and trailblazers. I got to know Shirley Sherrod, who you saw in the film last night in the late 90s. Um, I mean, just incredible people, right? Um, who I deeply value and I kind of miss given how my career has evolved. But, you know, then I've had other things happen, which if you had told me at the beginning that, oh, you'll be asked to testify in Congress. I'm like, yeah, I don't think so. Um, and that's happened. Um, we have Sarah Stein from the Federal Reserve Bank, and she referred to Ann Carpenter. So back in, I think it was late 2016, um, I don't know Ann, I get this email from the Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta. They said, we're going to have this um, day-long conference on Ayers property. We want you to be the keynote speaker. And I'm like, at that time, I'm just thinking the Federal Reserve Bank is money. Uh, like my conception of what they were. I was like, why the hell would the Federal Reserve Bank want? And I didn't realize that this whole kind of community development. And I'll mention one last thing. I mean, there's like a lot. Um, so I got a call even just a few weeks ago. Um, there had been this, I and mean, some of you guys are in the room. There there have been hundreds of families who have written me because I've gotten a lot of media attention. and have asked me if I could be your lawyer or I could refer you. And, and I had to share with these families that I kind of got a full-time job and some, and I don't really have the bandwidth. Um, but there's this one person who started like messaging me on LinkedIn about six, seven years ago. And it was always very complimentary. Sometimes he asked for help and I, you know, probably ignored 75% of his messages because I'm just overwhelmed. And, you know, I had two word responses to the others, like, thank you when he said something nice about my work. I thought when I saw his LinkedIn profile, I, I thought it said like former NFL player. Um, I was like, well, that's interesting. I'm kind of imagining this guy in his 60s who, you know, maybe his family had lost some land and he's now retired and got some free time and this is a hobby of his. But he write, writes me three times a year. And so his last time he wrote me was about three months ago. And he said, Professor Mitchell, you know, I've heard awesome things about your article. And I'm like, what article is he referencing? So I message so I first I'll say okay now there's this retired NFL player in the 60s now he's reading legal scholarship I think like, this is like kind of unusual so I google him and it turns out no he's not a former NFL player he's a current NFL player he's a 10-year veteran now he's a offensive lineman now for the Arizona Cardinals and let me just tell you so his name's Kelvin Beecham He's from rural Texas, graduated from SMU, both got his BA and his master's, was voted graduation speaker. Um, and then he's been nominated for the NFL, so Walter Payton Man of the Year Award in the NFL twice. I'm like, that's their top award for a player, both for their on-field and their community service. I'm like, well, what has he done, right? So I start reading. So first of all, he's, in addition to his NFL job, He's bought farmland, so he's got a small farm. He's gotten into private equity, but he has this foundation that does like five different things, a nonprofit. So one, he does what typical, you know, those athletes who want to do community service, they'll like run a summer camp for disadvantaged youth. So he does do that back in rural Texas. He apparently is incredibly proficient with technology. So he started a STEM program for disadvantaged youth, trying to encourage them to do that. And then I just got tired about, I couldn't like read the other three things he did. But anyway, he, he gives me a call about a month ago and he says, hey, uh, Professor Mitchell, I have convinced the NFL films that their headquarters is in Mount Laurel, New Jersey to sponsor a screening of Gaining Ground. And then I want to do a fireside chat with you afterwards. 
Oh, and by the way, there'll be a number of NFL players and, for, and retired players. And then there will be the, these people like Commissioner Roger Goodell and the leadership of the NFL um, is gonna be at your event. And if you told me, you know, 20 years ago, right, that a local legislature would ask me to testify, I was like, you know, I have a lot of confidence. I have a good self-image, but I'm not even sure that's possible. So these things seem kind of surreal. Well, I'm still waiting for NFL players to ask me for my article, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure any day now. I write on, I write on a, a sovereign debt and international financial issues. So yeah, I know you know about forward. Travis Kelsey. Well, I do. It would be good to learn a few more of the players. Uh. <laughs> Through my daughter. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I have been thinking, though, about the place of legal education um, in, in all of this, right? And, of course, we're training the next generation of students, hopefully to be conversant and knowledgeable about these range of issues, but also trying to serve through our support of programs such as this. And I was wondering if you could speak about why Boston College Law School felt like the right fit for you um, for something like this initiative. Of course, I love being unique in this space, but I also think it's important for other schools to follow this type of example. And, and I'd love to hear more about, um, about why that felt right and how uh, this, initiative that you're you're grounding here on land housing and property rights can be transformational in this space so sort of expand that range of service beyond where we are right now yeah so i think just my backstory of how i ended up as a law professor is instructive i didn't come out of the wound wanting to be a professor i wanted to have an impact i resisted multiple attempts from my law professors because i thought it was purely ivory tower so I'm, I'm happy that they pushed me to do this incredible pipeline program at University of Wisconsin Law School called the Hasty Fellowship. But one of the good things about at that time, you know, I made a very, um, I was very intentional about my work, very intentional about what my vision was. And I was really primarily driven that I wanted to have an impact on promoting social and racial justice. I wasn't necessarily trying to be a superstar in legal education. Um, so I, with that kind of criteria and vision, you know, I kind of sketched out some things that if you're gonna have a transformation that you would need, you couldn't just rely on one person, you needed to have a cadre of people. So then training law students was key to that. Um, and so I early on developed like this summer externship program where there was no incentives as a tenure track professor to be trying to build programs of that. And we built it out to, I mean, I think it, it ran its course over seven years, but we got 140 law students from 32 different law schools um, involved. Parts of Wisconsin was not helping me finance or fund the program. So I was getting outside grants and didn't feel like I had to limit it to Wisconsin students. Um, but, you know, that was kind of a piece. The research was important in terms of you know, and I just use Ayers property as an example, the state of the resource uh, research 25 years ago was just rudimentary. Um, it just wasn't a lot. And I knew that if there was ever gonna be students trained, they needed to learn about this and then the scholarship could inform the policy. So that was kind of important. Um, but then I knew that, you know, through my legislative experience that we needed people who had skills and developing policy proposals and legislative proposals in terms of that type of kind of systemic change. And then also just, and we've heard this in various of uh, on early other panels about the importance of, you know, community education, whether it's, um, you know, financial education, legal education, um, kind of, et cetera. So I think it did my different, prior to coming to Boston College, I kind of played in each one of those ponds I'd say at least half of my work was not considered part of my compensated job. So it was on top of my compensated job, meaning that for 25 years, I was chronically sleep deprived. Um, I just willing to <laughs> deprive myself of sleep. Um, and so what happens in 2020 is I, I did win the MacArthur Fellowship. 
not surprisingly, um, a number of law schools came knocking. At the time I'm at Texas A&M, they're ranked 60th. Most of the seven or eight schools that contact me were ranked between 18 and 33, with Michigan being, you know, the outlier at whatever they're ranked in the top 10. And it turned out that most of these schools, when they talked to me, they just assumed I was going to jump because they were ranked higher. And I think folks had learned that I, I'm not originally from the South, right? Um, and I said, you know, my way of leveraging the MacArthur is not just to go to a higher ranked school and work under conditions where my large part of my impact work is not considered part of my day job. <laughs> Um, and so we had very short conversations with those other schools. Boston College was the only school that reached out where some of the folks who reached out said they started with, we know the breadth of the work you do, and we'd like to engage you in a discussion of maybe coming here and supporting that work. So Boston College literally stood out, um, and I just decided that, I mean, it's not like I had 10 other schools <laughs> that were that coming with the same message, right? Um, and then I just looked at some of the, the values here and that as I learned, because actually I didn't know much about Boston College, and it became obvious on the visits here that that type of work would be supported here in a way that I had seen supported previously at the three other law schools I've been at. I know Nate says it's time up, but can I squeeze in one more question? We have a number of students and young academics, um, younger professionals that are here in person and on Zoom, and I wonder if you have any quick advice for them. Yeah, so what I always kind of say is that, you know, you want to do work that you have a passion for, that, um, and that, you know, this is something that an attorney at, uh, I met when I was in practice in D.C., and I think it was maybe when I was thinking about, should I leave and do this hasty fellowship? And, and the advice he gave me is that, you know, if you ask most kids who are four or five, six or seven about what their passion is, they have a passion. Now, maybe some of it's unrealistic. I want to be an NFL player. I want to be a fireman or whatever, but they have a passion. And then oftentimes in our profession, people decide to do something that's not consistent with their passion work, but it's with concerns about being viewed as being elite, making a lot of money. And his advice to me was, you know, if you have something you're passionate about, don't just keep delaying, because what's going to happen is, you know, you're going to say, yeah, I'll get to it. But then five years is going to pass and seven, and you're going to build, you're going to buy a home, you might get married, you're going to have all these other things that keep you in place. Um, and I did take that advice. And so I always tell folks, try to disabuse yourself from what is considered to be success, right? Especially we live in a capitalistic country and that's often tied to money and prestige and elitism um, and pursue that. So that's, that's one thing I, uh, I tell folks, right? Um, the other thing is try to make yourself useful. Usually in any organization, you're not starting at the top, you're starting at the bottom. But I've always sought out opportunities where I thought that I could learn a lot, but I could make a real contribution, right? And sometimes in some role that wasn't elevated, um, but I just kind of threw myself into the work. So I mentioned this summer externship program I started at Wisconsin. So I was doing that when I was doing my master's in law uh, degree, but there was this leading um, land policy center that had an international reputation at University of Wisconsin at the time called the Land Tenure Center. And and when I left DC, most of my friends in DC weren't lawyers, they worked in international development. And they said, oh, you ended up in the perfect place because that's where the land tenure center, I didn't even know what that meant, but I got the idea that I should go talk to them. And they had exclusively done work internationally for 25 years, but then they decided that maybe there's some land issues in the US. Right when I showed up, they got some grants in the Ford Foundation and the Kellogg Foundation. And I just showed up and was like, um, it seems that your work is relevant to what I'm interested in. There's very little legal academic stuff about the stuff I'm interested in. And I was like, can I help? And I just volunteered there and they were like, oh, we're trying to start this externship program. And I was like, I'll do that for you. Um, we want to have a conference on Native American land issues at one of the Native American re uh, reservations in Wisconsin, the Menominee. I was like, I'll do that. And I just kind of threw myself into it far exceeded what they thought some volunteer grad student was going to do. 
And then that led to opportunities. So I would just say that you're not going to start at the top. Find something that's consistent with your heart. Don't worry about the title and pour yourself into that work. Um, you'll do good work. And sometimes that work will get noticed. And then that will help you uh, move to the next level. Thank you so much, Thomas. And thanks to all of you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. We will go ahead and begin. Um, my name is Mavis Gragg, and I'll be the moderator of this wonderful panel. Um, I'd like to start off by sharing about this new organization of attorneys working on heirs property matters and then introduce our um, panelists. Um, so we are HAPPEN, H-P-P-N, which stands for the Heirs Property Practitioner Network. And we love to say lawyers make it happen. So if you see anyone with this tag, um, they're likely a member of the Happen Network, but I'd love for other members or all the members of the network to please raise your hand. Wonderful. <laughs> um, so our network was founded to address the unique challenges faced by heirs property owners and the attorneys who either represent them or engage in legal education and policy work in the field. Our mission is to build and sustain a healthy ecosystem of legal service providers who are committed to promoting justice and preserving generational wealth through their work either directly with heirs property owners as clients in support of those legal providers or in the work to change policy to better support heirs property owners. We began very simply, we began with monthly virtual meetings. We, um, in the fall of 2023, we held our first in-person convening, focusing on the well-being of attorneys as much as on the skills building and legal practices. So imagine 40 plus attorneys doing yoga and meditation before sitting down to learn some intense topics. Uh, today, four of us have come together to share with the broader community of scholars, advocates, program leaders, landowners, and other attorneys insight into our community in our work, our perspectives on sustaining and strengthening the ecosystem of legal services for heirs property matters. I think it's helpful to note that together, this panel represents the nonprofit and private legal services practices as well as legal technology. First, um, we have JC Fisher. JC is a senior associate attorney at Greg Varner and Associates, working on heirs property matters and a whole lot more in the state of Alabama. She has extensive experience with the UPHPA litigation and most notably took an 18 year old non-UPHPA partition action to the Alabama Supreme Court where she, well, she says miraculously, but I have no doubt it was her skills and uh, tenacity, securely fav um, secured a favorable settlement for her client. Yeah. JC serves on the leadership team for the Happen Network, as well as other advisory and leadership roles within Alabama and the regional heirs property community, and is a JAG officer with the Air National Guard. So welcome, JC. Um, and then we have at the end of the, of the stage, we have Brianna Bogan. She is the Director of Legal Services at the Center for Heirs Property Preservation, also referred to as CHIP, managing CHIP's Charleston, Orangeburg, and Florence offices. She is excited about CHIP's expansion to a Columbia office in the next few months. She joined the organization in 2019 as a staff attorney, drawn by their direct impact on community and involvement in heirs property legislation reform. Brianna often reflects on this quote by John Rome, all good men and women must take responsibility to create legacies that will take the next generation to a level we could only imagine. Welcome, Brianna. And then sitting next to me, stunning us in this beautiful blue, we have Andrea Barnes, who is the director of the Heirs Property Campaign for the Mississippi Center of Justice, for Center for Justice, a nonprofit public interest law firm. 
The Heirs Property Campaign provides legal assistance and community education to families around the state to preserve ownership of their land and maintain their legacy. Andrea has also served as an adjunct professor at Tougaloo College, educating aspiring lawyers about litigation and trial practice, and is a member of many professional organizations and associations, including the Mississippi Bar, the Magnolia Bar, Metro Black Women's Lawyers Association. And then, welcome, Andrea. Um, and then I'm representing the legal tech industry, which is new. I am, uh, or not the industry, but I am new to the tech industry. Um, I also am a an attorney who practiced and worked with heirs property clients, but more recently I have launched a company that is seeking to make certain things like clearing title on heirs property much more easier and much more affordable so more people can access those services. We, I believe someone mentioned um, our learning platform, deathanddirt.com. So if you're interested in learning more about what we're doing, check out deathanddirt.com. Also note this um, HTML or this address URL. Uh, the Happen Network is hppn.info. So that website is just an informational website. But if you want to learn more about the network, go to hppn.info. All right. So I would like to focus our conversation on three topics. The practice, um, what can be done to enhance and increase access to justice, and what's needed to sustain a healthy system of trusted, high quality legal services. So let's first start with the basics. Um, I would love to hear from you all, starting with you, Brianna. What is an heirs property attorney, and what are the types of matters that we handle? And then I'll invite you, Jason and Andrea, to follow with her. So heirs property practitioner in the nonprofit realm has twofold. It's really educational first. So you want to make sure that you build a relationship with family. So that means being comfortable with being patient with how much information is initially shared, um, but also being interested in the narrative. I know oftentimes um, what brought me to the work is being able to do something proactive, not always reactive. And I think a lot of heirs property attorneys dive deep into, well, what is the probate administration or what is the petition action or what is the quiet title action? But sometimes it's just making sure these communities are informed. So that may be seminars, that may be doing a wills clinic or explaining why not just the will is important, but why advanced directives are important and making them feel confident in having those conversations. Um, so that is the spectrum of the heirs property practice. Um, and some of the work that we do as heirs property attorneys are those actions, but also mediations is a part of those um, list of services, as well as just bringing context to title search information, like when, what is the deeds office? What what does the probate court do in the services they provide? Um, but also debunking some myths, um, making them feel encouraged to go to these institutions or to these offices, um, encouraging them to say, you can do things with your land, whether that is residential or utilization practices such as forestry and being a partner with them. So that means going to the visit with them at the courthouse or the NRCS office because um, what we learned today is that there have been some discriminatory challenges and obstacles that families have faced and they are intimidated to go to these places. So that's an extension of our work as well. Thank you, JC or Andrea. Yeah, so in private practice, it's it's very similar to nonprofit, but also very different. When a client comes to us, oftentimes they, most of the time, they don't have 100% agreement from all heirs. Um, and then they're coming to us with issues that may be like emergency reactive type issues as opposed to proactive. And when we get a proactive one, we're like, oh, thank God, we can take our time with this. But most of the time when someone comes to me, they are in a partition lawsuit. Uh, they are being actively landlocked. They are in the middle of a condemnation action. And so as a private practice, heirs property attorney, you don't 
you cannot only know heirs property. One thing that my boss instilled in me that is really important is, as a private practice heirs property attorney, you have to know all things real estate litigation because heirs property owners, as we know, face issues beyond just title issues. They may be facing landlocked issues or tax foreclosure issues. And so I have to be almost like the expert in all things real estate litigation because they all play a role. And so we start with the consultation and I pretty much analyze what is the most urgent and emerging and emergency issue that I have to address first? Let me start there. Now, in, in my case, I never resolve heirs property without doing a title opinion. Um, so I do a title opinion on every case before I start resolving so that I have a full picture of the problem. And then if I find out that they're in litigation, I mean, I'm gonna deal with that first. But what we call ourselves at, at our firm and private practice are legal lifeguards. We are an emergency operating room. People are coming to us the day before the auction, most times. Um, and so that's kind of what private practice looks like for an heirs property attorney in a state like Alabama, where you know most of the, the judges and attorneys don't know about the UPHPA or are actively avoiding use of it. So it's fast paced, sexy, fun. That's sexy to me, you know? Coming from criminal defense, it translates. And so it is very fast paced. You're dealing with the media one day, you're dealing with judges the next day, the good old boys club the next day, you're in the country club the next day. I mean, talking to the good old boys, infiltrating their systems, it's crazy, but it's fun. And that, that's one reason I love the private practice side of an heirs property attorney. Okay, and I'll just share um, quickly. Brianna talked about the nonprofit um, sector uh, the Mississippi Center for Justice is a public interest, a nonprofit a law uh, entity. However, we are a law firm. So we're a little different uh, than a traditional nonprofit. Um, by being a law firm um, with the Mississippi Center for Justice, uh, we are a um, social justice uh, law firm where we service low wealth. Uh, Mississippians. And so we have campaigns that touch on every aspect um, uh, that one um, would encompass. So we have a health law campaign, a housing campaign, an impact litigation campaign, an economic justice campaign. And I say that to say this in terms of what uh, an heirs property attorney looks like in, in at, at MCJ or in our RAM um, with being a public interest law firm, oftentimes the campaigns end up uh, intersecting and working together. For example, um, in the wake of, of the pandemic, what has what we found is a lot of people, of course, did an estate plan and they end up uh, untimely dying. Um, we have our economic justice campaign that handles our foreclosure matters. So you may have a husband and a wife who had a home, husband abruptly dies, wife's name is not on the deed, wife's name is not on the mortgage, wife's name or wife is not listed as a person with whom the mortgage company is authorized to speak to, so now wife is in a dilemma, right? Um, the mortgage company will not speak to her, um, she's delinquent on the property, so she may come initially to the Mississippi Center for Justice um, to help her prevent foreclosure. However, they then come to the heirs property campaign um, because they cannot assist them until we help resolve um, the heirs property issue or at least uh, initiate some type of direct legal action, which are letters of administration that allows the client to then speak to the mortgage company to then deal with the issue. Um, so in terms of day to day with um, what we do, and I like to call ourselves um, protectors of legacy. So when we think about the land, we think about it being an asset. We're protecting the legacies of families as we work with families in the state of Mississippi, all 82 counties, with keeping, protecting, and maintaining that land. So day to day, you're doing a little bit of all. So it may be family law, right? Because you're counseling and you're dealing with uh, families or maybe presenting family presentations. Um, most of the clients that we service are elderly. So you may have to think about um, those elder law concerns, right? Um, then additionally, you may may also, because the direct legal actions may be um, a state administrations, um, know about what, what the law is in the state as it relates to that. So as, as, as JC alluded to, you have to know a little bit about it all, because although it's an heir's property issue, it touches so many other issues. So as a practitioner, even if, let's say, for example, that family came to me with that foreclosure issue, 
and I initiate the a state administration, I can't say, well, I don't, I don't file a temporary restraining order, right? I have initiated the, um, um, the administration. I am the attorney of record. And as the attorney of record, I do what needs to be done to assist the family move forward. <laughs> Y'all are turned up. <laughs> this is a very spirited conversation. And I just want to do a sound check-in because I feel like we're screaming. OK, they're working on that. OK. But you clearly, we're clearly passionate about the topic. So folks in the back, can you hear us OK? OK. You hear the echoes? You feel the waves? Because <laughs> we feel it. We, we, really, we really care about this work. Um, Andre, I want to stick with you um, and talk about the, the skills, experience, and attitude you feel is needed to do the Heirs Property Matters. Because what I've heard each of you say is that the type of law that is applicable to Heirs Property is pretty much anything involving land, anything involving finance, and anything involving, of course, death and inheritance. So could you talk about the types of skills um, and experience that is supportive of doing this type of work as an attorney, as well as the attitude that's needed? OK, one of the first things that I will say in, in, my, in my comments is it's kind of been resounded. And I, I apologize, I'm used to, you know. Um, so um, it has been resounded, I think, all day is the uh, cultural competence, right? Um, one of the first things that I would say in reference to this work is an appreciation and understanding that um, we all are different, um, but all the same, right? Different, but the same. And so from that lens, the acknowledgement that there needs to be a cultural sensitivity when you're involved with working with heirs property, uh, landowners, um, being mindful of one's lens and the, the perspective that you have and the view that you have based upon that. Um, and then just being um, respectful and listening. So in terms of skill sets, and, and um, that's gonna be, I think, key, um, because what I recognize and understand doing this work or what, that we all do is that trust is a major barrier. And so for me in the state of Mississippi, working with landowners, mostly whom are elderly, uh, one cultural sensitivity is they are used to, you know, people saying they grew up in that era where you say, yes, ma'am, and no, sir, right? And so even though I'm, I'm a grown woman, if I want to be able to reach and unintentionally, or, and not unintentionally offend the very persons that I'm called to serve, then I recognize that, right? And I shift. My mindset, my, my mindset shifts and my attitude shifts to be able to meet the need of the person with whom I am trying um, to assist. So cultural sensitivity, I think, is number one in reference to um, a skill set um, and, and an acknowledgement that needs to happen when working in this field. Of course, one will always say the ability to communicate effectively, um, the, and that, that's verbal and written. Um, and, and, and then I also said the ability to, to just listen, right? Um, so as a practitioner, as a lawyer, I think those are the top skill sets that I would say in reference to anyone trying to enter into this field. Uh, when I started out um, doing this work, I did a lot of family law practice that dealt with estate administrations and the like. But I didn't say, oh, I'm going to be, you know, an heirs property um, practitioner. It just, um, as life evolves, it ended up that way. But I did have um, experience in other areas of the law that I believe have helped me full circle now better um, advocate for um, heirs property landowners. Thank you. Um, so again, you each touched on different practice areas. Um, one of the most common types of legal matters that most practitioners doing this work do is title searches. And I think it would be helpful for the for the audience to understand, you know, high level what it what it looks like to perform a title search on heirs property in contrast to a traditional title search. Um, Brianna, I'd love to hear your response on that. So when we do a title search, it's really um, two layers where we have to truly um, walk the client through. Um, so first, we like to do a full comprehensive uh, title search. So we make sure we go through the family tree and make sure that it's very clear who's on the family tree. And so that is a presentation in itself so that it you're not missing anything or 
you know, you get a search done and then it's like, oh, who was this child, <laughs> you know? Um, so that's the first step is going through that genealogy. And I'll be remiss if I don't say that collaboration is so important. So when we talk to our client, we're like, hey, although you are the client, please lean into your family members to assist with this because it's benefiting the whole. And so that could be um, nominating uh, one person from each branch to get that information or collaborating with the Heritage Library or other organizations or libraries that help with that. Once that is completed, the title search is a 60 year search. And so with that, we're looking at liens, we're looking at um, possible if there's property taxes. Um, and at that point, that's the urgency that JC was saying. It's like, you know, once it's delinquent, we, we really need to be on um, guard because a lot of our counties are basically making it very hard for heirs to redeem the property. So we want to make sure that it doesn't get to that step. Um, but also going through those land documents is very, I think it's, it, it encourages the client sometimes because they don't know how much history is in those documents. Even, you know, sometimes how I identify heirs property is that, that whereas deed where it's just like paragraphs of like, this person passed and then they left. Yes, yes, we're going through Matthew. Um, but yeah, and I think that having the client look at that and be able to physically touch those documents or know where it comes from, um, but also the maps. I think the plat really bring it to context, especially some of the issues that we face in a consultation with some of our clients is, oh, well, my grandfather owned 120, but now it's like you know 98 acres where did it go and to be able to um, not only clarify that question to see what has happened but how do we maintain what's left um, whether that was through eminent domain it was taken or just you know overlay of roads and things like that Jesse, you want to add and so the distinction with the tradition uh, standard title search is with the standard title search we're usually starting with the current owner and there's a record of that current owner and then we we go backwards. Whereas with an heirs property title search, um, what you signaled is that we we need to go back to a long time ago, usually the early part of the nineteen um, hundreds, and build a tr build the the paper trail forward. And so in that regards, an heirs property title search necessarily is much more complex, and the cost of that is much different, even if it's in a nonprofit. Um, um, setting, it's the, there are significant costs in putting together this kind of huge research project so that the attorney can make legal analysis and an opinion. Yeah, and, and that's one of the challenges because we are a nonprofit, we offer free legal services, but not all of the services needed to make sure that the action is completed is free. And so like being able to tap into those third parties such as title inspectors, surveyors, guardian ad litems, um, court reporters, like all of these things are important and they do add up. Publication, um, one of our smaller counties charged by the inch, yeah. which was very interesting because I was like, where's the ruler? But, <laughs> but I mean, when we're talking to our clients, we have to let them know that yes, this is a long process. Yes, there are avenues where we do lean into those third parties that's willing to do reduced rates. Um, newspapers do have nonprofit rates. But to know that we as attorneys are going to help guide them, um, one, connect them to those resources, it doesn't discourage them as much. Oftentimes they see um, heirs property as, you know, oh, we should fix this. And then when you go down the cost letter and you're just like, these are the things, they're like, never mind. Mm -hmm. And it's like, no, we can work through this. We can do installments. We can make sure that we get multiple quotes and walk through this. Mm -hmm. And that's the most important thing. Uh, to uh, Brianna's point, one of the things that I just wanted to add was uh, we represent many low wealth Mississippians, just quite frankly, poor people. Um, and so for us being a nonprofit law firm, it's great to have the funder uh, fund the work to say, here, Mississippi Center for Justice, heirs property campaign, we want you to do the community education and outreach, we want you to provide direct legal services. However, we can draft the pleadings and be ready to, to file it. But what we found is that a lot of our clients don't even have the 148 or $58 filing fee to even initiate an estate action, right? And so without the client 
um, being able to have access to funds to be able to pay those legal expenses or costs associated with filing a direct legal action to clear title, we just have a project, right, with no real impact. So one of the things that we had to do um, was actually be a little creative and not only just ask for funding uh, to support the work that we're doing with the project or our campaign, but also ask for funding that specifically will pay for the legal fees and costs associated with doing the work. And that is inclusive of title searches. That's inclusive of a land survey. That's inclusive of publication costs, service of process fees, filing fees, all those fees that are associated, they really do add up. Because quite honestly, if, you deal, if you're dealing with 10 plus heirs and you end up having to personally serve um, all 10 people you know, for the airship hearing and then before you can close out the estate, um, if, if a publication cost is at a nominal um, $100, depending on you know, who all, it can really be thousands of dollars, just quite honestly, in terms of those legal expenses associated with that. And so for us, we've had to just creatively think outside of the box in an effort to be able to truly assist our clients with being able to, one, offer the free legal service, but then also be able to really have some tangible results and pay those fees that they cannot afford so that they're able to clear title to the property. Um, JC, I'm just going to invite you to affirm what I'm about to say about the private practice, and then I would love to hear um, some anecdotes from you as it relates to litigating a partition action under the UPHPA, um, which we're so grateful for and has been passed in more than 20 jurisdictions. Um, and I think it's wonderful that we have someone who has some street cred as it relates to actually litigating these cases successfully and, and seeing how this law has helped families save their land. So I wanna hear some anecdotes about that, but um, I will say uh, it seems both in the network and through my own experience that in the private practice, you take all of the things that um, Brianna and Andrea just listed and add to that the complexity of being a, um, a business owner who has to kill what they eat, so to speak, and having a client who doesn't have capital. That could mean that they simply don't even get the title search completed and that some of us, or many of us, have to figure out workarounds to, um, or some creative financing options to allow um, the client to get the services. It just means that the, the time of that will be protracted over a much longer period. So I see your agreement with that. So please talk to us about litigating a partition action. Yeah, so as I mentioned before, I, I, do a, I require a title opinion before I will ever work with a client. And if they say no, then bye-bye. Um, because we don't know what we don't know. And I can't tell you how many times I've done a title opinion and had to tell the client, actually, you don't even own the land. Like your dad deeded it off, you know, in 1984 and they had no idea. And so, um, so there's costs associated with that, but what'll usually happen is if they don't have the nominal fee to do the title opinion, it may delay getting it done because they're gathering, trying to gather money from the family members to, to contribute. And, and so we do it in steps when we clear title, um, which I, I think everyone that clears title does, but you know, we'll start with the title opinion. And then when I produce the title opinion, I propose um, strategic courses of action to clear the title in different options, depending on what your funding situation looks like, what your capital situation looks like. Um, and so there is no shortage of work. This is the, one practice area where I have never um, been like, whew, I need more clients, whew, I need, in fact, I mean, I am, my consults are booked out through May already. Um, and so people are having to book into June and that's pretty normal for me on Airs property work. Um, and so we, we try to take it in steps, but some of the challenges that we're seeing, even in partition actions is our publication fee in Shelby County to publish um, on a, a partition action, last, the last two weeks, we got one for $3,000. That was the newspaper's fee for publication. Um, that's, you know, half the attorney's fee. <laughs> so it's, it's ridiculous. And then um, we're dealing with the fact that I could be the best attorney in the world, which I'm not. But I know the UPHPA, 
like the back of my hand. I can, I can cite the statutes word for word in, in most situations and have to in court. I can get you all the way to the buyout round. If, if you don't have the capital to meaningfully participate in the buyout round, it's a project. And so we're getting to the buyout round. The, I, I filed an election for my client to buy out the interests of the developer or whoever initiated the sale. And then they don't have the money to pay within 60 days. And then I'm batting eyelashes at the banks and credit unions privately saying, listen, I know y'all don't lend on heirs property, but listen, they're gonna have clear title by the time they get their, 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 their judgment, their clerk's deed. Please, please lend this client the money. Personally, begging the banks and credit unions, asking my white boss to, to pull some strings in his not very good, good old boys club, because he's a Democrat in Alabama. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm you know, showing leg practically, to, to get money. I mean, no, I'm, you know, like for real. And so, you know, we've got 30 days to file an election to buy out and then 60 days to pay the purchase price. And then I'm batting eyelashes at the judge, like judge, give me 30 more days. I just need 30 more days to get financing. I mean, it is social work, legal work, finance work, and it's exhausting. And the client's exhausted and I'm trying to be strong for the client. And I'm like, hold out, we're gonna get this money. Because as soon as the buyout occurs, the UPHPA says, there's no other parties who, who requested a sale. This case shall be dismissed without prejudice. And the case is done. It should always end at the buyout. It should never have to go to park petition and kind trial if the buyout fails. But what we're seeing is that the capital issue is, is what's hindering the, the real um, effect of the UPHPA. And so, um, but boy, has it made a difference. And I can talk about that because that's probably a question that you have later, but there are other ways it has made a significant difference for those who maybe can't afford the buyout. And I've yet to see a judge in Alabama actually order a partition in kind. And there's reasons for that too, but at least if the property gets sold, they're getting the fair market value. Thank you. You or not, I think you do highlight um, some opportunities, particularly to our peers in the audience who work at financial institutions. You know, this the reckoning with heirs property, I think, forces us to reconsider what lending products exist um, and how they can be used to uh, secure what, you know, for many of us is affordable housing across generations is resiliency from a, both a financial perspective, but also a climate perspective. So there's a, it sounds like there's a great reason for um, financial institutions to expand their thinking on the products that they offer for, for these types of things. Um, and I think that's a good pivot to this, um, this idea of enhancing access to justice. You know, JC, you just shared some highlights around, um, you know, capital and how capital, uh, making capital readily available for buyouts, but also for legal services, filing fees, what have you. Um, and I think it could be helpful to understand, like for the audience to understand the, the cost, the average cost of, of these different types of matters. You know, for, in my view, and I'll just invite you to agree or disagree. Um, in my view, the, the estimate for an estate plan, which is individualized, you know, for the person um, is one to $2,000 and maybe uh, 1.5 times as much if it's a couple. So, you know, two to $3,000. Um, succession plans, which are much more comprehensive and actually support multiple generations of ownership and management. Um, I would say that figure increases uh, substantially, ask Pamela in the back, <laughs> um, uh, what that looks like when you have like a trust-centered plan or an entity-centered plan. Um, title searches vary. They depend on the, the location, they depend on the attorney, et cetera. But I would say at a minimum, an heirs property title search will cost $3,000. Um, and then litigation varies even more, um, but I believe that there should be at least eight to $10,000 for legal services alone. But um, you know, litigation resolution and succession planning can be best addressed when there are buyouts. So that adds another um, bucket of capital need it, which, you know, that varies even more um, on in the range in terms of working with the heirs property funded in Viva, we've seen requests for 
um, buyouts that are in the 20,000s, and then we've certainly seen that some that are much more. Um, so, so access to capital is a critical need for people, especially um, if we're thinking about equitable access to justice. And my question for the audience is, is where does the money reside? <laughs> you know, what, what, are, what are different ways that funding, funders can look at how they make funding available, both through the nonprofit stream, but also to um, access the biggest pool of attorneys which exist in the private sector. I mean, the reality is there are more private practice attorneys that do this type of work. Um, and so how do we creatively fund these services? Can I add to that, Major? Just, just really quick. Okay, first of all, I do want to give a shout out to Thomas Jackson from Enviva, um, and then via by way of Mavis as well, because so, and, and I'm not the only person, but but Thomas Jackson, when I, you saw the documentary last night, I represented the Eli family in clearing their title in Alabama. And when I asked for that money, Thomas made it happen. And I, I couldn't get it anywhere else. Um, and trust me, I tried. And I went to Mavis and Fran, like crying, literally. Um, <laughs> and I was like, I'm gonna lose, I'm gonna lose this developer. Like I've got a deal, I need the money now. I've, I had worked so hard to get the deal. I had played the good old boys club card to get it. And um, Mavis put me in contact and they came running. And so what's looking like at this point is we are reaching out to the private sector saying, look, we need help, we need it fast, we need meetings, we need to get this money. And, and I wanna thank you, Thomas, for making that happen, not just for me, but for other people. So, so yeah, I just wanted to put that plug out because that, that made the difference for that family. Um, so in thinking about access to justice, and it's clear that you all are, are very um, big advocates for access to justice, aside from the capital question, can you all talk about some creative ways or creative approaches you've taken to uh, you know, be able to work on these matters while also understanding that there are constraints both from a time perspective and a capital perspective? Um, Andrea or Brianna, I'd love to start with you. Andrea? Okay, uh, one of the things that we've done is the need is great as everybody on the panel has kind of alluded to today in reference to people having heirs property. So what we've seen in the state of Mississippi is that um, because the need is so great um, and there are not a whole lot of people who actually practice heirs property, uh, we partner with law firm with, with uh, law firms in terms of uh, pro bono work, right? And doing pro bono uh, services. Uh, we partner with law schools, and so we have uh, you know summer break legal interns, a winter break uh, legal interns. We have an externship program that we are starting this summer with one of the law schools in the state of Mississippi. Um, additionally, we are getting ready to launch. Um, an heirs property legal clinic in the spring. And so we're able to uh, use that uh, manpower or a woman power to help uh, us with our capacity to actually do the work. Um, and so that's one of the ways in which um, we're doing it. And I don't know what it is, but it, it seems right now in terms of looking for or trying to get uh, attorneys, new attorneys, uh, uh, graduating uh, lawyers to, uh, to do the work, it's been some difficulty uh, in that regard. And so we're reaching out to law schools to kind of help assist um, and, and amplify our voice in terms of the need um, for other lawyers to join us in this work because there is so much to be done, right? Not just in Mississippi, it's not a Mississippi issue, it's a nationwide issue. Um, and so we need uh, the assistance to do it um, because it's just so much uh, to do. So those are some of the things that we're doing to try to, um, you know, uh, 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 you know, reduce that gap in terms of a manpower um, to do the work. Um, along the same lines, we do take advantage of um, students. We've been um, able to collaborate, but also partnership with John Deere, the Legal Defense Fund, Thurgood Marshall College Fund. Um, they've been able to not only like help us have summer interns that really help families with that genealogy work. They help with building those family presentations that's needed, whether they're in person or hybrid. Um, but also we have an outreach department, um, a part of the Center for Ears Property Preservation. And through the outreach department, they make sure that they're within the community. So a lot of our volunteers come from some of those seminars or presentations that outreach liaisons go to. And they really help foundationally with 
making sure the word gets out, but also um, at those tables, there's other businesses who's like, well, we would like to um, donate towards your litigation fund if you have that, or um, I learned about your organization, I'm, I'll be willing to do a title search for free, and I love those. Um, <laughs> And so being able to have not only a legal department, but a forestry department, an outreach department to provide holistic services for our landowners, that also helps, you know, like, oh, well, I didn't necessarily come to the Center for Air's property for their legal department, but I went to a forestry workshop and I see how it's tied together. So I think as a collective, we've been able to collaborate in that capacity alongside of the, the corporate sponsors or the Bunnell Foundation grants mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, one thing I can say about students, they're really intrigued uh, because I think when I was in law school, um, we just talked about property and, and probate. But when they read about the, <clears throat> the land loss in Hilton Head or they see um, changes in demographics with um, the black migration are learning about the social work or learning about climate change. They see the land loss and they're like, well, my professor isn't talking about it, but I see your organization is. So I wanna, I wanna volunteer for 40 hours. And at that point, I'm like, come, please, <laughs> immediately, whether that's hybrid, whether they're coming in person. Um, and so that's how we are able to um, move some of those things along. Like our title says, lawyers make it happen. <laughs> um, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I do want to turn to, you know, because each of you have highlighted um, the complexity of the, the legal work that we do, the complexity or the dynamic approaches that we take to make sure that it happens. Um, and so I want to talk about sustainable, um, mm -hmm, um, sustainability of the, um, ecosystem of legal service. Uh, again, we're thrilled that there's a network of attorneys, um, over 90 attorneys who are at, at a minimum very interested and supportive of this work, but many of whom are practicing. Um, and so I think it makes sense for us to talk about, uh, in the context of sustain sustaining this ecosystem of legal services, um, referrals. <laughs> because I'm sure many of you in the audience are excited too that there are all these attorneys doing this work and you want to make some referrals. Um, but making referrals that actually um, result in a good match um, has multiple factors. Um, and so I would love for the, each of you to, um, if you can, briefly just share what, what you think supports a good referral in terms of understanding the health of the case, the urgency of the case, the expenses involved and um, yeah we'll leave it there uh, but yeah who, who wants to start I'll, I'll start real quick so uh, it's it's the same reason I hate wills clinics like um, because not as attorneys we're we we're taught in law school um, typically leave everything to your children in equal shares per stirpes and then the client comes to us saying just leave it to all my kids they'll duke it out and then the attorneys don't push back I am only referring cases to attorneys who are bold, brave, and have nerve that are going to push back against the client as to why that's not a good idea and why it's dangerous. And so the, that's why Happen is so important because we have an opportunity to vet the attorneys in this network and we trust each other. Um, but I do look at cost to see do I need to point them in a nonprofit direction where they need to qualify, or do they have some funds where they can go to a private practice attorney? Then you look at urgency. Is this something where it's a reactive situation or it needs to be proactive? And I may use that as a consideration. The other thing is there, there are some more pressing issues. If I've got a tax foreclosure emergency situation in, you know, that maybe it's Heather Way that I'm calling. If I have a UPHPA problem, it's me that I'm calling, you know? So it, it, it just depends and then it's state specific too. So there's a lot of different factors, but you can't just refer people just because they're in the trusts and estates group of their state bar association. Half the time when a client walks in and says, I just wanna leave it to all my kids, guess what? The attorney is saying, great, all your children in equal shares per stirpes because that's how we're taught to do it until someone dispels that, that's when they know not to do that. So you have to be very careful to make sure that the person has legal competency and cultural competency. I agree, and the only thing that I would add is just, 
in terms of, I guess, the referral system, and I think um, my uh, uh, cohorts could, uh, could agree to this, it's a very protected space, right? We recognize and understand that we service vulnerable individuals. And so when making referrals, we, we want to ensure that we're not making them more vulnerable, right, by referring them to the wrong people. And of course, so we safeguard referrals and ensure in terms of one, competency, sensitivity, and then cost and all those factors, but this space is very protected because we recognize and understand that uh, of where we find the people that we serve. And so we don't want to do anything that would adversely affect and or impact them. And so when we make referrals, and if you get a referral from any of us, just know that we believe that the person or the entity with whom we have referred you is a trusted entity and or individual who, who, is, who can zealously advocate um, for you and your family. Um, to piggyback on that, I would like to add um, attorneys that can communicate but also let the client guide what their goal is for the property. Um, I know that there are various avenues that are pushed in certain communities like, oh, put it in a trust, put it in an LLC. And the thing is that's easy, but that may not be what the, the best decision for that client or that family. And so when I think about who I'm gonna refer a client to, I wanna make sure that the person is one listening for things that's unsaid. And so that's why that's really important when I'm making the referrals, making sure that they hear, you know, oh, well, I wanna give it to all my children. Well, what about other ways of conveyance? Like is someone living on the property, you wanna do a life estate with the remainder to with survivorship, like being able to hear the things that the client doesn't necessarily know what to say, just because they don't know the lingo, but we do. Um, so I would love to invite the audience to ask questions, unless they're specific to a specific case. Please remember <laughs> to state your name and where you're from. Because we don't do that. We don't give advice on stage. But yes. Hello. Oh, Hello. Hi. Thank you so, so much for your presentation. I truly appreciate you guys' expertise, as I've talked to probably 100 of you. My one question, because we're supposed to keep it to 30, 30 minutes, and I forgot the primary rule. I'm Rosalind, uh, and I'm from Austin, Texas, and uh, we have a farm, uh, and we are currently in litigation. Uh, do you have any cohorts in Texas? That's, that's one. And private attorney, do you have anyone you can refer who's passed the bar in Texas? Genevieve's right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Look at that, making it happen. All right. Yes. Good afternoon. Dwayne Goldman from Pine Bluff, Arkansas, currently on loan to Washington, D.C. <laughs> but, Ms. Fisher, you, you, you talked about a situation um, where you had to blink your eyelashes and show a little leg. If I get in that situation, I'm in trouble. So, so seriously, yeah, seriously, um, I'm thinking about the heirs property relending program. And I'd just like to get your thoughts on if that money were parked somewhere, so that when you get to that critical stage in the process and you need an infusion of cash, how could something like that be used to get you over that hurdle and be done responsibly? Yeah, so so that's something I've thought about is like, so what about the people that are that are literally in partition litigation and and the way to to literally not just clear title, but avoid the emergency is to have that immediate access to funds. And it, it's it's doable. I mean, I really believe that it is because what I'm doing these first of all, these people don't have twenty five thousand dollars laying around in cash. Right. Um, and so they're looking for a loan. The problem is the banks are saying, oh, this is too sticky, like it's heirs property, like I know it's gonna be clear when this is over, but I'm just not interested. So they're already looking for a loan somewhere else. Why can't the relending funds serve in that gap to immediately fund those buyouts? Because as soon as those people who wanted a sale are bought out, I'm filing a motion to dismiss. And then we can clear the rest of the title because there, there's probably still some lingering family members that, that objected to the sale. I can clear title out of court 
and then they can take their time, they can budget for that, they can work with you know, uh, economizers and agricultural economists to create a business plan to start maybe generating some income to fund the rest of the clearing title. But, but I do think there, there's a pocket of money that should be there for um, partition actions that is quickly accessible, and by quickly I mean 60 days. I don't know how that works, but it's like a mortgage. I mean, it's a 60 day process. So do I know the logistics of how that works? No, but it, but it is needed because families are losing their property today. Like I have a family that's gonna lose their property if they don't get a partition in kind in two weeks. I think an, an enhancement to the relending program could be one, how we define technical assistance. Um, Cause there's technical assistance dollars that could actually make people more ready to get legal services, but are legal service related. So I do think USDA and offering like cost share could even well ahead of any kind of like urgent need um, unlock dollars that could be supportive of like getting the family tree in order so that they're ready to go to an attorney and get title clear or get some other type of assistance like with surveys because a lot of times our legal work involves surveys um, whereas usually with a survey in the USDA context it's for you know fire lanes or something like that. So I think also some enhancements in other programs could make the access to the relending dollars easier because people are more positioned to, to use them. And, and one more thing, it's not gonna work for every family, right? Like Corinne Woodson, the case I had in Auburn, Alabama, that made the news, her property was worth $4 million. Like she's had it since 1963, like she had no idea. She thought it was worth 100,000 and it, it, it appraised it 4 million. Like that's not a situation where she would have been able to pay four million dollars to get the property back, and we had to go through a private investor that put up the money. But um, it, it will work for the majority of families because their buyouts do look like the Eli family twenty five thousand dollars, you know, to buy out the the developer or whatever. So, thank you. Hi, um, I'm Ruth Gal from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. Just to kind of follow up on this conversation. Um, I am really curious with lawyers being the ones on the ground, you are the closest to the clients, closest to their situation, and therefore probably the closest to assess the level of risk that they pose in terms of how close they are to clearing title. Um, and so I'm wondering if there have been more work done, uh, not, not just from you guys, but from anyone in the field on the lawyer's role in helping to inform credit risk for credit unions, for CDFIs, for nonprofit lenders to come into this space and to provide the financial solutions, and uh, including with the USDA and the relending program. I think risk, uh, the uncertainty of test cases of lending to someone without clear title, you know, not having that demonstration that leads to, you know, the hesitancy in deployment. Um, and so I'm wondering if there have been thought in this area or if maybe we can talk offline about ideas. Yeah, I think, and if I may just add to that, um, there's also a need for um, uh, understanding risk as it relates to title insurance. So that's a type of insurance that you can have on the title of the property that I think will be greatly beneficial to heirs property owners for future lending. And it's, this is definitely something that has come up in the, the heirs property practitioner network. Um, I think that in an offline conversation, it would be worthwhile to explore um, how we could be involved in developing an assessment because I think I think there could be a model for assessing the health of the case and what's possible and what's not possible. So yes, and we need more attorneys doing exactly what you're saying. So let, let's please create like a meeting to mm -hmm. do that. Mm -hmm. Hello, I'm sorry. My name is Cecily Gist. I'm the new relending loan fund manager with the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. I met with and spoke with several of the ladies on the stage, and I just want to say thank you for all of your advice and helping me. I was trying to say hello to you, Miss JC, earlier. Hello. <laughs> but I just want to say some of the things that you talked about, uh, mediation, succession planning, that are some of the things that the Federation of Southern Cooperatives offers, offers for free. So please make sure that you um, please see me. I have business cards, contact information. If those are some of the things that you need, that's what we are here to help you for. And as we've discussed, the relending loan is not ready to be rolled out, but there's other things that we can help you with in getting ready for preparation for once the loan does roll out. 
So like I said, there are some things that we offer for free. So my name is Cecily Gist again with the Federation. So please see me if you have any questions or concerns. Thank you. I would like to add just because we've talked about the estate planning gap, I think um, you all probably do this as well, but once they're a client, we make sure that their estate plan is covered. So we wanna make sure that, you know, once we clear title, there isn't just like, oh, we'll go free and hopefully you'll remember. Yeah, so um, that's one thing that we always push to our clients is, you know, while we're in this process, let's go ahead and get that estate plan um, together. Thank you, three might, questions uh, in five minutes. Quick, quick question. Uh, Ryan Thompson, Auburn University, SRDC. Uh, if I might ask, as a researcher, extension, training, how might academics and community-based organizations go about better supporting your work? Real quick, we can't do it without y'all. I mean, Ryan and I have driven to pockets, legal deserts in Alabama, like on a whim on a Saturday and gone to churches and talked to communities. He's got the maps. I got the tips. And so we, we can't do it without academics and researchers because we don't have time, first of all, to gather the data, like to be real. Second of all, um, some, of, some of that information that y'all have produced, we can use for educational purposes, which obviously we've done. Um, but you know, when they're doing these family presentations and, and they're doing these community seminars, how do you know where to go if you don't have the data of what areas are most affected? Um, and so I think the way that you can continue helping us and help us better is just to continue to provide that support, that educational component support, that data support, keeping uh, conversations going because we are already so taxed mentally in this work. And so uh, we can't do our jobs and try to figure out all the things that y'all amazingly do. So just, just continue keeping in touch with us, which, you know, we talk like every day. And I would just add real quickly that even in the nonprofit realm, but we're tasked with doing community outreach and education. And so we partner with um, the Policy Center, Alcorn State uh, University and others to uh, do the same thing that JC just mentioned in terms of going to these various pockets in the various counties throughout the state um, to do just that. And so continuing that conversation, continuing, uh, you know, connecting, right? So we need partnerships, we need trusted um, collaborations. And so it's very important to continue in that vein of connecting so that we're able to then reach um, more people. And I would just add that um, for me and my practice, working with the Sustainable Forestry and African American Land Retention Program actually made it easier, one, to find clients, but two, to keep our clients motivated. So I think the cross-pollination of programs that are doing other landowner services is an excellent way to partner and support the legal service ecosystem because we have clients who also see that they are, you know, helping protect climate resiliency because they're getting a forest management plan and getting an easement and what have you. So I think a lot of that will be very important going forward. I feel like there's two or three more questions and no time. So invite us back next year. <laughs> we, we actually have time for one more. Right. Hi, I'm uh, Jonathan Schreiber, Schreiber, counsel with the Massachusetts Association of Realtors working with Professor Mitchell as long as, as well as with uh, several other folks in this room to try to get UPHPA enacted in Massachusetts. Um, and Ms. Fisher, you, you kind of hinted that, um, that the UPHPA is making a difference, right? You, you recognize that it, it has improved things, also maybe hinted that there might be some other ways that it could be reformed. We have an opportunity in Massachusetts to kind of make it our own. Um, I didn't know if you could elaborate on that a little more and if other folks have experience as well that they'd like to share. Yeah, so so I encourage you to talk to Scott. I don't know where Scott is from New York, but he's got an amazing, well, New York has an amazing like UPHPA 2.0 kind of situation. And it's really easily read as Fran pointed out to me, but but real quick on the protections, just, just to give you all an example of some of the protections, because I talked to someone, two people today that are in partition actions and had no idea that their, their uh, case is probably running under the wrong statute. So So real quick, Enhanced notice requirements. So instead of regular notice, when you get served with a petition, they have to post a conspicuous sign on the land. That's one thing the UPHPA created, which is important. Then you've got an independent fair market value appraisal, 
which is supposed to be by an independent appraiser, and the opportunity to challenge it. That is also different. Typically in old partition actions, that the plaintiff would get an appraisal and the judge would just say, yep, that sounds good, let's take that appraisal. Or it was going to auction, so they didn't worry about it. Or what I'm seeing that I'm having to stop is, they're like, let me call my real estate buddy. He'll just go look at the property and, and estimate what the value is. I had a case like that three months ago. The property actually valued at 100000 more than what his real estate buddy friend went and looked at it for. So the independent appraisal. Then we've got the mandatory buyout rounds. There's a first round and a second round in most states. And again, I'm speaking from Alabama. Um, and, and so if you don't win the first round, there's an opportunity at the second round. And then you've got the partition in kind trial that takes into a, a effect different factors, including um, sentimental attachment to the land, economic factors, if, if the parcel as a whole is worth more than the, pal the parcel uh, divided up. There's, there's all kinds of things that they can consider. And then if all else fails, it goes to open market sale or private sale before it ever goes to an auction. So those are some of the basic things that you're gonna want in your UPHPA, which are in the standard draft that Thomas Mitchell worked on. But there are some other even broader reforms, uh, better reforms that New York, I think, has implemented. That's our time and we finished on time. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Raise your hand if you can hear me. Awesome, awesome. My name is Odette Williamson. I'm a staff attorney at the National Consumer Law Center, and I also direct our Racial Justice Initiative. I will be the moderator for this session on property tax foreclosures on heirs' property homes. And um, I'll just wait for folks to take a seat for a minute so we can start our conversation today. It promises to be a really, really robust one. And we're going to do something a little different. We're going to do some presentations. And um, then we're going to have a Q&A at the end. So you'll be looking at some slides just for a little bit. As I mentioned, I'm with the National Consumer Law Center, and for those of you who don't know NCLC, we are an anti-poverty organization working on behalf of low-income individuals. Um, I am so pleased to be joined today by my co-presenters. Uh, first, we have um, Heather Way. She is a clinical professor and director of the Housing Policy Clinic at the University of Texas School of Law. Then we have Kate Dugan, an attorney at Community Legal Services of Philadelphia. And finally, but not last but not least, my colleague, Andrea Bob Stark, who's a senior attorney with the National Consumer Law Center. Uh, in the interest of time, uh, their bios are in the materials uh, if you wish to know a little bit more about them. But I just wanna start out really by talking a little bit about property tax foreclosures. Um, do we have any homeowners in the audience today? All right, have you looked at your tax bill recently? <laughs> right, it's, it's gone up, it's gone way up. And so what we know is that every homeowner is at risk of property tax foreclosure, but older adults, in, uh, in particular those who have paid off their mortgage and also low income um, homeowners are particularly at risk. Now, in terms of uh, communities of color, of course, in keeping with every racial pattern we've discussed throughout the entire conference, we know that Black and Latino or Hispanic individuals are more likely to face foreclosure, especially if they live in a low-income community. Uh, there was a well-regarded series of reports looking at the tax foreclosure rates in Washington, D.C., and they noted that uh, 72, 72 percent of pending foreclosures were in neighborhoods where the population was less than 20 percent white. And that is a pattern in keeping with other studies throughout the U.S. looking at property tax foreclosure patterns and rates. Now, of course, there are obvious reasons for this. Uh, financial hardship, people fall behind, they're unemployed. Um, for the purpose, of course, of this conference, if we have a household member who dies and that person contributes money to the household, obviously um, th that household uh, is at risk for foreclosure. 
but we really can't lose sight of some of the structural issues that lead to tax foreclosure. And that, of course, includes uh, disinvestment in many of these communities, as well as redlining and segregation that limit um, the ability of um, consumers of color to make a living, get income, and um, access wealth building opportunities. And of course, what we're going to discuss uh, at length today is uh, the lack of um, tax relief for um, heirs, property owners. The other issue that we really should shine a light on is the dip disproportionate um, burden that consumers of color face res with respect to property taxes. Um, Black and Latino or Hispanic households pay disproportionately more higher taxes relative to other um, homeowners and relative to their home's value. So one study noted that homeowners of color pay 10 to 13% higher tax rate on average than white homeowners in the same municipality. And what that translates into is an extra three to $400 uh, dollars per year. Now, these disparities are due to several issues, but it really focuses and it, it's really due to the inequities in the system itself, the tax assessment systems and the appeals process in particular. And that assessment system disproportionately taxes lower valued homes at a higher, a disproportionately higher rate. In terms of appeals, it's also pretty interesting. Black and Latino homeowners are less likely to appeal assessments if they succeed um, and win their appeal, they are also not likely to receive a large reduction in their um, assessed value. So even when they win, they lose. Now, these inequities in the tax system have deeply racist roots, right? Like everything else we've spoken about um, at this conference. Um, during the Jim Crow era, civil rights activists, activists were taxed at a higher um, rate in retribution for their activism. And research has also highlighted that white assessors intentionally taxed black land landowners at a higher rate to prevent them from building wealth and uh, other opportunities uh, through land ownership. So whatever the reason for these disparities, uh, the tax structure as we have it now leads to a disproportionate burden for households of color and leads to a higher, higher carrying costs uh, for these households. So when you add the property tax, the utilities, the other carrying costs, uh, the mortgages, um, the interest rate on the mortgages associated with owning a home, we know that um, for many households, uh, even a, a, a slight increase in the property tax puts them at high risk um, for losing that home. There are also community-wide impacts as well. Um, the purchase of, a, purchase of a tax lien by investors in particular leads to gentrification of some communities, which can then push out lower income residents and also older adults from these once affordable uh, communities. And in terms of Massachusetts here, we're wondering, you know, they're being pushed out of Boston in particular, you know, where are they going? There are just very few communities that are affordable anymore. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, in other neighborhoods, property values um, uh, are further depressed, and that can lead, of course, to vacant and abandoned properties. And ultimately, the loss of the home, which increases the racial home ownership gap. So for today's conversation, which we will get started with, with Heather Way, um, we're gonna focus on three issues. Uh, number one is increasing property uh, homeowners access to property tax relief program, specifically heirs homeowners. We're gonna focus on programs that work. And for this, we're gonna do a deep dive, a case study uh, on the city of Philadelphia. And we're gonna talk a little bit about statutory reforms to increase consumer protections for homeowners. Um, so I hope to have a really robust conversation, but let's get started with Professor Wei.
Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Heather Way. I'm a clinical professor at the University of Texas School of Law. And I just want to start by echoing the gratitude that others have expressed today to Thomas and the rest of the crew at Boston College School of Law for just hosting this event. It's just been tremendous. I get a little bit of weepy eyed of just the just being able to connect with such um, tremendous passion and talent in this room. Um, people who we share the same commitment to the to, to heirs property issues. And also, it's really nice to meet for the first time my what I call my Zoom friends, um, who I've been talking um, on Zoom calls ad nauseum for uh, several years now on heirs property issues. And to get to meet them in person has just been fabulous. Um, I am going to, as Odette mentioned, I'm going to be talking about homeowners who've inherited their homes, which I'm going to be referring to as heirs property homeowners, this is their residence, and how state laws bar them from accessing access to really important state property tax relief programs, and then how that fuels their housing insecurity, um, how that can um, contribute to foreclosure, and, and how it contributes to the racial wealth gap in our country. Um, and, and just sort of building on Adette's points about, well, I'm actually sort of go back first because I forgot I had a question for the audience. How many of you have worked with heirs property owners um, facing property tax foreclosure just by show of hands? Great. So it's a good number here. And I'm sorry, Heather, I just want to interrupt. Could you go in the back here? Okay, great. Thanks. I'll put the mic a little bit closer to me too. Thanks for asking. Um, you just sort of building on Adette's points, I just think that this is such an important topic that we're talking about today, um, in part because property tax foreclosure really is a big driver, if not one of the largest causes of land loss among air property owners. Um, I'm going to share, just for one example, a research project I've been working on in North Texas with the TSU Center for Excellence for Housing and Community Development Policy Research and, and in that research, we found that 150 families lost their, who are heirs, lost their homes through a tax foreclosure sale over a three-year period in Tarrant County. That's just one tex county in North Texas. Um, it, it just for some context, um, Tarrant County is an urban county. It contains the cities of Fort Worth and Arlington. And this is a county where we've conducted another study where we found that roughly one out of 200 of all the properties in the county are heirs properties. So you have, we found that over half of all the tax foreclosed single family properties in that county were heirs properties at the time of foreclosure. So one out of two properties um, that were foreclosed upon heirs properties, whereas out of the whole county, only at one out of 200 single family properties are heir properties. This is a huge issue and a huge um, disparity that we're seeing. We're in the middle of finishing up a similar research for Dallas County, which contains the city of Dallas, also one of the biggest cities in the country, and we're finding similar um, similar rates among the foreclosures there. Um, before I talk about how state laws contribute to this issue and, and barriers to property tax relief programs, I just want to give just a quick primer on property taxes, just building on some of the points that Odette made. Every state in the country uh, requires property owners to pay taxes on their land and improvements on their land. That could be a home or a commercial structure or a barn. Um, and these, but the taxes are typically assessed at the local level. In most states, taxes are actually a really big part of the household's expenses. So I have a bunch of different stats here. And just the first one to mention, you know, on average, single family homeowners pay $3,901 in property taxes per year. And I know we have a lot of folks from Massachusetts here. I looked this number up last night. Um, and your average um, taxes for homeowners are actually $6,400. And for low home, low, income, low income homeowners, your property taxes can be an especially big burden for them. Um, but fortunately, every state in the country also offers some form of property tax relief for homeowners. Um, it could be for all homeowners or it could be for a subset of homeowners. So for persons over 65, persons with disabilities, veterans, low-income homeowners. And, um, and here's just a, a list of just laundry list of the different types of property tax relief programs you'll see in cities and local jurisdictions around the country. Just as one example, in Texas, we have a lot of really robust property tax relief programs for homeowners. We like to protect homesteads. Um, and so if you're a homeowner who's 65 or older or disabled in Texas, if you file for what we call a homestead exemption, 
you're eligible for significant discount on your home. You actually, um, your school taxes are frozen for um, as long as you live in your home. You qualify for special payment plans. And then here's the, the kicker, you're actually eligible for a property tax deferral. So that bars a tax foreclosure um, where you can't be foreclosed upon even if you fall behind on your taxes. Um, if you get access to that homestead exemption. Um, from other research, um, we also know that you know, these tax break programs really do play a big role in increasing a, a homeowner's housing stability and reducing their vulnerability to foreclosure. So just one of the studies on this slide here found that homeowners with a homestead, senior homestead exemption were 60% less likely to default on their property taxes. So I guess just the message I want to convey is that these programs are really important in helping heirs be able to hold on to their homes. But at the same time, there's been a lot of sort of references to some of this research that I've, I've been doing um, throughout the conference, but you know, the majority of states actually block heirs, property owners, and other co-owners from accessing these important property tax relief programs and protections. And there's two key buckets of legal barriers I'd just like you to walk away understanding. I'm just gonna briefly explain them. So first off, most states have proof of ownership requirements embedded in their property tax relief programs that make it impossible or very difficult for heirs property to qualify for one of these property tax break programs. Um, I've, we've seen state laws that say you actually have to have a deed in your name. Um, state law, there's a whole spectrum of barriers. Uh, we've seen on sort of the other end of the spectrum, states that recognize that yes, some homeowners have actually inherited their homes. They don't have a deed, but they require you to have a probated will, for example. These are just examples. Just, this is not an exclusive list. Um, but just some of the states that where we've seen these barriers. Um, at the same time, um, a lot of the state laws just don't speak to this issue at all there. Um, so as a result, we talked to the property tax assessors and the counties in these states that are administering these property tax programs and just found there's just very ad hoc approaches to whether and when and how they grant a property tax relief to an heir's property homeowner, uh, which is also really problematic. The second legal barrier is um, that, let me sort of change my notes here. Second legal barriers relate to issues with the heirs co-ownership status. So there's been a lot of discussion about heirs properties not having you know, access to clear title, but even if you have clear title, even if you have a deed in your name as an heirs owner, these are issues that you're going to face in terms of accessing a property tax relief program. And so what we found is a lot of states have, um, no, I didn't actually flip, put the states up here. A lot of states have just very um, um, different varying programs that serve as a barrier to co-owners and heirs being able to qualify for that full homestead exemption relief or that full um, benefit of that property tax relief program. So just one example here, I'm gonna talk about this Oklahoma program that is an issue in other states too. It was an issue in Texas until we changed the law. Um, but the heir living in the home qualifies for only a partial tax break on their homestead um, instead of the full exemption if the other heirs are not also living in the home. So if an heir is inherited as, let's say just an example, 25% ownership interest, they're only eligible for 25% of that tax break. Even if they're the only person living in the home and even if they're the only person paying all the property taxes, um, they only get 25% of that property tax break, whereas uh, a homeowner who owns it um, just as a single individual, not as heirs property, gets that 100% property tax relief. Um, here's just an example. We, we did fix the law in Texas um, several years ago, but here's an example of what the impact looked like in Texas before we passed um, this legislation. This is a Cedar Crest, this is an actual homeowner in the Cedar Crest neighborhood in Dallas. This is a historically African-American neighborhood, one of the few neighborhoods that African-Americans could buy homes in, in the 50s and, and 60s. And the heirs co-ownership in, in this case, it was a, an elderly um, person who had a 15% heirs co-ownership interest. Um, and this person's actual annual taxes as a result of only getting that partial homestead exemption was that their taxes were $2,117 whereas their actual taxes at the time would have been only $11 a year. And actually today this would be zero. Um, Texas just doubled its homestead exemption for homeowners. So today, if this person had had, had access to the homestead exemption, their taxes would have actually been zero. 
And just as additional background, at the time we were looking at this property several years ago, they had um, a, a, a total tax liability of $7,000. It looked like that they were about to lose their home to property tax foreclosure. Um, I'm gonna skip over the sort of other legal issues here. Um, so I just wanna, the good news is that there's a lot that can be done to fix this issue. First step, and I think one of the most important things is actually ref going and making sure you reform your state and local laws to remove these really problematic legal barriers. And I always tell people we could fix it in Texas, uh, which is sort of ground zero these days for conservatism. You can fix it in your state too. Um, and um, and you know, and that and, and in Texas, in the case of Texas, you know, it, this is picking up on sort of Thomas's points and the, the chat over lunch is that you can find allies in sort of unlikely. Um, places in, in the case of Texas, our biggest champion for the law was one of our most conservative senator, Texas senators who happened to be the former tax assessor for Harris County, which is where the city of Houston is located. So he knew what this issue was about and was committed to addressing it. Um, so what we did in Texas, just a little bit of background. So in 2019, um, my law students, law students and I helped draft a law that the legislature passed and it removed both of those legal barriers that I talked about. So now as an heir property owner, you get 100% access to the homestead exemption. Um, even if you have, if there's 90 other heirs who live elsewhere, um, if, you, if you're living in the home as your primary residence, even as an heir, you now get 100% of that property tax relief. And then um, second, we removed the barrier about around proof of title. So in Texas, you used to have to show a deed or some counties would let you file an affidavit of heirship in the real property records. Now there's actually in the property tax exemption application form, um, just a simple affidavit that the person applying for the exemption signs if they are an heir saying, hey, I, you know, I'm the owner of this property. And there's a couple of other sort of pieces of paperwork they have to file, but it's um, dramatically um, made a difference in removing the barriers. Um, the second thing is engaging with your state and local offices. As I, I mentioned before, you know, a lot of states just have ad hoc requirements. And so engaging and educating your local tax offices to make sure that they have the policies in place to support heirs. We found in Texas, even after we passed this legislation, it um, the, the local tax offices were not implementing it. So we had to do a lot of work on education and a lot of our local lead legal aid offices are still having to do a lot of work to educate the local um, tax officials and the front office workers about about these legal reforms to make sure that um, that they are um, implementing them. And then the third really big piece of this is community education um, and, and community outreach education and support. We found we found in Texas, even with this new law, that the majority of heirs property homeowners who are eligible to get a homestead exemption still don't have one because um, you have to apply. You have to affirmatively apply for the exemption. So there's just a lot of um, really important work to be done there in terms of that grassroots outreach to get the word out, not only about um, educating people about the importance of applying for an exemption, but actually assisting them with the process. We uh, just, um, so my last slide here, I just wanna give an example of one of my favorite community outreach programs um, that's doing work on enrolling heirs into the Texas Homestead Exemption Program, which is called ECHO in San Antonio. It's this very, collaborative grassroots initiative um, where they have, they started out mapping out all the homeowners in um, in specific um, zip codes, census tracts with a concentration of vulnerable homeowners um, and mapped out the homeowners. They got the data from their local tax office of homeowners um, that have no exemption or only a partial homestead exemption. And then they did, um, they trained community members, members of, of that community and they went door knocking um, and knocked on every door in that community to provide um, education resources, exemption paperwork, um, and, and, and then all sorts of other types of assistance as well. But it's just been a tremendous program and one of my favorite ones. And I think just as in closing, if you are seeing, um, if you hear of legal reforms happening around the country in this area, I'd love to hear about them. I'm trying to keep on top of what's happening in the state legal arena to, to, to eradicate these really discriminatory barriers in our states that heirs face in accessing these important property tax relief programs. And if you also just, if you know of, or if you're engaged in any community outreach in this area, I'd love to hear about it as well. So thank you so much. I'm gonna hand it off to the next speaker. Hi folks, I just wanna check, do people hear an echo or feedback of any sort? No? Okay, it's just, 
it's just up here. Okay. All right, good afternoon. Um, my name is Kate Dugan. I'm a staff attorney at Community Legal Services in Philadelphia. Um, CLS is a nonprofit law firm. We represent a variety of uh, low income homeowners in a, a pretty big variety of topics. We also do systemic advocacy. Um, I am specifically, I work in the property tax team, um, but I also do a fair amount of tangled title work. So um, I'm here to give you the good news from Philadelphia, which is a uh, a lot of the, the things that Heather said, you know, wouldn't it be great if this if this were how property taxes work? We have some of that in Philly. Um, so so there is there is some bad news. Um, this is sort of an overview of how tangle titles and tax delinquencies overlap in the city. Um, so as you can see, the neighborhoods with huge concentrations of tax tax delinquencies um, also are the neighborhoods with huge concentrations of tangled titles. Uh, if you're not familiar with Philadelphia, uh, these are also uh, predominantly black communities. Um, these are low income communities. And so, you know, there are a lot of maps that end up looking like this in Philly. Uh, so it's it's a real problem. And, you know, a lot of our clients are living in these neighborhoods. Um, and as Odette said, they're paying more than their fair share of taxes to begin with. Um, so a lot of these tax delinquencies are based on taxes that were too high. Um, these communities are being charged more than their fair share, uh, which you know is its own problem and also certainly exacerbates whatever would be going on if, if taxes were fairly assessed. Um, so the movie yesterday was so great and it was so great to see the law in action as it related to a person. Um, unfortunately, I have no filmmaking skills, so you get a PowerPoint slide. Um, if anybody wants to talk Eternal Polk into coming to Philly and making a movie, <laughs> that would be great. Um, maybe next year you'll get more than a PowerPoint slide. Um, but this is just a client I had who I think um, his story kind of shows off the, the pros and cons of having a tax delinquent tangle title property in Philly. Um, so Mr. D lives in the 1920s Philadelphia row home, like classic Philly house, like in all those pictures that you see of like the urban houses. Um, he's in the Germantown neighborhood, which is 77% black. Um, the home is in the name of his mother and she died in test state in 2004. She had six children um, until 2010. Um, people were coming and going, living in the property. Nobody knew to pay the taxes um, so the taxes just weren't getting paid. In 2010, there was a fire, and Mr. D actually moved up from down south um, in his 70s to fix up the property by himself with his own hands. I, I've been at his house. I have seen the work. Um, and A, that's pretty amazing. And B, it's because he didn't have access to repair programs because he wasn't on title. Um, so he fixes up the house. You know, he doesn't know to pay the property taxes. The bills aren't coming to his name. Um, and the city files a tax foreclosure. Uh, the balance is pretty high. He doesn't have the funds to pay it off. Um, and title is a little complicated for him because not all of his co-heirs are cooperative yet. Um, unfortunately, the timeline of a tax foreclosure and the timeline within which we can untangle title don't always line up. Um, there's good news for Mr. D, who did not lose his property to tax foreclosure because he lives in Philly. Um, and the biggest reason for that is the owner-occupied payment agreement. This is an income-based payment agreement available to both owners and equitable owners. And when I say equitable owner, that's just another word for tangled title. It's another word for air property. Um, and it functions to stop a tax foreclosure. Um, and when I say income-based, I mean that if you are a certain age or you have a certain income, your payments can be $0 a month. And that also involves significant forgiveness of interest and penalties. Uh, so if Mr. D ever gets on title and decides to sell his house, the amount he's gonna have to pay off in property taxes is significantly lower because a tax bill that's been sitting around since 2008 is going to have acquired probably more in interest and penalties than principal at this point. Um, so that's a huge tool we can use to help stop tax foreclosures while we work on title. 
And when I say we, I don't really mean me. Um, some of my great Tangle title colleagues from CLS are here. And so what I'll do is I'll get the, the payment agreement and then I'll send it over to our Tangle title team who now has less of an urgency, who now, um, you know, as, as somebody on the previous panel said, now it's, it's not like a tomorrow problem, it's a next few months problem, which makes it less stressful, there's more resources, um, and, you know, certainly a better timeline for the clients. Um, I will talk about it a little bit in the next slide, but a lot of the things that Heather suggested would be good policy goals um, in terms of tax relief, Philadelphia has. So Mr. D is actually in a lot of tax relief now, so his tax bill going forward is gonna stay affordable. Um, that $7.5 million that Philadelphia dedicated to Tangled Titles also includes a Tangled Title Fund, which is a grant of up to $4,000 to help defray the costs of untangling title. Um, the bad news in Pennsylvania is we do have an inheritance tax, where I think one of four states that still has that. Uh, so untangling title is especially expensive in Pennsylvania, uh, but that $4,000 does go a long way. That can pay uh, probate filing fees, it can help clear other liens on the house, it can go towards taxes. In cases where we need advertising, which is some of them, it can, cost the, it can cover the cost of advertising. Um, so that's a really important tool that we can, um, you know, somebody, the fact that somebody doesn't have that filing fee isn't going to be a barrier to them starting the process and, and starting the probate process. Um, the tax foreclosure in Philadelphia and Pennsylvania, um, just as, as a super brief overview, looks kind of like a judicial foreclosure. Uh, the city has to file a petition in court to ask permission to sell the property at sheriff's sale. So it's not a sale of the lien, it's a sale of the property at an auction. Um, you may have heard of uh, Philadelphia's first in the country mortgage foreclosure diversion program a couple of years ago, the court started a similar program for tax foreclosures. Um, and this is actually a picture of what that courtroom looks like. Um, so it's both architecturally beautiful and has lots of resources in it. Um, so all those people there are housing counselors, attorneys, there's a mediator in the room. So if you show up, if you are in tax foreclosure and you show up to that room, um, I'm there, my colleagues are there, and, and we start to talk about like, do you, are you in foreclosure? Do you need help untangling title? Um, and the court is not going to enter a sale order that day if you show up and you say, I'm here, I want time to untangle title. Uh, that gives us time to get you into that owner-occupied payment agreement, and then, and, and then you have you know, not as much of a fire to put out. Um, so these are uh, just a couple of the tax relief programs in Philadelphia. And, and I think one of the most important things we've done is um, in the definition section, which is the best section of any law, um, when we define owner, we mean owner person with an ownership interest. We mean equitable owner. Um, there are documentation requirements, uh, different ones for different programs, but generally in Philadelphia, for the purposes of tax relief, owner means equitable owner. Um, so we do have a homestead exemption. It's not as big a discount as Texas because our state law limits how much our homestead exemption can be. Um, it, it reduces the accessible balance, uh, the accessible amount by $80,000. So that's, that's about an $1,100 savings on your bill. Um, heirs can qualify for this. No proof needed, just an affidavit. Uh, it's technically conditional, although I've never seen the city go after um, a property, I, I think they just, once you're in the homestead, you're in the homestead. Um, the senior freeze, so Mr. D, for example, um, is now in his 80s and uh, has low income. So even though he's only an equitable owner, and even though he's only, uh, you know, probably a one-sixth equitable owner, he qualifies for the full senior freeze, uh, which freezes his tax bill. And uh, two years ago, we actually got retroactivity on this. So not only can he freeze his tax bill at this year's amount, he can actually freeze it as far back as the 2018 bill or any intervening year, as long as he would have been eligible in that year. Uh, so if the outreach the city does didn't get to him, if he didn't know about it, if he you know, didn't have a computer to apply, if he was homebound, um, he can still get the benefit of a lower tax bill uh, because Philadelphia reassessed its properties a couple years ago for taxes, 
um, neighborhoods saw an average of a 30% increase in assessments, although a lot of those neighborhoods uh, that were dark red and dark blue um, saw like 300% increases. So people's tax bills went from a few hundred dollars a year to a few thousand dollars a year. So the senior freeze, especially retroactive, became a critical tool for people who just don't have the budget to throw an extra $4,000 a year tax. Um, one, one little con of this is you can inherit somebody's tax freeze bill. So if you are living with an elderly parent, they die. If you would have qualified, you, you have to reset. Um, we also have a long-time owner-occupant program. It's designed to protect people from those 300% increases. Again, it is, it is available to equitable owners. Um, it's a little finicky to qualify for. There's a lot of math involved, which I'm not gonna subject you to. Um, so the most important thing though is at the bottom. So that senior freeze that I talked about, you have to be 65 and above to qualify. Our city council a few weeks ago uh, introduced a low income freeze bill, which looks like our senior freeze, and is for anyone of any age uh, within income restrictions. Uh, and the first thing we did was uh, call city council and say, you mean equitable owners too, right? Um, and since we're copying and pasting that definition section from other sections, from other tax relief, um, it's, it was like almost a no brainer. It's like, yes, of course we mean equitable owners. And of course those, those documentation requirements are gonna be reasonable. Um, so, Bad things do happen in Philadelphia. Um, not too many bad things, but uh, so payment agreements require a good faith effort to get title within three years. Luckily, uh, coming to community legal services counts as a good faith effort. Uh, but you know, if you just get one of these owner occupied payment agreements and do nothing, the city can uh, try to declare you a default of that agreement. Again, it doesn't happen that often, but it's out there. Um, Title is gonna be hard to resolve for Mr. D. We haven't done it yet. Um, and that makes me think, what if Mr. D's mom in 2004 had access to estate planning? What if she was able to come and sit down and, and, and again, have an attorney who was dedicated enough to say, do you really wanna leave this to six kids or do you want a different estate plan? Um, so that's, you know, it's something to think about and, and hopefully when and if we get him title, uh, we'll sit him down and say, here's how you prevent that from happening again. Um, repair programs, as I mentioned, uh, it's been a real challenge to get those and houses do not wait to deteriorate while we're untangling title. Uh, I can stop a foreclosure, but I cannot stop a hole in somebody's roof. Uh, the other quirk here, I, um, I know, <laughs> There have been a lot of talks about people owning thousands of acres of land. Uh, we don't have that in Philadelphia. Uh, but Mr. D has a small backyard of his row house. It sits on a separate tax parcel. Um, we actually have a lot of these in Philadelphia. So he does have a land problem. Um, that parcel is not available for tax relief. So it's a huge, um, huge challenge for us. And I'd love to, to you know, pick everybody's brains about land-based tax relief. Um, the last thing I'll say is this ethics issue that has come up for a lot of us um, also weighs heavily on me because all those maps about tangled titles, all those like all that great data about you know where the vulnerable populations are, um, we see a lot of real estate investors use that information. Um, those we buy houses, home investors, um, people who are selling predatory products like after you record a deed. Um, they're, they're definitely targeting that information and it's, it's something that's on our mind. Um, and you know, on that um, kind of sad note, I will hand it over to Andrea. Hi everyone, Move that up a little there. All right, hi everyone. I'm Andrea Bob Stark from the National Consumer Law Center. I'm a senior attorney there with Odette. Fun fact, Odette and I are both graduates of BC Law School. Yay. <laughs> Any other eagles in the room? All right, David. <laughs> All right, so we're going to talk about property tax foreclosures and constitutional issues. Very exciting. Uh, and policy recommendations if you don't live in Philly. So 
Who here has heard of the Supreme Court case Tyler v. Hennepin County? All right, so good number of you. Okay, great. So you heard from Heather what the property tax foreclosure process looks like. If very simplified version, if a homeowner does not pay their taxes, uh, a town can seize the property and put a lien on that property. If they don't pay their taxes within a certain amount of time, the town can sell that property. And some states, some municipalities, when they sold that property, kept the full sale proceeds regardless of how, many ta how much it was owed in taxes. So if somebody owed $1,000 in taxes, and the property sold for $100,000, the municipality kept that full $100,000, regardless that there was equity in that property and there was a surplus after the taxes and interest and fees and penalties were paid. Well, the Supreme Court said in May that that was unconstitutional, that a municipality cannot keep that surplus value. So they would have had to have returned any amounts over the tax amount due plus interest plus penalties plus fees which really can add up anything over that they would have to allow the homeowner to have access to that so the case came out of uh, a woman geraldine tyler who was 94 years old when she fell behind on her property taxes she moved into a senior community the county taxing authority took her property subject to a three-year period where in which she could reclaim it and pay the amounts owed plus interest fees costs. Uh, she couldn't do that. When she failed to do that, the property, uh, the, uh, the property was transferred to the county. She owed at that point about 15,000 that had ballooned from just a, a few thousand dollar debt and she couldn't pay the 15,000. So title transferred to the county. The county then sold her property for $40,000 and kept the extra $25,000. Minnesota, where she was, did not have any law in place, still doesn't, that allows access for a homeowner to get that surplus, to collect that surplus. And so the Supreme Court said, no, that's unconstitutional. You can't take somebody's property. You can't take that money because that's somebody's actual property. And so there's still, there are over 12 states in the country that still allow this to happen. We call it equity theft because essentially it is stealing the equity um, when the tax sale ha happens, if the municipality keeps that. And there may be more than 12 states because certain states have different procedures they use that really do uh, create such a burden so that the homeowner can't access that surplus equity. And this leads us to an opportunity. So these 12 plus states are looking at their tax foreclosure laws. They have to comply with the Supreme Court order, the Tyler order, but many other states are also looking at their tax foreclosure laws to make sure they are in compliance, to make sure they are providing uh, just compensation when that property is sold. And so the door is open now for us to try and get in some preventative measures. So all of us here are trying to prevent this from happening, prevent the loss of these homes. And so how are we going to prevent this from happening? We have, uh, you will have access to these slides, um, I believe next week. And this is actually the what states can do is a hyperlink to uh, an issue brief that we have on our website. Um, that gives some recommendations. I'm gonna go through some of them quickly now. We also have a page on Tangled Title and Heirs Property. We have some amazing reports on there, some research that's been done. So nclc.org, and you can go there and search Heirs Property, Tangled Title, Property Tax um, Foreclosure, and we have a whole host of information there. Uh, so, as uh, Heather and I believe Kate might have mentioned, um, the assessments, uh, tax assessments have historically been um, inaccurate, not done on a regular basis, and they have caused inequities in assessments, 
particularly to black neighborhoods and black homeowners who pay higher taxes than their similarly situated white homeowners. And it causes homeowners in declining growth areas to be overtaxed in a way that subsidizes the housing that is increasing in value. And so a solution to that, trying to get these preventative policies in place, is to require, have municipalities require regular assessments. Some towns haven't done assessments in five, 10, 15 years. And so that property value is not going to be accurate. And that is going to be reflected on the taxes paid. And then if they do an assessment after 10 years, that value is going to have increased quite a bit and then the homeowner is going to be hit with a huge tax bill so trying to get regular assessments in place industry standards um, also uh, odette had mentioned that uh, the appeals process um, communities of color don't access the appeals process because it's confusing it's overwhelming so uh, a, a simple easy, efficient way to access an appeal if you don't agree with the assessment of your property. Notice is a huge preventative measure. So we are advocating for notice um, for all homeowners who are going through the tax foreclosure process, who fall behind on their taxes. What are their rights? What are the options available? What are the um, abatements that are available, the exemptions available to them. How do they access these exemptions and abatements? Just notice throughout the whole process in English, but also in uh, the language, the, the three major languages or most common languages in that community. So at, allowing language access for homeowners as well is super important for notice. And notice at the foreclosure stage. So getting notice out to homeowners when is the foreclosure sale? Where is it? How can they prevent this? What rights do they have? What are their redemption rights to reclaim this? So getting the information out to the homeowners, this can all be put into policy. What are the notices that need to be provided to homeowners and when? This can all be put into legislation. Um, Every state, as Heather said, have exemptions or abatements that people can access to reduce their property tax bill. But do they know about them? A lot of homeowners do not know about them. So again, trying to get the notice out, but also creating more exemptions, particularly for, for the most vulnerable populations like lower income, older adults, veterans, providing uh, more exemptions for these populations so that they can stay in their home and prevent the loss of their home. Payment plan, so a lot of older adults who are on a fixed income, uh, they're not able to pay taxes in two huge lump sums uh, a year. And so allowing, requiring municipalities to accept payment plans to prepay those taxes on a monthly basis can be a huge game changer for many lower income folks or folks on a fixed income. And then allowing payment plans to repay the past due amounts. Uh, the redemption period, I've mentioned this a couple of times, this is a time period, it could be a year, two years, three years or more, where the homeowner has a chance to reclaim the property, but they have to pay the taxes due in addition to fees and interest and penalties potentially. So reducing those interests, the interest rate can be in the teens, 16, 17, 18%, sometimes in the 20s, the interest rate can be just extremely unaffordable and create um, a snowball effect where no homeowner would be able to afford to repay that during the redemption period. So building in meaningful redemption periods, a meaningful amount of time, but also uh, being able to waive some of that interest or lower that interest rate. And specific to heirs, uh, some preventative recommendation, heirs who have not yet filed for probate are at risk of tax foreclosure. We heard Heather talking about this. We heard Kate talking about this. They may not realize that they need to apply for available tax relief or may not be eligible. So ensuring that if they are living in the home, they're entitled to the same tax relief as that deceased homeowner was entitled to, or at least as any other homeowner without having to jump through all the hoops and go through probate and provide a deed but allowing them to provide other documentation to show that they are the rightful owner of that property. And notice, personal service to, the, to heirs if it's owner-occupied. 
um, requiring the state to conduct due diligence in locating heirs, including searching land records, court records, other, other governmental records, and online records to find heirs. Um, and regarding Tyler allowing access to the surplus in general, um, again, we want states to be putting in place notice requirements to let homeowners know they are entitled to the surplus proceeds if that home goes to a tax foreclosure sale. They can get that equity. They are entitled to that. And how can they get that? And then maximizing that equity. Some states will just sell it uh, to an investor or on the side for just very, very pennies on the dollar. But we're advocating for an open market real estate agent sale to begin with, and then having a public sale, a high bid public auction, if it doesn't sell through a realtor, just to maximize that equity and keep some of that wealth within the families. Um, and then easy access to the surplus. Some states are proposing uh, a very burdensome process right now for homeowners to jump through hoops to even before the sale happens for them to anticipate there's going to be a surplus to try and figure out the taxes owed versus the value is there going to be a surplus and then put in a motion or a claim we don't want an opt-in situation here that's too burdensome for a homeowner who can't afford their property taxes and is potentially about to lose their home so it should be automatic they should have an entitlement to this surplus and they shouldn't have to jump through hoops to get it um, specifically for heirs on the surplus access when your state is looking at the how to fix the Tyler problem you want to make sure they're keeping heirs in mind heirs who are the rightful owner of that property are entitled to the surplus and again they shouldn't have to go through probate which is a long expensive process they shouldn't have to have to provide a deed with their name on it in order to get that surplus if they are the rightful owner they're entitled to that surplus so making sure there are provisions in place that allow them easy simple access to that surplus um, and then we have a suggestion for multiple heirs you can take a look at this if there are multiple heirs um, one suggestion is a presumption that the heir living in the property can accept the proceeds but that's a re rebuttable presumption if there are other heirs that say no way i uh and come forward and say i'm entitled to this as well then that that then it doesn't all go to the occupant heir um and one last thing i know my time is up but uh we also think these surplus if if no owner comes forward to claim the surplus proceeds there can be a provision in the in a statute that says they go to the state's unclaimed property uh, program and so any owner can come forward including an heir if they find out years later oh that property sold and there was a surplus they can access it so not having it go back to the municipality but having it in fact be accessible by heirs and other owners years later okay All right, as always, please say your name and where you're coming from, and please keep your question to under 30 seconds. Oh. Hi, I'm Genevieve Fajardo from St. Mary's in San Antonio, and I'm so glad we have National Consumer Law Center because I have a consumer protection question. Are you guys working at all on tax rescue firms? And the best way I can describe it is, I've had a lot of people come in who have had property tax issues but have gone to a tax loan firm to resolve it rather than access in Texas a lot of these uh, resources that we have to protect homeowners. And I wonder, is there any work in that area, particularly from the consumer protection um, side? Oh, there we go, I got it, I got it. You know, we haven't heard a lot of that happening in our communities, but we would love to hear more about it. Um, what I have heard are some, uh, you know, wherever there are vulnerable homeowners, there's going to be scammers. And it's just amazing what they come up with. Um, if, if we shut down one, they come up with something else. And so I have heard that there are firms that are saying they will fight an assessment um, and the assessment amount and try and get the assessment down 
and so that will lower the property tax amount and you know, I don't, I don't think there are many legitimate <laughs> firms doing that. And so I imagine it's the same, but I'd love to talk to you more about what you're seeing and if any others are seeing that as well. We like to keep our finger on the pulse, so that would be great. Thanks. Thank you. Um, Valentina from... Um Texas a and University. I just have a very practical question um, for Heather. Um, for Heather. Um, if, when you were mentioning about the um, homestead tax exemption and that if the person was 61 years old or old, 61 or older, that they could get more tax redu reduction, if it's heirs property, can it be any of the heirs if they're 61 or, or older, even if they're younger heirs, obviously in the in the heirship applying for that extra reduction on the taxes? So, um, yeah, so that's a, a, a good question. So in Texas, um, and I, I mentioned that you know, each state has its sort of own brand of property tax relief program. And Texas has one, all homeowners are eligible for a homestead, what we call a homestead exemption on their primary residence, which entitles them to lots of different great um, tax reductions. Um, but in addition, then if you're 65 or older or have a disability in Texas, um, you are eligible to additional benefits that I you know, talked about um, earlier. And um, wait, and now I've already like done what the first part of your, the, what your question was. Oh, yes. So if it's heirs property, um, then if you're the only person living on the property, as long as, if you're, if you're the only homeowner living on the property, if, as long as you're 65 and older, you qualify. And I cannot remember, to the extent you have multiple heirs living on the property, let's say you had four heirs living on the property and only one is 65 and older, I don't want to misquote the statute. I believe that you still, as the heir, can qualify, but I'd have to go double check the statute. But this is that barrier I was talking about that exists in a lot of other states where um, a lot of um, states have what are called circuit breaker programs, which is another huge protection for heirs, homeowners, or any homeowner um, where you don't have, there's a, a circuit breaker on the amount of property taxes you pay that's tied to your income. So if you're low income, there's um, a limit to what you pay in property taxes is one variation of it. Um, but one of the barriers that heirs face is there's an income eligibility requirement for that. And in a lot of states say, well, every heir has to meet that income eligibility. So if you're the only, again, the only person living in the home, you're paying all the taxes, um, you, it does, you're just, your income alone doesn't matter. Um, you have to go and like report the income of all the different heirs, even if they're not actually contributing to the property taxes. So this is a, a national barrier, but the Texas specific question was a really good one. And like, I just can't remember the, exactly how that works in the statute. Hi, Heather. It's nice to finally meet you. Uh, I'm Rosalind uh, from Austin, uh, Texas. Uh, heirs' property among African Americans in Texas often involves historic property. Given Austin's rapid and extensive growth, property taxes have increased exponentially over the past decade. The Texas State Historic and Archaeological Site Exemption, Form 5122, administered by the Texas Comptroller's Office, reduces property tax by up to 100% on historic and archeological sites. The tax uh, exemption was justified by the legislature as a way to save historic sites burdened by exorbitantly high property tax bills. Given your work with the homesteaders exemption, are you willing to work with owners of historic lands and historic and archeological sites to utilize the historic and archeological site exemption for the purpose it was intended. Um, that's a great question. And are you, I'm familiar with what I, um, which is called the historic property exemption. So is this a similar, is this the same exemption that you're right. referring to? It's a specific exemption. It's yep. uh, designator is 5122, 5122. Okay. 
Uh, it's administered by the Comptroller's Office, and it is called the Historic and Archaeological Site Exemption. Yeah, I would I would love to visit with you after after this um, convening to definitely learn more, because I the exemption I'm familiar with, I'm not as sure as the exact same one that you're referring to, but um, I'm especially interested in learning to what extent there would be barriers for heirs to qualify for that, and if that would require state legislative changes, I would, you know, let's, let's have a conversation. I will look forward to that. Thank you. Hi, I'm uh, Matt with the Center for Community Progress. Good to see you guys. Um, and thank you, what a great presentation. Um, quick question, um, maybe more for you, Heather. Uh, I know that uh, several years ago, uh, Michigan enacted their poverty tax exemption, um, which for people who live below the poverty line is a full exemption of those things, right? Um, but there was an, also an argument, a subsequent argument that that should have been applied retroactively. And so as we're talking about the homeowner exemption, I just wondered if you might be able to comment just a little bit on maybe both the practicality uh, and the possibility that some of these exemptions for some of these families that maybe it didn't exist previously, they didn't know about it, maybe could be that exemption could be applied to the previous year's taxes uh, or payment or some other way. Yeah, um, thanks for raising that point. And I know that and Andrea can speak to this as well. That is um, a, a big legal barrier is that lack of retroactivity. So, um, and there's two different ways that that comes into play is one is um, the person, the, the deeded owner, um, homeowner passes away. And then, I mean, there's a lot of stuff you got to do if they are to like, you know, you've lost a family member. Um, and and um, you know, last thing that is on your mind, even if you're aware of it, is to go update the homestead exemption and put it in your name. Um, so there's um, several issues there. As one is, um, there's a risk that the taxing jurisdiction will actually penalize you if you're the the new owner, the heir, and have it come in and notify them that hey, maybe you're eligible for a general homestead exemption, but not the over 65 exemption anymore. So there's some penalties that can come into play with that. And then there's that issue of that the, the lag time. Um, and, and, and the lack of retroactivity. In Texas, there is some retroactivity for the homestead exemption um, where it is retroactive, and I think some other states allow for that. But someone mentioned, I think it was earlier today, there's this issue of though that you, so in Texas, I mentioned if you're 65 and over, this, your school district taxes are frozen um, as long as you are the homeowner. But the problem is when you pass away, it's reset. And there is no retroactivity. So even if the heir, the person living in the home, is also over 65, all of a sudden um, the ta the it's it's reset. So even though it's, the taxes are frozen moving forward, um, you can be looking at a, this is a huge issue, a really big hit in in property tax burdens. And in Texas, this is a big issue in our urban areas that are growing rapid, undergoing rapid gentrification um, and growth. Um, where we've seen properties in Austin. Um, in historically black communities that used to be um, 20 years ago, um, you could buy for 50,000 that are now valued at um, one to $2 million. Um, and so your, the property tax burdens are significant, but and so without that property tax freeze, it's a, it's a big driver, of, without it being retroactivity, a big driver of vulnerability. And, and having recently gotten limited retroactivity in Philadelphia, I can say that it was a really big lift. Um, it is one thing to convince your city like, tax relief going forward will cost this much. Um, and when we when we asked, like, can you make it retroactive? The, the response was like, that was two years ago budget. We don't have the budget. We can't administer refunds. Um, and so it just becomes a much bigger ask. So I will say retroactivity in Philly, you get the benefit of the lower tax bill, um, but we did have to, you know, in a, in a slight concession, um, the law also says that you don't get a refund for the intervening years. Um, you know, we, we wanted that, but it was just budget-wise, especially since um, our school district is severely underfunded um, and half of our property taxes go to the school district. Um, it, it was just, it was a non-starter. Um, and so I think the how much does it cost question is, is a real barrier, like even in Philly, so I can only imagine other places. So, so folks, just we very quickly, have, oh, okay. uh, go ahead, Andrea, yeah, we, we do have to wrap up. Yeah, just very quickly, we do have treatises in our home foreclosures treatise does have an appendix on the property tax exemptions available in each state and the property tax foreclosure process in each state. So we're offering a 20% discount for all of you here um, if you want to access those. And then just very quickly, we have some trainings coming up. If you want to learn more about this issue and other consumer rights issues. So, thank you. Thank you so much, folks.
I was born in the Republic of Panama and I now live in New York. My father bought the house in 1979. It was a very lovely, quiet neighborhood. He really enjoyed being there. After my father passed, I was suddenly surprised one day when I received a letter from the Department of Housing telling me that there has been a transaction on my deed. So I went down there and found out that someone had placed their name on the deed. They sent me to City Bar Justice. Fast forward 50 years, and now you have these homes that are worth millions of dollars. So those are the sorts of homes that are ripe for predation. To come to your house and have a sign on the door that says private property, and when you call up the number on the sign, have the person on the other end say, I am the only one who owns this property. By the way, can I buy your interest in the property? But they do it, and they're usually successful, because most people in these cases cave. But our clients from the beginning refused to settle. They wanted to fight it. Tell me a little bit about what happened. Truthfully, I don't know exactly what happened. Not at all. One day I'm cleaning up the house. Next day there's a lock on the door. All I know is I'm arguing with some people that say they own 50% of the house and I just don't understand how. I need to stop this because it's destroying something that they don't understand. You're up against a party that as if the court does not exist. But you're affecting not just me, but my whole family. The City of Our Justice and our Homeowner Stability Project, we are really focused on keeping those communities intact. And a lot of times they're lifelong homes, and it's incredibly upsetting. It really had a tremendous impact on me. I think we have an ally on the stance, uh, the impact this has on me. You're helping people reclaim their dignity. And so what, is, what does that family home mean to you? Everything. It means foundation. Where... No matter how far you go, you can always come home. But unfortunately, there's no home now. It's still rocky, but it's easier because we have somebody backing us. Thank you. And as they always say, or often say, we're saving the best for last. We appreciate Mr. Thomas Mitchell. We have to say that to keep you invigorated in this last 45 minutes that we have with you. Um, and I'm just gonna, we're gonna jump right in. We're gonna really talk about this issue more in the urban context. Uh, my name is Nefertiti Jackman and I'm coming to you from the city of Austin, Texas as the city's community displacement officer. And I'll be moderating uh, the panel with, uh, I'm gonna start with introductions. Uh, Genevieve, and I will read, uh, I'm gonna read these to you because they've been here. We have great speakers and I wanna hear, want you to hear the background and experience that they each bring. Genevieve Fajardo is a clinical professor at uh, law at St. Mary's University School of Law in San Antonio, Texas, another Texan. Uh, she teaches the real estate clinic and deposition skills 
and co-directs the Institute on World Legal Problems in Innsbruck, Australia. Austria. Uh, the real estate clinic is a transactional practice focused on preserving home ownership. Uh, student attorney attorneys draft real estate documents, negotiate airship disputes, and plan estates, enabling low-income homeowners to remove clouds on title, access repair assistance program, and protect property wealth for future generations. Prior to the real estate clinic, uh, she directed a litigation clinic focused on deceptive housing practices and marginalized communities, especially evictions, home sales, and mortgages in South Texas. We also have Christopher. Uh, Christopher Smith uh, is a community development officer with LIS in Jacksonville, where he co-directs the Family Wealth Creation Initiative and creative placekeeping efforts to advance economic growth in urban core neighborhoods. He has over 25 years of experience in philanthropy, public sector, and community development. He designed and launched the Heirs Property Program in Jacksonville, Jacksonville, Duval County in 2021. We also, next we have James, let me go back up, sort of, uh, James, uh, he is a lifelong resident of Philadelphia who has spent most of his career in public service on behalf of the city of Philadelphia, James Leonard, I apologize. He has served as the commissioner of the city of Philadelphia Department of Records since 2016. As a commissioner, he serves as the recorder of deeds for Philadelphia, manages the city's records management program for all departments, administers the department's public access to records program, including the city's historical archives and oversees the city's printing and binding center and a official city photographer. Uh, prior to being appointed commissioner of records, he practiced law in Pennsylvania for approximately 17 years with a focus on real estate transactional law, mostly at the city of Philadelphia Law Department. We also have Octavia Howe. She helps manage uh, Pew, Pew's Philadelphia Research and Policy Initiative. She leads the initiative's housing research portfolio, which explores how poverty and local economic trends affect the availability, affordability, and quality of housing in the city. Her research on cost burden, tangled titles, home purchasing trends, and rental code enforcement highlight the myriad ways that residents face challenges when seeking to secure and maintain safe and affordable places to live. Uh, prior to her time at Pew, she worked for the Philadelphia City Planning Commission where she focused on geospatial spatial analysis, community engagement, and housing. And she's a native of Philadelphia. And Scott, finally, you've seen a lot of uh, Scott over the last two days. Um, Scott, I didn't ask you how to pronounce your last name. How do you pronounce Konowski. it? Konowski. Thank you very much. She's a general counsel at the Center for uh, New York City Neighborhoods, previously directed the Homeowner Stability and LGBT Advocacy Projects at the New York City Bar Justice Center. In his role, he trained attorneys, supervised cases, placed with pro bono and staff attorneys, provided direct legal representation to distressed homeowners, and engaged in law reform to preserve housing and communities. His areas of expertise include foreclosure, defense, heirs property and community stabilization and deed death and scam prevention and litigation with an acute focus on racial equity and social social justice across the communities so with that we're going to get started uh, because we have a great discussion most of the conversation has focused on rural properties today uh, but we're going to start with octavia and she's going to tell a little bit about her work, the work that she does, and begin with uh, defining for us Tangled Titles. Thank you, and thanks for allowing me to, to be in this audience to share our work. Excited to see what you all have been doing. Um, as Nefertiti mentioned, I am working with the Philadelphia Research and Policy Initiative at Pew, and we focus on Philadelphia. Philadelphia is our lab. We look at all kinds of issues in the city, and housing is one, one area we've been focused for a long time. 
one of the challenges in Philadelphia is, you know, disinvestment, abandonment, and as a part of that, we were really interested in this thing that we had heard of or that I had heard of back in 2007 called Tangled Titles. And at that time, there were about 14,000 Tangled Titles in the city, and I wanted to know, was this problem getting worse? Um, just to be clear, um, so, so we set about a research project to really identify where Tangled Titles were in the city. To be clear, there's lots of ways to tangle a title. Um, tangled titles are not quite the same as heirs' property. They're very, very, very closely related. But um, you can end up with a tangled title if a, a property owner passes away and, and the heirs don't go through the full process of conveying that property through, through probate or, or whatever other legal means there are to, to transfer their property. But it also could be as a result of deed theft or a uh, rent to own agreement gone wrong and just other legal things that can cloud the title. So it's really that challenge to the title is the thing that we're focusing on when we're talking about tangled titles. And so in order to quantify that work, um, we actually did a process where we were able, Philadelphia has great records, so we know every parcel, who the owners are, um, and we had a wonderful um, records department that shared um, ownership going back many years. But what we were able to do was to look to see if the owner of record was had passed away. And if they had passed away, and um, we actually looked at all the owners of record to see if they had passed away, and we used that information to determine whether or not um, there was a living heir at that home. And if there was not, we determined it to be tangled. Um, and so we found, to my surprise, there were about 10,000 tangled titles in Philadelphia, 10,400, so less than that number back in um, 2007. I can give you my theories about that, but we didn't dig deeper um, onto why the number was smaller. Um, but really, that, ac that accounted for $1.1 billion in housing wealth. And um, the map was shown a little bit earlier today, was like the blue map on this side. Those are the areas of the city that if you show a map of poverty, if you show a map of race, if you show a map of all the things that you, you kind of wish that the city was doing better at, that's the same map that you see for Tangled Titles. And so in those areas, you have $1.1 billion of wealth that's really locked up that people aren't, weren't able to access their housing wealth. Um, and we also found that it would cost about $90 million to resolve those titles. Okay, I guess we'll go down. Uh, well, we go to James, since you're also in Philadelphia. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you to Professor Mitchell uh, for inviting us from his friends, now his friends from Philadelphia. We met a few years ago, I did, along with our then Register of Wills. Um, we had a virtual conversation with Dr. Mitchell. Mitchell, and we, we hadn't realized um, until we started that conversation, and now this has expanded um, today, just how prevalent the issue was and how different it is and diverse the issue is um, in a, from an urban setting to many other areas of the country as we've learned um, over the last few days. So I thank you all for, for that and we're looking forward to the friendships and networks that we've, we're establishing here. Um, you know, a, a recorder of deeds office like us, which in, in Philadelphia is a big operation, we record a few hundred thousand documents a year, hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. Um, we meet people not unlike some of the attorneys and the other panels uh, talked about who do this sort of work in the trenches. That's where we experience people with tangled title. In fact, most frequently, I would say we experience folks before they even get to the attorneys. Um, it's most common that uh, folks show up in our office or in our uh, record or our register of wills office. Um, and they confuse both of those um, because this is all a confusing process for most people. Um, and they're there, and what they know is that they're at the family home. Um, parents most likely are, have been, are deceased now, and they're there to what most commonly they tell us is to change the name on the, to their, to put their name on the deed. And for most people, um, who are unfamiliar with what is really a complex and pretty esoteric legal process, probate and uh, property transfer, um, more often than not, they believe that that's really a matter of coming up to sort of the clerk's desk in our office and having us sort of make that change. And only to find out that there's a much, much more complicated road that they have to follow that's very unfamiliar, costly, et cetera. And the problem that we experience and the folks 
find themselves in is that they're they're they didn't just appear in our office that day by chance. They're in most likely in crisis. Um, they may have lived in that property, as many of you know, for decades or maybe a number of years, and 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 that was fine. And nobody up to a certain point, they paid the bills, they paid the taxes maybe, and they never heard anything. And at some point, a crisis comes along, and they need to access, as Kate Dugan said, for example, and others, um, a local government program, whether to assist with taxes or what have you. And they're confronted with the potential, whether it's a sheriff's sale or otherwise, or liens of potentially losing the house. And they can't access those programs because of their, quote, tangled title, as we call it, in Philadelphia. So um, we do a lot of work that I'm sure we'll talk about with community groups um, and our legal services community to help with that. But there is a role, and I hope to talk about it a little bit more as we go along, that local officials, like a recorder of deeds or register of wills, have to play in this process, even though we might not be the first people you think of that would be um, part of the advocacy process, part of the community outreach process. Thank you. And Scott, we'll stay on the East Coast and go with to you, and maybe you can also tie in the video. Yeah, certainly. Um, yeah, first of all, thank you for having me here. I'm just humbled by all the brilliant people that are in this room and on this panel. And it's just really great. So thank you for allowing me in this space. Um, so I was at the City Bar Justice Center in New York City for about 13 years where I directed a homeowner stability project. And it started off as foreclosure defense, but then we greatly expanded it to do everything that threatened homeownership in New York City. Um, and so we did a lot of deed theft work and a lot of scam prevention. And that's when we really first noticed um, the, this predation on Ayers property and kind of tied it all together. And that's how I connected with Promise and, and, and we got this law reform uh, enacted in New York. Um, so that was, uh, you know, that was all direct legal services. Uh, we worked with a lot of pro bono counsel, um, a lot of just direct representation of um, at-risk homeowners, distressed homeowners. Um, I recently changed jobs about five months ago. Uh, now I'm general counsel at the Center for New York City Neighborhoods. And so it's a, it's a much different role. Uh, I no longer do direct legal services, but what we do is we administer programs and grants. And um, I mean, I wanna turn the organization to sort of like the, the hub for all things heirs property in New York. Um, but just an example of some of the things that we do is, you know, we just uh, dispersed the half a billion dollars of federal COVID relief funds to homeowners in New York. So we were the subrecipient of that, that state contract. And so we did that in the form of 17,000 um, forgivable loans over a five year period to distressed homeowners. And they were, uh, I, I can't take credit for this, it was all, but it was all part of the thinking when we, we structured this program. Um, you know, because of tangled title issues and these heirs property issues and the fact that these issues primarily affect communities of color, you know, historically black neighborhoods, that sort of thing. Um, we were very conscientious in making sure that this government program, this aid was available to individuals who are sort of, sort of historically left out of these kinds of government programs. And so, the, so instead of, you know, we, we administer these other programs like home repair programs where the city is very clear on, you have to have clear title, there can't be any issues, there can't be any clouds in title. But here, if you showed any sort of interest at all, uh, ownership interest, potential ownership interest in a property, and you occupied the home, then you qualified for these, these loans that were up to $95,000. And so we had homeowners, like we had one client, or not, was when I was at Legal Services, uh, a client who she lived in her grandmother's condo apartment. Her father was drug addicted and had disappeared. And nobody knew where he was. And he would be the heir of the grandmother if he was alive, but we couldn't confirm that. And under most programs, she would have no relief, even though she was a presumptive heir. And um, she was in distress and she needed these funds because she was affected by COVID. But because of the way we structured that program, she was able to get the full grant the full loan and preserve that housing. And so we're very conscientious about just overcoming these systemic barriers that have kept, you know, historically black people from really accessing the full benefit of, of these programs. So that's just kind of a broad idea of what I was doing, what I'm doing now, and how 
heirs property mingled title effects on this work. Okay, can I, if you don't mind clarifying, um, what type of dollars did you have? These federal dollars, you say? Yeah, this was all federal COVID relief money that came out of the pandemic. And you guys used the funds specifically for, you said homeowners had access to these dollars, but what was it for? For so anybody, so it's all the, the, it was the New York State Homeowner Assistance Fund and every state had out, had been allocated uh, its own grant. New York, because we were so heavily affected by COVID, we got probably one of the biggest grants. And so it was half a billion dollars. Um, and so anybody who could demonstrate um, any, you know, uh, effect by COVID during the pandemic, any loss of income, any distress, they could apply for that money. And so then we went through this whole application process, but instead of doing full title work, confirming that they have full ownership of the property and all these other things, we, we cut through that. So we got rid of the administrative expense and the, the time delays and all of that. So we could just get dollars to the people who are most affected. And, and as we know, black communities in New York City were mostly affected by COVID. Thank you for that clarification. Um, and we'll head south. We'll go to Christopher. Okay, um, hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Christopher Smith with LISC. Um, so I'm gonna come at it a little different. So from the funding angle, um, our work is at a CDFI. Uh, so we were looking at how to move capital into under-resourced neighborhoods, right? So from that standpoint, I'm thinking about what transactions can generate transformation, okay? And so, um, Taking a um, page from Ryan's uh, sort of language, instead of a data sandwich, I'm thinking about a funding sandwich, a capital stack. And so that looked like for us, um, United Way playing a role because United Way is into wealth building, housing security. So where might United Way uh, support this work? Even in looking at the current tax preparation programs, we've been talking with United Way about how to piggyback onto that where folks who were coming in to get tax prep could also get information about state planning and um, referral to legal services. So one is United Way, consider them. Second um, is your local place-based or your community foundation. Um, we found them to be ready allies for supporting this work as well. So early seed capital could be your United Way as well as your local community foundation. Third, um, we've been looking at um, CRA, um, and using uh, heirs, uh, property, housing, counseling as eligible CRA activities so that banks now can engage. And uh, to that end, one of the things I'd encourage you to look at is um, ACA modernization, American, American Care Act. So wealth, uh, well-being can be tied to wealth. Um, and so you can make the argument that hospitals can invest in estate planning and heirs counseling as a way to help stabilize and extend lives in and around hospitals. Um, I think the last one is uh, around housing assistance programs. It's been mentioned in other panels today, um, but in Florida, like most of your states, you've got CDBG, but we in Florida also have other pools of money. One is called SHIP, and everybody's got an acronym. This was State Housing Investment Program. And that allows for 15% carve out for housing counseling. We broaden that definition to include heirs counseling. And so now um, the state can fund through their county, local um, estate planning and legal services through their housing counseling funding mechanism. So I guess the message today for me is that there's a funding sandwich to be figured out through a combination of state, local, and private resources. Thank you, and Genevieve. Are these on? Okay. Um, I'm Genevieve Fajardo. I'm a clinical professor at St. Mary's in San Antonio. What I thought would be useful for me to talk about today is just this practice in the urban context and what our law clinic looks like. And then I thought also I'm gonna proselytize for a minute we started our real estate clinic in the fall of 2023. I know Howard University is also doing a similar clinic. And I feel like if you guys have ever seen birthday in a box, I've got clinic in a box for you. We can create any level of tangled title, legal clinic, estate planning clinic that you want 
with a lot of the client retainer agreements, thoughts about who the client is, thoughts about the title reports, title opinions, and all the work that you need to do. And if you think, well, I don't want to be like a copycat at my law school. I mean, they're already doing that at Howard and St. Mary's. I'd say they're doing a family law clinic at every law school in the United States. They're doing an immigration law clinic at every law school in the United States. We can absolutely do a real estate or a tangled title clinic at every law school, and it doesn't matter. And please take everything that I do and copy it, and I would be so flattered. Um, so how did we start the real estate clinic? I've been doing a lot of housing-related litigation throughout my career. I've been at St. Mary's since 2008. I should say about St. Mary's that I think makes it very distinct. It's a Hispanic-serving institution. It's the undergraduate population. I mean, I should have looked it up before I came on a panel, but I'm going to say like about 85% Hispanic students. The law school is actually over 50% Hispanic, and it's the southernmost law school in Texas. So we serve both the urban population in San Antonio, and we also reach out to the Colonia areas, which are about 2.5 hours from San Antonio, the Texas-Mexico border. Some of them are about four hours. So one of the things I was thinking about in the urban panel is that we do what I would call single family home clear titles, and that the law looks very similar, whether you're inside San Antonio or whether you're working in a colonia, as long as you're working on a small single family owned property. A lot of the law is the same and can be transferred between like an urban law clinic that's in New York City to somewhere out in a rural area, as long as you're using the same principles of working on single family properties. So quickly, what we do in our clinic, we have a three prong representation. One, we look at if someone comes to us through who has a tangled title at clearing that title through whatever methods are available to us in Texas. It's like affidavits of heirship generally and getting deeds from hopefully helpful family members, some limited litigation if we have to do so in order to clear the title. At the same time or right after we go to the second prong, which is to give people property tax counseling information as Heather Way was describing, and in fact, has really been instrumental in creating a lot of relief for property tax um, for homeowners in Texas, we can use a lot of those resources to stop foreclosures without any type of court intervention. So we do house homestay exemptions and property tax counseling. And the third thing, and people have mentioned it here, and I wanna say it's really critical, we do estate planning as the third prong to look forward and not create heirs property in the future. And I will just tell you when I'm proselytizing, again, based on Texas, you want to do probate avoidance more than I'd say estate planning. So what can we do with these families to avoid the probate, the cost of probate and the probate process altogether, but pass along their homes, um, be able to pass along their cars and their bank accounts. So we work on probate avoidance. For students, it's an incredible opportunity. Um, in terms of we were talking about, you know, cross-cultural lawyering, being culturally sensitive to clients, working with clients, learning real estate law, they might come in just having a general interest in real estate. I'm going to tell you all seriously, I think I'm like the Young Republicans Clinic. Like everyone comes in because it's the real estate clinic. And then they leave caring deeply about heirs' property and tangled titles in San Antonio. And I absolutely love that. But I will say the name of the clinic itself sort of brings in the people who are really interested in the title industry in San Antonio. Um, I just, the, I guess the last thing I'd say, and I think is, is maybe obvious when you're creating one of these clinics, is to have community partnerships. We work with a community group that has hundreds of people who have tangled titles where we can draw clients from, and that's been instrumental. Can I mention one thing? Because Genevieve brought up a good point. Um, I also need a shout out to Heather because we um, took some of the research and created a property tax certificate redemption assistance program. So we did some data scraping in the property appraiser's office. Anybody that had two years of arrears, we then created a list, especially owner-occupied households and likely heirs households. We took that list, did outreach, we paid we redeemed their tax certificates on behalf of that household with no um, ownership interest so they could avert home loss due to tax auction sale. So one of the things I would say, Thomas, to come out of this, we need more tax redemption programs. We need more funding for that to get, 
to buy time for the pro probate litigation to kick in. And it also built some goodwill, okay? And it's a cost effective. So we spent uh, a little over $100,000. We've essentially saved 40 homes, okay? So. I think that's excellent. Before we go on, I want to I want to stick to the money part for a second because I heard oh yesterday and today people are concerned we need more money. I mean there are a lot of resources here, but the piece that is often missing missing is the funding to go along with this. I think someone mentioned if you don't have the dollars, you're just looking at a project, right? There's a project that you're dealing with, and um, I'm not going to focus on the work that we do. But in Austin, it was community members who demanded money and funding to set up a displacement prevention office, right? In 2020, uh, a vote was passed, so we have $300 million to invest into an array of programs that I have heard over the course of the few days that different cities have. And so we are aware of the federal dollars that although sometimes limited, what is still the case uh, in Austin as well. But when you have local dollars, you are so, um, you have a lot more flexibility in how those dollars can be programmed. So I will say um, there's some still, there's power that still exists that we can get from community activists and members to bring the dollars and local governments, you can institute programs uh, at a local level. So I wanted to highlight that. Um, I wanna, anyone can start on this question, really just looking at your work, what are some of the ways that you have attacked or see the need to attack some of the systemic problems or root causes to address some of these challenges and issues? In our uh, in our the recorder's office, um, again, it's not it wasn't for me anyway. Uh, I think for a lot of people, it wasn't traditionally a place you would thought you would come to for policy changes or advocacy on what we call tangled title. Um, but we started to play a larger role in that. I think several things we we we've, we've done. Um, the first was outreach and education. Um, there was clearly a need for that in Philadelphia. I think everybody here who's from Philadelphia agrees with that and, and takes part in that that outreach. Um, my office goes out, so the Recorder of Deeds office goes out and we'll really go, I go anywhere, I go anywhere to speak where anybody will have me. Um, we go out and staff tables at community events in churches, at police department, district community meetings, faith groups, um, you know, we we work with, uh, for example, um, black sororities and uh, black fraternities. Um, funeral directors in Philadelphia, for example, are a trusted community partner um, in our black communities, and I'm sure in other black communities throughout the country. We work with them to spread, use them as a way to help spread information um, to folks, sort of meet them where they are at a time when they're they're. Um, they're focused on on their their deceased loved ones, and um, so we look. I said a lot of community outreach, and then we also focus on potential legislative change, whether that's at a statewide level. And for a lot of great ideas here, um, over the past few days, that give um, I think all of us from Philadelphia a lot of hope for some new new avenues we can take there. And then um, the other thing I would say is to push. People in offices like mine, again, who aren't don't maybe first come to mind. We have a lot of influence, I think, whether it's a recorder. We're in, like, there's a recorder in every county in the country. Um, so wherever there's a tangled title or heirs property, there's a recorder I think who should care about it because we care about property records being um, accurate. And um, so I would encourage you all to push us in offices like this and engage with us to be partners in outreach, reform, um, any areas like that. And and uh, and I think you'll find a lot of willing participants. 
Sorry, I'll go ahead. Um, yeah, and, and I have a very different kind of response. Um, and for me, it, it was just a complete change in the way that I practice law and I think about problem solving and approaching the issues that we were confronting with our distressed clients on the ground. And it's, you know, because I was a dirt lawyer, I was trained as a dirt lawyer and things have to be very precise and accurate and everything has to be clean and tidy and tangled title is not that at all. It's very, very messy. And you're dealing with all kinds of family issues, you're dealing with scammers and predators and you know, loss of income and just all the things that happen to people in their in their lives. And and so it was having to like switch my brain to be more flexible and creative in solving these kinds of problems. And 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 sometimes you're not gonna get a perfect solution. Like th this is what this is the problem with our whole mortgage finance industry. You know, it's like they're not gonna insure you're not going to get a title insurance policy unless you can perfectly clean up this 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 title on this home, and so it leaves a lot of people in the lurch, um, and you know primarily the communities of color, and and so you know that that change in just the way that you practice and the way that you look at problem solving, it, it's it's to address that, and so for, you know a lot of the, the 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 practice changes that I incorporated were things I, I borrowed from the scammers, for example. Um, you know, like they would approach an heir and purchase a fractional interest for a small amount of what it's really worth, and then they would get a, 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 a deed in the land records, and then they bring a partition action, and all these bad things would happen. And, you know, when, we, when I started running this, the, the, my project, we are like, okay, well, you come into my project, and if you don't have a really quick, easy, resolvable issue, and you have all these, like, family members who are fighting with each other and that we can't help you. Like when you get all your orders, your, your affairs in order, come back to us and we can try to help them sort this out. But that leaves so many vulnerable people out of, 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 of you know, this solution, this problem solving. And so, so what I would do is we developed this entirely new practice where, okay, we can record a fractional deed, an airship deed. We don't have to go through the probate process. We can avoid surrogates court. Well, in New York, it's surrogates court. That's our probate court. Um, you can avoid, avoid court and just get somebody's name into the land records. You can start tolling the statute of limitations for adverse possession. Like, there's all these really creative things that you can do as, I guess, really as a seasoned practitioner um, that addresses, I think, these problems in, in, in non-traditional ways. So I think the thing I'd add is I like to remember we're one small player in town, so really working with the other community groups has been essential in San Antonio. And so something I was mentioning is they've just developed, and this would be specific to the size of the city, they've just developed a homestead prevention center within San Antonio where the recorder of deeds, the tax assessor, the community groups and the legal will all be in one place and accessible to the community. And I think that's a very good um, effort on the part of the community to get everyone together and just recognize, and I think as law schools, sometimes we like to think that we're, like I said, the big player in town and we keep away from the community groups. And I think just remembering that we're one part of it to help them, I think is, is helpful in terms of, of creating systemic change in the town. Maybe a yeah, um, for me, I think one of the things that I think about, not of what we do, but a frame of mind, and one, one of the ways I'd like to see us think about the work in Philadelphia um, is a lot of the properties that we showed you, that Kate um, showed you, they're also places that were gentrified, where they've gone through generations of systemic oppression. And right now, so much of the work, because Philadelphia is a poor city and you're dealing with people who are living in communities that have been disinvested and we don't have a huge tax base, a lot of the solutions are focused on um, people who are owner-occupied, low-income individuals. But in reality, there's a broader you know, group of people who are impacted. There are people who moved across the city line or did the thing that you expect or that we talk about doing. We do better, we go to college, we move out and make more money. And so you're not eligible so for support. And in Philadelphia, we're one of those cities that's beginning to see um, pressures on development. Like you talked about having tons of vacant property in New York in one time and, and no more. We still got tons of vacant property. We still have tons of places that are disinvested. Um, 
But when a, a developer comes in and presses on that land and presses on that title, um, there isn't a resource for a person who doesn't qualify, doesn't check those boxes of owner occupied, low income um, person to extract the wealth for themselves, for their families. And so I think thinking about not just the person who's there, but really the, the people who've come before who were able to access home ownership and, and were never able to realize it, but their heirs are still out there as a potential recipient of, of help. I'd build on that, uh, Ortega's right. So one, it, what's systemic about our approach is we're looking at this as anti-racist work. That's number one. Two, given that um, there's an overlap between former red line neighborhoods and heirs concentration. So we've mapped it, it's obvious. It's also true that um, you're seeing non-owner occupied rates go up where you have higher uh, increases and upticks in heirs, uh, heirs concentrations, okay? So um, just if we do nothing else, we've got to stop the bleeding, okay? So the, the other layer for us, at least in Florida, is corporate institutional activity. And so for us, we've got to get in front of these transactions that are, are below market in these neighborhoods where people are buying these homes at 30, 40 cents on a dollar, whether it's buy for cash or whatever it is, okay? Second thing I'd say is um, private dollars have got to be brought into this system because LSC stipulates that these legal aid organizations can only support or help folks at 120% or below. That doesn't hit everybody in our neighborhoods. It needs to be at least 200% if not higher, 300% or below, okay? Because then you're getting a wider income stratum for folks who are multi-generational, who may have a little bit of wealth, but still aren't able to afford the legal services, but need the help right away. So I'd say LSC, increase the income limitations, or we need to get more private dollars into that, okay? Last thing is um, consider heirs property concentration like a form of blight. So we went after Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention dollars and were able to make the argument that increases in heirs will likely increase blight. And so we got funding from OJJDP to now support legal services to prevent blight by helping people with estate planning and probate litigation. Okay, and thank you. Finally, Many of you have been doing this work for a number of years, and you've learned a lot along the way. Um, as we share, you share your concluding thoughts. Um, this is a question that Chris wanted us to reflect on. If you uh, knew what you know now, what would you have done differently when you started this work? And Genevieve, we'll see. I hate to say this, I would go slower and I would take fewer cases because I think there was such a need when we started even, it was really a year and a half ago that we started with a 200 family wait list uh, for this one organization. I think that I was rushing through the cases so much that it was, it was causing me to have a lot of stress about whether we were correctly doing the title. So I think unfortunately, it, once it gets to the legal, side and it needs an attorney involvement, you have to be very careful and you have to accept that it's gonna go slow. Yeah, I, I'd say we would take our ego out of it as an institution thinking we know how this works and start with the people most affected and having them design and lead the work. The legal can come after, but if we don't get their buy-in at day one, then it really doesn't matter what the transaction is. So trusted, credible, embedded, charismatic messengers who are most impacted need to be supported and, and, and guided through this process all throughout the entire time. That's what I would do different. I, I agree with everything you just said in that regard with sort of bringing trusted partners into the process. And I think what I would have done sooner, I think, is start to have thought more about what offices like 
leftover quarters offices or similar offices that touch heirs property or tangle title could do not just at a legislative reform level, state, local, which becomes its own, um, can be a heavy lift, but just what you can do policy-wise or procedurally or by regulation in offices like ours. And um, that's something I wish we had started sooner. We started, we're doing it more now, but there's a lot, uh, you're, I think that local offices that maybe they don't know it, but I think if they talk with trusted partners, they'll hear a lot of ideas because I have. Um, but there's a lot I think we can do in local governmental offices from a reform perspective that can be impactful, but don't have to reach to the level of legislation or, and they're just easier lifts. It might be a regulation, it might be a policy change. In our office, we waive um, recording fees, which in Philly are almost $300 for a deed. We waive those for um, folks who are recording a deed to untangle their title. And we've been doing that for quite some time. That's an easy thing. It makes a difference. Um, but that's something we can implement at a policy level in our instance without a local legislative change. I have two things. Um, one is realistic and one not <laughs> that I could have done. Um, I mentioned it was 14,000 tangled titles back in 07 and 10,000 when we looked. Um, I wish that there would have been a way for me to benchmark all of those tangled titles. Um, they're in parts of, or there are areas where we expected to see them um, that have since gentrified. And so I'd love to have been able to draw a stronger connection to what happened to those properties. It wasn't our research, so I couldn't have done that. Um, with our research, what I would have um, liked to do is have noticed and sounded an alarm a lot sooner about inheritance taxes in Pennsylvania doesn't apply to everybody. But for us, that was the second largest and very significant cost to clearing title. And like for, for the simplest case, it was, you know, several several thousand dollars or a few thousand dollars to clear title if it's just one one generation of heirs and is frequently many generations of heirs. And so really being able to sound the alarm on that, I think one of the things that's been humbling is that our research has been a part of the catalyst in Philadelphia to getting people to notice what, you know, public, you know, our lawyers have been sounding the alarm, but when Pew wrote this work, things started to move. And I wish we were also saying, hey, the inheritance tax is an issue whenever you're going through probate and it would deal with a lot of those households who don't qualify for, for services. Yeah, and I think for me it would be to really focus on the preventative side of this. And instead of just being reactionary, when there's a lawsuit and just having to defend um, a partition action and trying to, to navigate all that because that's so resource intensive. Um, and you know, you can only, as a single lawyer, you can only take on a few of those cases at a time. Um, but there are so many tools out there to prevent the creation of heirs' property or to address um, heirs' property issues as as you see them. Um, you know, like Tina Nelson at AARP in DC, like she turned me on to the transfer on death deeds. Um, so we just got that introduced in New York, that legislation, and it should be law in New York by May. Um, there's all these tools like that, um, other things that you can do, estate planning, estate planning light, not like wills and trusts are, you know, they're, they're, those two are expensive, that those can be resource in, intensive, but there are estate planning light tools that you can, that you can implement, that you can, that you, that you can put into place. Uh, airship deeds, we, we create a whole new practice area in New York, all the legal service providers of just getting these airship deeds recorded, prepared, like I said, avoiding surrogates, probate court, um, just focusing on the preventative side because you can be much, much more effective, I think, just um, dealing with the scammers and the bad guys. With that, we're gonna open it up for questions now, I told you. <laughs> Thank you guys. And can we give the panelists a hand? Thank you. Hi, I've got a question from the online audience. We, we still got over 100 people. But this is a follow-up for Christopher from LISC about his ja LISC Jacksonville project. Uh, regarding the, uh, the funding sandwich you described, what were the specific services that it supported? And second part, was there preceding research to identify the number of title issues or homeowners 
who needed assistance. I think I missed the first part. Second, the funding family. Um, is it used for? What services did it yeah, support? So, um, in a nutshell, three parts. Um, and this was said before, find, we gotta find them. So we needed the data team to help us find um, likely heirs households, preserve them. That was the legal side. So we had to support uh, legal services locally. Um, and then um, support, and that was the property tax issue, the state planning issue. So essentially, we were, think of us as um, an ecosystem supporter, and we sub-granted our team members to activate different pieces of the plan, all right? Our role was to aggregate the resources, to bring the sandwich together, and then move the money out quick, okay? Can, can I just say one other thing? The administrative discretion isn't to be um, taken lightly because that is a systemic opportunity. Within a lot of these housing assistance programs I can speak to, there's a lot of administrative discretion and it's how they interpret eligible and, uh, criteria and eligible uh, um, applicants and activities that is subject to that person in that chair um, sort of view of the world. And I would encourage us to be more aggressive in engaging people in the public sector around how they might see heirs counseling and heirs work within their portfolio. If I could just give a super quick example of that, and it's changed a little bit, but in San Antonio, they were requiring to get a repair that anyone who had an interest in the property must reside in the property period. So even if you had permission from someone who was an heir um, outside of the property, unless they resided primarily in the property, you couldn't get repairs. So that was really an impediment to getting repairs in San Antonio. That was by their interpretation, right? So, yes. Um, all right. Do you guys know what I'm gonna say? <laughs> Do we have any new friends that I have to say this for? No? All right, great. Thank you so much. Uh, JC Alabama, I, I have two quick questions. Number one, at, this is so good to hear about the recorder of deeds, like, like you being active in the administrative role, having that administrative discre discretion and using it to help these very disadvantaged people. How do we get like in a state like Alabama, where the city clerks and the probate clerks and the tax, tax assessor's office are in bed with the developers, to be frank, and they know them and they have rapport with them, I, I'm curious as to your thoughts of how we can bring them all together to kind of educate them on this, these issues. And then my second question is, when you're talking about counties and cities that have certain strategic plans, which is like development, you know, it's always development, um, how do we get the local officials and organizations to give the funding when they're telling us that what we're doing is in, it's in contrast to their strategic plan of development? Because we, when we went and did our training, Kara, Ryan, me, Portia, and Dr. Zabawa, they, they basically said, look, we're, we're uncomfortable doing this work because we're gonna get pushed back because this is in contrary to our development strategic plan for the city and the county. So it's a twofold question, I guess. I think with, with the second one first, with respect to funding uh, in Philadelphia, we, our local legislative body, our city council appropriated about seven and a half million dollars a few years ago, a year ago or so, 22 to specifically to Tangle Title. And I think, um, I think one of the reasons I would venture a guess that that was successful is that it, it fit in in that instance. People, not, not me particularly, but people were able to make a, the case that it fit into the larger strategic plan that in that instance our city council was pursuing, which was something they called the Neighborhood Preservation Initiative, which had, um, which was a lot of things. It was a big capital uh, bar, bond borrowing that they were, that our council was authorizing. And it was really to address all sorts of 
um, housing issues, whether that's affordable housing, gentrification, except many other things, including, and somebody, they successfully, some folks successfully made the case to include Tangled Title or Heirs property in that and fit it into that larger strategic plan. Um, and, you know, I even do that with what we do locally in our office, like recorders to go, to, for example, to the discretion of administrative officials, recorders tend to not have a lot of discretion, right? We're sort of like ministerial in the sense that, you know, you hand me a document, we check if it meets state law recording requirements, and if it does, I have to record it. But, but within that, within that role, our challenge was to find areas where even within that ministerial role, where could we adjust policies that wasn't inconsistent with our role, but adjust our policies and procedures in ways that could be helpful or meaningful. Um, to bring people, I would say to your first question, to the table, um, if they're resistant. I mean, I know in, in Philly we've been, I think, really successful in my mind There's in using a more of a neutral um, third party. In our instance, I always think of our local bar association, the Philadelphia Bar Association, for many years has convened. The one I participate in most frequently is a, a fraudulent conveyance task force. So, property theft, which is related to Tangled Title. Octavia alluded to it. Um, we have a big problem with that in Philly. We could have a whole panel on that. Um, but a neutral third party like the Bar Association in Philly has been successful in bringing a lot of stakeholders together, local, uh, local officials, state officials, um, law enforcement in that instance, the courts, um, local law schools, all the legal services, our legal services friends, and then including the title insurance industry. So they're there regularly. They've been there for years. Um, they're a good partner. They they don't their interests don't always converge um, with the group, but that's okay. And they're going to be a constituency that's going to care about reforms one way or the other. So it's better to have them at the table. So we try and bring. We've done it, I think, successfully in Philly by using, in this instance, outside a more neutral art group who can convene a lot of diverse stakeholders. And, um, you yeah, know, I mean, we meet regularly and it's been quite productive. Okay. Uh, I see a couple of other questions. Okay. We only have time for one more question. Um, One is sad. Two people are sad. They have questions. I'll just throw that out there. But <laughs> hi there, Jill Apter. I'm a law student at Michigan State University. I also am a research fellow at the National Agricultural Law Center. Um, for the past year or so, I've been working with the Ag Law Center on a 50 state heirs property survey. Um, we should be publishing that this summer, some results from that. And I'm so glad to see and hear that the recorder is part of this conversation. And I know that there's at least one state that does have a statutory, um, excuse me, statute in place that allows heirs to complete a derainment process and then fill out an affidavit of heirship that would get recorded with the recorder's office and then passed along to the tax assessor's office. And I wonder, is that on people's radar, or what um, could that be on people's radar? I mean, it's basically an airship deed or an airship affidavit, right? And it's just, you know, somebody who can show that they, well, somebody who can swear or sign an affidavit stating that they have an ownership interest through intestacy or something like that, and then preparing a formal deed and recording it in the land records. I mean, that's, it's, there's different approaches to that same issue that's happening all over the place. It's just every state talks about it in a different way. Hey, Nefertiti, the more interesting question for me is the uh, prevention side. So we looked at senior exemptions in Lodomod census tracts. And what we did was then paper them with the state planning resources so that folks who are likely to expire may or may not have an heir now have an opportunity to actually get some estate planning done. 
The only thing I was going to add, you can definitely do an affidavit of airship in Texas, but I would say in terms of like speaking with community groups, it's also important to talk to title companies and title insurers because they will have some commentary on what you're doing. And especially if you can find some partners in that area, they can sometimes give you a caution that what we're doing to try to like put together title and fix it up might not be the ideal way to do it. So I always say make sure to be talking to the for better or worse, talk to the title industry um, in your state as well to know and make sure that you're doing things appropriately for the clients. So Nefertiti, you referred to that there were two people who, okay, who are those two people? You gotta give me your sad, sad dog look. All right, who else said, no, only two more questions. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, I, I know you too well. Like, I think it's this gentleman right here. Yeah. And then somebody. Right okay, here's the thing. You got to ask a question in 30 seconds, and the response can't be more than a minute. Okay. Cassandra, okay, you get, I'll, I'll throw you into. No, he goes, oh, let me get the applause. Thank you. I, and I will be quick. Um, I want to, I want to touch on what, what Christopher and Octavia talked about, which is, the people who have who have moved out and moved up, and and the 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 sell to the localities that might want to do something about the, their properties and help them because I'm I'm looking at this from a from not a necessarily a wealth preservation but from wealth creation opportunity, and that's not necessarily an easy sell, particularly if you're talking about black people, <laughs> right? That just don't necessarily want to help black people create wealth, and so I, I want to know is 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 it compelling enough? Do you think it's compelling enough to to address the uh, housing affordability preservation in neighborhoods that are that are gentrifying? Is that enough to get to get resources? Yes. Yeah. That's my bias. I've already. <laughs> well, it's multiple things. I mean, it's it's like uh, it's all these efforts to get black homeowners into the market to begin with. But it's also preventing loss of black, black home ownership, and so there's different ways of looking. At it. I think it's. I think it's. There's some narrative building that still needs to happen. People are talking about wealth gaps, and I think that really thinking about what does that mean when you go beyond just the people who are living in poverty, because especially in a place like Philadelphia, there's a myopic um, focus on people who are currently. Thanks. It's a quick one. Hi, I'm Sarah Shiganti from the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston. Um, uh, just a question for Octavia. Your comment about benchmarking got me intrigued. Do you have any plans to, um, you know, do a follow up and compare results? And also, how do you think about like what indi what outcomes you're looking for? Plans, not yet. I'm, I'm continuing to um, keep this top of mind for for the people who get to decide what we're gonna do. I think ultimately we'd like to do another look back and we would have that benchmark data. So that's something that we're interested in. Um, we probably won't be the ones to talk on the, the inheritance piece just because our focus is Philly, not on the state. And so. So I just really wanna end by thanking everybody who made this conference possible. I've mentioned staff repeatedly. Um, I've mentioned our speakers and our panelists, but I'm also just excited by this like incredible group of attendees. I mean, this is, I think, the best gathering at an academic institution of higher learning of um, you know um, conference or symposium, other type of gathering. I mean, just the richness and the diversity of folks in terms of where you all came from, I mentioned 31 states in the District of Columbia, what you all do. Um, we have landowners and heirs property owners, folks who are in the private sector, the public sector, um, all the different types of universities, Ivy League, land grant, HBCUs. Uh, it's just created a tremendous amount of energy in the room. And so I really wanna thank you, I was a little worried because initially we were going to have it at the law school and the attendance outgrew the law school. Then there was a place on main campus, but we outgrew that. 
And this is kind of a little island, so you're not on. So I was thinking, oh, are people going to be disappointed because, you know, during the breaks, they're going to go to the cafe or some other site. But I actually think that being here together kind of really built a sense of community. Um, and actually, the facility is, like, really nice. Um, the one thing I did want to mention, I forgot when the, I did the fireside chat with the dean, and she said, well, how did you come across it? Okay, it's true when I was applying for the fellowship, I I think I was at the Library of Congress or something. I stumbled across some article that said, but I, I didn't really know what that meant, but it, it tied it to the significant land loss. I think it was uh, highlighting Hilton Head Island in South Carolina. But it was in that volunteer work that I was doing with that center at Wisconsin, the Land Tenure Center. And one of the things they asked me to do, this was when the black farmers uh, class action lawsuit was being settled. Uh, so there was a proposed settlement and then they were having various meetings, and that center, as one of my volunteer things they asked me to do, was to go down to this meeting in North Carolina of black farmers who were discussing the proposed settlement, um, and so like be like a goodwill ambassador. So I went, and at the time, the media was framing the settlement of the Pigford case as reparations for black Americans, and it was universally portrayed as this awesome historic settlement. I go to the meeting and the black farmers are upset. And so they, I'm not, I'm like kind of confused. And so they tar start talking about the settlement terms, that $50,000 that won't buy you a use chapter was what 95% of the folks got. And so that wasn't really played up in the media. So I started understanding, but during the break, somebody had identified me as an attorney from Wisconsin. And it was during these coffee breaks that three or four families came up to me and they said, we really need to talk to you about this heir's property. And you know, initially I really didn't know what they were talking about. And then they kind of explained it and they're talking to me about how the law impacts them. And I'm confused because in law school, that's not how we were taught that this tendency in common and partition work. And I'll be frank, I had a bubble inside my head that said, you know, as I was nodding and being all polite, I was thinking it's kind of sad that they're not very sophisticated and, and not educated because clearly that's not how the law works. But I did say, you know, listen, when I get back to Madison, you know, I'm going to do some research and, and I'll get back to you. And I actually did do that. I went to the law library, read every first year property casebook, every treatise I could get my hand on, and nothing that they said was validated. And I almost wrote them a letter saying that, you know, I did do the due diligence Unfortunately, your understanding of the law is incorrect, and here's how the law works. But then I was kind of stopped in my tracks by two things. One is I realized the, the passion and the conviction when they were telling me this in North Carolina, like they seemed like 100% sure. And then the second thing I remembered at the last minute is some of them said either they had cases that had been concluded or there was some ongoing litigation. And I was like, well, if there's court orders or judgments, that would be definitive. So I wrote back to them and I said, you know, for the subset of you who have cases, please send me some of the court records. And I think they showed up in a manila envelope about three weeks later. I got them from my box, went to my office, still deeply skeptical, and then I opened them up and I started reading through them and every single thing that the families told me was validated. And at that moment I realized there's this whole alternative legal system that works for these disadvantaged, disproportionately black and brown folks that has not been taught or even acknowledged in, in law school or legal training, right? So it's like something that I often describe as it was flying under the radar, but hiding in plain sight. And so the reason I say that, it's the value of doing community engagement work. We've heard that from many folks about how we as kind of professionals oftentimes learn as much from the folks who are coming to us for assistance. And um, so I think, I think that top left, I think that was the meeting that I was at. Uh, the second thing um, I wanted to say is that, you know, sometimes, you know, thank you all for the nice comments. I, I do appreciate them. Um, you know, I think when the dean and I were having our colloquy, she's like, like what are, are some high water marks? And, you know, sometimes by nature that question is about, is about an individual thing. So like, hey, I got invited by the NFL, right? But, but at the end of the day, the, the work I've enjoyed the most is the work I've done in coalition and teamwork and partnership 
with like an amazing group of people like in many states across this country, sometimes manifested in coalitions in particular states that we formed to try to get the UPHPA enacted into law, whether that's been in Florida, Virginia, or South Carolina, or New York, um, or California, wherever it's been, right? And I've been so fortunate in that work to, to meet just an incredible number of just deeply passionate, highly intelligent and skilled people, right? And many folks are in the room. I can't start calling people out because then I'm gonna leave somebody out. Um, and then there's been other kind of work I've been fortunate to do in building different programs for students that um, equally involve kind of teamwork. And then just other folks who have gotten, I've gotten to know who've invited me to be part of their communities. So I just wanted to say that, you know, to me at the end of the day, it's really that teamwork and working just with an awesome group of very diverse, very skilled, very passionate. I mean, I think you saw the passion brought with the lawyers in the trenches panel, <laughs> like that kind of passion. Um, that's just been, you know, I, I feel remarkable to have met people of that quality and to have um, been able to work with them in a number of different ways. Um, and the last thing I just wanted to, so I, the one thing I didn't mention that I should mention is about our, the initiative. So when I came here last year and we found, founded this, the, the idea was to try to address some of these issues in a holistic, comprehensive way. Um, and so essentially I just wanted to just kind of set forth the four things that we're trying to do in terms of our initiative. Um, and, you know, just to be transparent, uh, Boston College has been awesome. Uh, that's why I'm here and I moved. You know, but I'm also the reality is I'm dealing on three years of seed money. So I'm also trying to both sustain this and to build it up. Um, so, whoops, I thought, it's funny, it's on my screen, but it's not projecting. So I'll let Sam do this. So I'll just let. So as she's working on it, let me just um, describe the four things we're trying to do. So one of them is we're trying to train law students and other professional students to have greater capacity to work on these you know, really challenging property and land use issues that are disproportionately impacting these, these disadvantaged communities. In terms of the training, one of the things that we did just last year is we developed a whole concentration for the students to guide them in terms of curricular choices, in terms of real estate and community development law, kind of writ large. And so there's, there's a number of uh, courses and some of them don't obviously scream out real estate, like there's the wills, trust, and estate class. There's tax. Um, and so the students are just going to get more competency in working on these matters. We've then layered that with some externships where for the students to get experiential learning at a variety of organizations, including nonprofit housing organizations. We've created one with the Massachusetts Association of Realtors. We're, gonna create, we're working on creating one with the um, the attorney, state attorney general's office. So Sherry Reva, I think, left, but she's the senior advisor for economic mobility and opportunity. And then our last one to pick up on Genevieve is we, if we could get funding, we want to copy Genevieve's <laughs> clinic and have a clinic that does, um, you know, property preservation and estate planning. The so the idea in terms of our legislative and policy laboratories, I often tell people um, in terms of you know, the work I've done that the Uniform Partition of Heirs Property Often Act, and I, and I might have mentioned this yesterday, yes, I think it's independently has a lot of value, but I think one of the things that's valuable about it is before that act, it was widely perceived that you just couldn't have these types of legislative changes. So why even try? That everything was structural, there was no agency, and so what I hope we've done is puncture that myth. And, but there's a whole slew, and you guys have heard 
just a wide range of outstanding ideas in terms of legislative and policy reform at multiple levels. We'd like to be um, a source of generating additional ideas and getting them out to, to be discussed about and, and, and potentially uh, become law. In terms of our research prong, so right now it's manifesting itself and holding a gathering. This is kind of the, you know, the annual crown jewel of the big conference, but then during the course of the year, there's smaller workshops and, um, and other, I know that um, uh, my wife, who's a, who's a housing expert, is gonna be doing a couple of um, housing panels um, and, you know, but we'd like to do if we, if we had some additional staff is to actually be engaged in some of the research. And there's been so many issues that folks have brought to my attention. Um, but, you know, until we have some staff, that's, that's kind of a limiting factor. And the last thing is just kind of, is, is this important of, uh, importance of kind of community engagement. Um, so we're also, you know, one of our first efforts at this, we just uh, put in a grant proposal the other day. Is to do is to work here in Massachusetts with um, kind of a statewide organization that is the Massachusetts Housing Collaborative, and some of the things they do is uh, training for first-time home buyers, but they don't have an estate planning kind of element to their curriculum. So we're hopefully going to work with them on that if we ultimately get this grant, and then also do some community legal education um, about kind of estate planning, will making, and then we would partner with Harvard University's. They have a, uh, a legal clinic that right now is doing estate planning with veterans, but they're very anxious to expand that demographic that they're working with. So anyway, this is, this is kind of comprehensively, I, I felt like I should actually, since our initiative is sponsoring that, say something um, about that. But once again, let me just um, thank just everybody who came, I'll, I'll say some of the things that I found really exciting just observing you all was that there were people who had folks in their network, some they see regularly, some they hadn't seen in a few years, catching up. I saw folks who just met people at the conference and the number of folks who were huddled in groups of two, three, four, all over the place, kind of uh, introducing themselves sharing their experiences, you know, making plans to continue to stay in communication. I mean, I think that was one of my deepest hopes for this conference is that it would be a source of folks getting together, collaborating, getting to know each other. Um, and I saw that happen in spades. Um, so I'm like really pleased that y'all got to know each other. Um, and so, uh, I kind of wish you, uh, you know, safe travels to whoever is home for you. Uh, we are going to continue. Oh, I'm, not, I'm not sure exactly what our theme is for next year. Uh, we will have something. It probably won't be quite as large as this year, um, but, but we'll see. Um, so anyway, thank you again. I think we're having a reception yes. right across. If you so, would love to join us across the hallway, we will be having a reception with a bar and lots of little snacks. So please enjoy yourself. I'm sorry. I think we have one more comment. Sorry, I just wanted to say uh, my name is Professor Lisa Alexander. I'm a professor at Boston College Law School, and I'm part of the initiative. I did um, nothing, though to prepare or for this conference, um, except help take care of our daughter, because I'm also married to Professor Mitchell. But I also just wanted to take time because I have been able to observe the people, in addition uh, to the initiative members, who have been working so hard to make this conference be the awesome conference that it was. Um, and I wanted to thank each of them as well um, on the initiative's behalf, um, in particular, Sam Gelly, who let's just give her an applause for everything that she's done to organize and run in heels and get microphones and wow. Um, and also Nate Kenyon, who is our director of marketing, he's done amazing, um, amazing work. And Amanda Crowley, who's done amazing work. And associate director, uh, David Price, amazing work. Um, and, and we're just so grateful to work with them and to have them. And as Thomas said, to expand. I also just wanna thank uh, Thomas, um, 
because I've had the opportunity of being his wife and girlfriend for now, I don't know, 22 years or so, to see the evolution of this work. And the conference is really the culmination um, of this work that he's been doing. And he's very happy to have you all here, very grateful to collaborate with you. And we're really grateful that he was able to pull this off on behalf of the Heirs Property community, which um, is just doing amazing work. So thank you all so much.